We as a faculty could be assisting uh, the city in regards to the issues that they were dealing with. And we began this conversation really around uh, urban design and planning and, and these solutions for making Calgary uh, the, the city that we imagine and the region that we imagine. But very quickly we realized that there were many, many other relationships that were quite essential to having this conversation because a city is a very uh, complex thing. And uh, so the major partnership that was forged first was with the Institute of Public Health. And that's a very natural connection because a truly great city is one that is a healthy city. And it's also one that historically has been with us, uh, you know, for over 100 years in Canada with, with the public health movement was a great concern of the reform of cities. And city building and city design were very much a part of the conversations way back then. So it's a very natural connection between uh, public health and design. So today what we have is the Institute of Public Health, the City of Calgary, along with the Faculty of Environmental Design, the Urban Alliance, the uh, Alberta Health Services, and Alberta Innovates. And we together are giving you 2014 Make Calgary Healthy Initiative. So I would like to acknowledge those in attendance. We have stakeholders from a very broad uh, spectrum of the community here, which includes public health practitioners, urban designers and planners, architects. We have the academy represented here and several levels of government, as well as interested citizens who are in the room. This is exactly what we envisioned when we started thinking about Make Calgary, providing a forum where people could engage with experts and they would bring their ideas to our community so we could consider them. And it was an exchange with these experts that was really key. And we particularly saw this with our last uh, symposium that we ran uh, after the flood. And there was a room full of people that were charged with the, the actions moving forward in recovery from the flood for our community. And it was a really, really uh, powerful uh, gathering, as it will be today. Also, it's about the community members which sit in this room. Now, we're very deliberate about using the round tables here. And uh, the reason for that is that you can have conversations amongst yourself. So it's about networking as well. We could have done it uh, in a different style, uh, but uh, we probably wouldn't have come up with the same kind of social capital uh, because of, of that kind of arrangement. We could have probably doubled, almost doubled the amount of people in the room but it's really about you being able to have those conversations. So welcome all. This is going to be a great day. We have wonderful keynotes who will follow uh, these introductions. Then we'll move into a local panel who will be talking about this issue of making Calgary healthy and the, the best practice and how we can apply this to our own community. And then that will be followed, which I, I can promise you will be a very lively debate uh, at the end of the day, which is going to be moderated by David Gray from CBC. So it's my great pleasure now to welcome Dr. Ed McCauley, the Vice President of Research for the University of Calgary, to the stage. Thank you, Nancy, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and it's great to see so many uh, people from uh, diverse backgrounds here to have this very, very important discussion. Um, there are many people in the room I'd like to acknowledge, but I really should acknowledge our Chancellor Emeritus, Joanne Cuthbertson, who's here today uh, joining us. Thank you, Joanne. We really appreciate your support. Um, as Nancy mentioned, my name is Ed McCauley, I'm the, and I have the honor of being the Vice President of Research at the University of Calgary. And as many of you know, the University of Calgary is undergoing really transformational change across our complex institution, um, guided by our very bold vision, which is called Eyes High. And this vision says that the University of Calgary will be one of Canada's top five research intensive universities by its 50th birthday in 2016. And many of you that have driven down Crow Child Trail have seen a sign that, that recently reports on some um, very recent world rankings, which shows that we're a very young institution but despite that, we are growing rapidly. And in this world ranking system, several of them, we're actually number one in Canada. We're number two in North America, only behind the University of California at Irvine, which was established within the University of California system, and we're number 13 in the world. So I think that the city and the province can be proud of how quickly we're moving on to the world stage. As part of our roadmap to actually achieve 
these goals, the university's strategic plan identifies six research themes that will match our tremendous research capabilities that we have at the university with unmet needs and challenges facing our society as a whole. One of these themes is called Human Dynamics in a Changing World, which encompasses smart, safe, secure city societies and cultures. Um, and the organizers and the speakers at today's event are some of the thought leaders from our campus and from around the world who are working to develop a research strategy around human dynamics in smart cities. And this focuses, obviously, on the integration of urban planning and design, as Nancy mentioned, with a focus on the health and happiness of people living and working in an urban environment. As Nancy mentioned, these are uh, very, very complex problems. And complex problems of, often require people from different disciplines to come together to bring their expertise and to present new solutions. A key to that are partnerships. And there are tremendous partnerships that are present between the City of Calgary, Alberta Health Services, and the University of Calgary. And these partnerships are incredibly precious because they take us beyond the borders of our own institutions to create and encourage and coordinate this sort of seamless transfer of new cutting edge research between or among the university, the city, and our health system as a whole. In 2007, the City of Calgary and the University created a strategic partnership, which is, I think is very unique on the world stage. It's called the Urban Alliance. And the purpose of the Urban Alliance is to expedite the seamless transfer of this cutting edge research between the city and the university for the benefit of all of our communities. In essence, we are co uh, collaborating to, you, to work with the city to be a living laboratory where we can test evidence-based approaches for improving the quality of life. The Urban Alliance provides a framework for professionals at the City of Calgary and our students, faculty, and staff at the University of Calgary to work together to tackle problems such as transportation, waste reduction, energy environment, youth crime, homelessness, poverty, or poverty reduction, integration of new people arriving into Calgary into our communities. And so through the Urban Alliance, we've actually worked on collectively more than 100 research initiatives and projects. And there's some posters outside which will describe some of it. And Make Calgary is a key part of that, of that partnership. So I really look forward today um, to uh, the outcomes of today's Make Calgary event and to similar events in the future. Um, I think this is a very, very important dialogue with the key uh, people in the room. So thank you for coming. What I'd like to do now is to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is here today representing the city of Calgary, our councillor, Diane Colley-Hercart. Uh, councillor Urquhart, Colley Urquhart is recognized as a dynamic community leader and a senior member of Calgary City Council. She's currently serving her sixth term in office as an elected official, representing, the war, representing Ward 13 and Calgarians for uh, more than 15 years now, right there? Yep. Um, Councillor Colley Urquhart holds a BSc in Health and Human Services and has had an, a nearly 40 year career as a registered nurse. Um, among her many appointments, she is a member of the Standing Policy Committee on Planning and Urban Development. And her diverse experience in health and human services as well as in business and community service has given Diane a very intimate understanding of some of the problems that we're facing today. Please join me in welcoming uh, Councillor Diane collier -Kirk. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> After that healthy breakfast out there, my goodness, it looked awesome. Actually, I'm not Diane Colley Urquhart today, Deputy Mayor. I'm, I'm Nahed Nenshi, <laughs> Mayor Nenshi. I'm a stand-in, actually. Uh, uh, His Worship wanted to be here today, had planned to be here today, as the organizers know, and uh, was called to Edmonton. And when you're called to Edmonton, that's a good thing, sometimes. Uh, so we're hoping that, uh, that he comes back with some good news for us next week. Um, shaping cities and, uh, and I do this all the time, right? I never read the notes. Yeah, shaping, shaping our cities and shaping ourselves, and I suppose you could reverse the order. Um, uh, it, and I, I was asking uh, some uh, friends when I came in, uh, have you, did you use the word resilient before the, before the flood? 
because it's been substituted now from grassroots to resilience. And I love the word resilience. But uh, uh, on that note, uh, it's, it's amazing how uh, a disaster, a traumatic event, can absolutely bring out the very, very best in people. And how about His Worship, Nahed Nenshi? Let's, let's, let's give him a hand in his absence. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been wonderful working with Nahed uh, in, in the last uh, three, going on four years, uh, to have someone of, of his intellect uh, and uh, to have an academic to elevate the conversation that we have about the future of our city in, in the way that he can. Uh, to have an individual such as uh, His Worship who uh, was very engaged early on in the whole Imagine Calgary movement. And, uh, and uh, I know many of you in this room have worked with Nahed over the years. So uh, it, uh, it, it's been amazing. Um, and uh, and I, 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 I love coming to events like this, uh, being with other professionals, because I really value my healthcare profession to this day. I, I, I still... Uh, I still uh, carry on and uh, practice nursing because it gives you some credibility when you're dealing with uh, many of the public health and wellness issues uh, that we want to uh, address, especially at the council table. And uh, the first order of government really, uh, in my view, has always been the one that makes the greatest amount of difference in the lives of people every single day. And, uh, and so when I see a group of people like yourselves here today, uh, that brings so much expertise and experience and skill uh, and, and the synergy that that can bring together today in the dialogue that you will have uh, really showcases what Calgary's all about. We're, we never ever start from ground zero in this city. Uh, we have a tremendous lift from over the years um, of the partnerships that we formed. Uh, and as a police commissioner, uh, I'm always intrigued with Chief Rick Hansen. Uh, many of you have met him. Have you ever met our chief? Let me see. Anybody? Yeah. The, uh, talk about someone that looks about uh, community safety and wellness and prevention and partnerships and, and, and tackling problems early, early on, uh, especially with our, our, our young children and so on and families. Uh, because at the end of the day, it really is about our quality of life and how we're going to interact and live together to build a greater city. And as Nahed often says, to build a better city. Uh, a word that may seem overused, but uh, a word that I love. Um, then we were fortunate enough to attract uh, the stellar leadership of Roland Stanley to the city of Calgary, who I know you'll be hearing from a little bit later. Uh, and even if he's out there, I know you'll hear from him in here. <laughs> But uh, talk about a dynamic leader at a time in our city when we absolutely uh, are, are, are going to move on to, to bigger and greater things in this city. And, and tragedy such as the flood uh, gives us the opportunity to do things a little bit differently and to build something even greater. And, um, and I know for a long time at the at council when we have public hearings, we'll often talk, you know, we have these land use items coming forward. But really, you know what, it's not really about land use, it's about people, right? And how people are going to live and where they're going to live. I know in the notes that I should read that Nahed gave me, uh, he often says that, uh, you know, in we're, when we're transforming the city and we're moving in different directions, uh, we, uh, you know, we don't want this reliance on the car. And I thought, he just wants me to say those words so he can come back on me. I'm a suburban alderman, you know. I, I represent uh, nearly a quarter of a million people down south. Uh, you know, many of them have four cars in their driveways. Uh, but I know over the years and some of the health initiatives I've tried to bring to the council table, uh, whether it's been the whole telework movement and uh, transforming work and where you do work, uh, but I know what a struggle it's been to try to get people to carpool. And we, we did carpool.ca about seven, eight years ago. And still one out of eight people uh, are in a car, you know, by themselves. Uh, so it's, we still have a lot of work to do in these areas. But whether it's a smoke-free Calgary, whether it's dealing with the obesity of our children, um, uh, uh, I think that all of you here today are committed to... Uh, really uh, bringing a lot of inspiration and new ideas. And 
people like uh, our, uh, like his worship, uh, Nahed Nenshi, he, he, he's just like a sponge with things that you'll come up with today. Uh, and, and, uh, and then you have other of my colleagues like John Carlo Carra, who is a professional urban planner as well. Uh, so we're there to hear the great ideas that, that will be spawned from today's conversation. And with that, I'll leave my speech here. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I think the mayor is very clever to have you uh, <laughs> present, I think particularly because of your jurisdiction. So I think that there's um, some, some uh, very strategic thinking going on there, which I, I really appreciate. So uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce William Galley. And Bill is a good friend. Uh, he's also, <laughs> happens to also be, the scientific director for the Institute of Public Health. Um, uh, just very quickly, the, I just quickly mentioned it in my introductions, but um, this, this growing of the relationship began with the Institute of Public Health, and we hope to, to keep on building that, but it was very meaningful for us to have such um, a critical uh, research institute of the university to join us in this work first. And uh, we're building now, and you're gonna hear a lot more of this collaboration in, in future symposia, but also in research initiatives, which we are working very hard on together. So, Bill. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you everyone for being here this morning. Um, so as Nancy has said, I'm the scientific director of the Institute for Public Health at the University of Calgary. And I'm up here representing an associate scientific director, Lynn Dr. Lynn McIntyre, administrative director, Dr. Jamie Day, and an institute of over 300 members who uh, reside within the Faculty of Medicine, many, but also uh, within many main campus faculties, such as the Faculty of Environmental Design, within Alberta Health Services, and then also within some community organizations, including the City of Calgary. Some of our membership are individuals who have their primary appointments at the City of Calgary. Uh, our institute is one of seven health research institutes at the University of Calgary. And ours is the newest. The other six were launched in 2003, 2004. Uh, our institute launched officially in 2010. And the University of Calgary had in its strategic planning in the late 2000s um, a plan to launch an institute, of, uh, institute for public health. And why did they do this? Uh, I think the, 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 the motivation for, for having public health in an academic institution like the University of Calgary is, is the recognition that, that health is a fundamental good. And some, some groups would go further and say that health, health is a human right, uh, a basic human right. And we can quote famous individuals such as Sir Winston Churchill who said, a country's greatest assets are its healthy citizens, or Gandhi who said that health is wealth. And, uh, you know, that can be modeled economically to show investment in creating a healthy population can lead to tremendous downstream economic benefits. Uh, and when we think about health, there are certainly two core elements to being healthy. One is predictably to have mechanisms to be treated when we get sick, and that's what health care is about. It's, uh, it's a system that looks after us when we get sick. The other many would say more important element to health is to have to have mechanisms and foundational structures that keep us healthy uh, and that help us prevent disease. And in our institute, we were interested in the study of ways to both have good health care when we get sick and also a strong foundation for healthy populations. And as, a, as an institute that's based primarily in the university with partnerships outside of the university, our basic currency is knowledge. And we're very interested in the generation of knowledge, the mobilization of knowledge, and the uptake of knowledge in public policy. And that's, that's really what, what we're trying to do as an institute. And the University of Calgary has, has invested in the creation of this institute. Um, our tagline as an institute is better health and healthcare. 
uh, and that tagline you'll recognize speaks to both the healthcare system piece but also the population health piece. And today, uh, I would say the greatest focus of today's event is going to be on that foundational piece of population health. And um, I want to mention in our institute that we are very excited to have a new centre uh, that is co-led by my colleagues, Dr. Melanie Rock. Melanie, can you wave? And Lindsay McLaren. Normally they're joined at the hip, the two of them <laughs> side by side, so maybe not here yet or uh, tied up with. And um, so, so the, the new centre is called the Population Health and Inequities Research Centre. Uh, and this is a centre that has a, a diverse group of faculty, very interdisciplinary, who are focused on, on ways to optimise health of the population. And in that uh, uh, population health uh, and, and inequities research centre, we have some faculty members who are very active in their, in their engagement with the City of Calgary, Melanie in particular, and also her colleague Gavin McCormick, who is doing doing work on the walkability of cities and, and how population health is influenced by urban design. Uh, so clearly these are individuals who, who are both instrumental to the preparation of today and the themes of today, uh, but also are key to the partnership. Um, as a university institute, we have, we have a focus on, on many things that academics focus on and we, many people talk about the academic bubble and and we, we live in a bubble and we focus on, on academic successes and, and we, do, we, we, do, we do live, we know that, in an academic world where we write articles for our journals. And the University of Calgary does have a focus on academic excellence and some of what Ed spoke about uh, really, really highlights the fact that the University of Calgary is achieving many successes in the academic realm. Uh, we in the Institute, though, are, are really inspired by a, a strategy that has been declared at the University as eyes high. And I don't have to say much, eyes high is a very good metaphor for what we're trying to achieve at the University of Calgary. And part of eyes high is to, to be outstanding in a number of academic metrics that would show on a national stage that we're a leading academic university. Uh, but the second part of Eyes High is to produce, uh, is a focus on producing societal impact, and community impact. And foundational to that is partnerships. And Ed spoke of partnerships. And today really showcases three, three strong partnerships that we have formed over time in the Institute. Uh, the first is a between faculty partnership that we're so excited about with environmental design and uh, Nancy, uh, John Brown, the Associate Dean Research of, of Environmental Design is not here, but he's been a big catalyst of, of this partnership. And, and you'll, I think you'll feel the energy of the, the partnership that we formed with a, a sister faculty. Uh, the second uh, is, is Alberta Health Services, and we have our colleague Andy Petullo, who will be speaking later today on, on upstream, the upstream doctor and the concept of physicians, I myself am a, am a physician, so I, I look after people when they're sick, but the notion of being an upstream doctor is to be attentive to population health, and uh, Alberta Health Services is an upstream health organization that, that is striving to, to think of ways to help keep us healthy. And then the third big partnership that will be uh, showcased today is that with the City of Calgary and the Urban Alliance, and I'm very excited about the potential we clearly have a city that is receptive to the themes that are going to be discussed here. Uh, and one of the early links to our institute was, was a visit uh, from Mayor Nenshi to the Faculty of Medicine where, where there was an explicitly stated receptivity to our engaging with the city on scholarship and partnership to produce a, a healthy city, a better city. So I'll, I'll just close by saying Really, this is, we're, these are exciting times. We're in a very dynamic city, that's very clear. We work, those of us who are in the university, in a very dynamic university. And I will just say, uh, Dr. McCauley, our VP Research, part of the reason it's such a dynamic university is we have such dynamic leaders like Ed. And uh, foundational to all of this is the partnerships that are on display. Um, the last thing I'll say is I'll just thank, uh, again, the sponsors of today, who are the partners, Alberta Health Services, the City of Calgary, the University, and also from government through Alberta Innovates Health Solutions, uh, considerable funding that is made today possible. 
Uh, so thank you for all that. Um, my last task is to introduce a very important individual for today, the co-MC, uh, David Down. Uh, David is a senior architect and urban designer with the City of Calgary, and he has been in that role since 2005. Previously, he was a principal in a leading architect, architectural and urban design firm down in Livesey. Um, and he is, again, exemplifying these partnerships, uh, an adjunct faculty member at the University of Calgary in, in Nancy's faculty, EVDS. And most importantly to today, uh, David has been the co-architect of today in terms of organizing the, the agenda. He will be co mc and uh, he has really embraced the, the partnerships that are going to be on display and has a very exciting vision for our city. And uh, David, I'll turn it over to you as co mc for uh, the next steps. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And uh, welcome everyone this morning. Very exciting to see such a, a crowd. And we'll hope to keep you lively and healthy. Um, I'm not gonna say a lot about uh, the city. I get my opportunity to talk about the city vision that Bill mentioned, and it certainly isn't my vision. It's a vision that is shared by the many, many professionals that uh, work at the city of Calgary, shared by our mayor and council, as you heard from uh, Councillor Collier Card. Um, and shared, of course, by Roland Stanley, who was also a part in uh, determining aspects of this agenda and speakers, etc. cetera, very vocal part of it, as you can imagine, because this is a subject that's uh, dear to his heart as well. Uh, I'm lucky enough to, to have uh, been involved in this committee along with one other city representative, Joyce Tang, who, where, there she is. Uh, but as I say, we pre represent a lot of interested uh, city individuals who really value this kind of exchange and are interested in in sharing ideas on uh, how we make this a uh, healthier, better city. And uh, as I hope to show in uh, my uh, portion of the panel discussion later, really our mandate at the city of Calgary is to uh, achieve many of these ideas about building a healthier city um, in, in everything we do. So really I'm up here to start you off with a few housekeeping issues. Uh, to, so to keep you safe and healthy, we have emergency exits, either end. We have washrooms behind the wall that's behind me. We have snacks, of course, over there to keep you healthy. It just occurred to me if Nancy is your pilot for the day, I think I'm the flight attendant. <laughs> Um, I want to urge you to, um, to stop at the info stop at the registration desk to contribute to our resource list. This is a list we're building about whatever resources that you have in mind that can, you would like to share with others, whether they're online, whether they're in print, but uh, we are compiling that list and we'll make that available to everyone. Please take time to fill out our Make Calgary Evaluation Survey online. You could win an iTunes gift card. Um, which, is, which is great, but um, uh, there will be a slide with the survey address. And also, please join us on Twitter. Your tweets, you can follow them here. Um, we hope to continue to spread the word from this room about what a fantastic event it is and about uh, what's going on. And you'll notice your Lego centerpieces. Make sure uh, you have some fun with those, but we do expect to see a healthy city built by the end of the day. No Millennium Falcons, you can do those on your own time. <laughs> and this is about collaboration, so you may need to borrow blocks from other tables, but uh, that will be one of your tasks. So, as your flight attendant, I would like to get this journey started. So, the first thing I need to do is, is officially announce an agenda change, which most of you will have noticed already. And that is that, very unfortunately, uh, Rishi Manchanda, who is the author of The Upstream Doctor, uh, fell ill very recently, yesterday. And although he offered to video conference from his hospital bed, we thought that might send the wrong message. <laughs> so uh, we declined. And uh, Andy Patello has very graciously and on very short notice agreed to uh, replace him on the agenda, and he is a senior medical director with Alberta Health Services, and you'll hear much more about him and from him later. 
So let's get started. Um, our first keynote speaker, we're very excited to have David Owen here today. Uh, David has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since 1991. Before joining The New Yorker, he was a contributing editor at The Atlantic Monthly, and prior to that, a senior writer at Harper's and a frequent contributor to Esquire. He's also a contributing editor at Golf Digest. Don't get too excited. I know golf is just starting here. Let's not ask him questions about golf during question period. He's the author of a dozen books, most recently, I think most recently, Green Metropolis, Why Living Smaller, Living Closer, and Driving Less Are Keys to Sustainability. So please join me in welcoming David Owen. Uh, up until today, I've been PowerPoint net zero, but I have some uh, slides today, and I don't know if we can bring down the, those lights. Uh, make the, the, they're just pictures. They're, it's kindergarten, a kindergarten PowerPoint presentation. So, uh, I, uh, I'm not an urban planner or an architect or a doctor or a politician, so I'll uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a, I'm a journalist. And I've written about a lot of different, I know a little bit about a lot of different things. It's a good profession for people who have short attention spans. On a New Yorker assignment not long ago, I went to uh, South America, to Colombia. Uh, and on my first day in Bogota, uh, two women in an old Toyota picked me up at my hotel and took me to an industrial park on the outskirts of town. And uh, there, in a building that looked sort of like an old warehouse, uh, the man that I had come to interview uh, shot me in the stomach with a 38 caliber revolver from about eight inches away. Um, luckily, the reason I was uh, writing about him is that his business is manufacturing fashionable bulletproof clothing for people like uh, Diddy and uh, the Wu-Tang Clan. And um, <laughs> he, <laughs> there, I, there he is, plugging me in the gut and I'm taking it like a man. I, uh, afterwards, I talked to some, uh, uh, some engineers at DuPont, which is the company that makes Kevlar, which is the, the American version of the most common version of the bulletproof material. And when we'd been talking for about half an hour, I, I said, so is, uh, am, I the only, uh, am I the only person here who's actually been shot in one of these things? And there was a, a, a reverberating silence. And uh, after a while, they said that they not only don't test Kevlar on uh, human beings, not even on, uh, uh, on journalists, but they don't, even really, they don't even call it bulletproof. They call it bullet resistant. And uh, <laughs> I was glad that I hadn't talked to them before I went because I, I, I enjoyed being shot and I wouldn't have uh, wanted uh, to, to miss that experience. And <laughs> another person who was a little bit alarmed by uh, my uh, getting shot was... Uh, my decision to get shot, was my wife. Uh, she and I got married right out of college in 1978. Uh, we were young and idealistic and naive, and we spent the first seven years of our lives together uh, living in a utopian environmentalist community in New York State. We lived in a very small space, just 700 square feet. We didn't have a clothes dryer or a car or a lawn. Uh, we walked almost everywhere. We did our shopping on foot, and when we didn't walk, uh, we took public transportation. Because, uh, because we lived in such a small space, we had very few uh, possessions of any size, uh, and our electric bill worked out to uh, only about a dollar a day. Um, that utopian community uh, was Manhattan. It was New York City. Um, the idea that a city could be an, envir an environmentally responsible place to live is surprising even to people who live in cities, maybe especially uh, to people who live in cities because they're used to being uh, the, uh, bearing the brunt of, uh, of rude remarks by friends of theirs who live in the country. <laughs> but the statistics are kind of amazing. Uh, if uh, New York City is larger than all but 11 of the U.S. states, uh, if you uh, uh, made it, if you granted it statehood, it, it would be uh, the uh, rank 51st out of, uh, out of 51 in per capita energy consumption. New Yorkers use less water, they produce less waste, uh, 
uh, th than any other Americans. They're really the only, in uh, many ways, the only significant users of public transit in the United States. New York City contains half of all the subway stops in the United States. Uh, roughly a third of all the public transit passenger miles uh, traveled in the U.S. are traveled in the greater New York City metropolitan area. That's where all the transit is. 54% of New York City households, households don't own even one automobile. 77% of Manhattan households don't own even one automobile. And in the rest of the country, of course, it's very different. Uh, in South Dakota, 12 or 13% of the households have five or more automobiles. It's, it's, it's even worse than Southern, uh, uh, southern Calgary. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, in, in, the United, in the United States in general, we have uh, more, uh, far more registered automobiles than we have licensed drivers. So there's plenty to go around. Uh, the, reason, the reason why these things are true, and this won't be a surprise to the urban planners uh, in this room, is that is density, population density. Uh, if you took all the 8.3 million people in New York City and spread them out uh, at the density of the state of Vermont, uh, a beautiful uh, uh, rural state, uh, which was uh, Forbes magazine picked as the greenest state in the United States. If you spread New York City residents out at the density of Vermont, you'd need an area equal to the area of uh, all six New England states, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, uh, plus New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Uh, and then, of course, you'd have to find a place to put all the, the people that you were displacing to move them there. Uh, sometimes, People think that density light is the best thing, that you can get too dense, uh, and you can surely get too dense, but the upper limit, I think, is probably higher than people think. Uh, one uh, statistic that's often cited in saying that, that, you can, that a city can become too dense is that if, as an as a urban area uh, increases in population density, uh, transit use tends to rise, uh, and then it hits a certain relatively high level in plateaus. Uh, but the reason that happens is that once you uh, achieve, uh, you move people and their destinations close enough together, uh, even transit begun, begins to seem like a nuisance uh, and people simply walk. Uh, New York City, Manhattan is one of the uh, very few places in the United States where walking is a primary mode of transportation, where it's the main way that people get around. Uh, the, you can, anybody who's visited New York City and been in a taxi cab on, uh, on Fifth Avenue in the evening and watched a little old lady on the sidewalk overtake them and disappear over the horizon uh, understands why that might be true. You also see it in the, in the city itself and the way the city works. Uh, jaywalking, which is uh, illegal in Los Angeles, a very uh, automobile-centric uh, place, uh, is, is not in New York City. In fact, it, it's, it's how people get around. You get around by weaving your way through traffic. And when Mayor Giuliani tried to outlaw jaywalking and to move people away from, from corners, the, 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 the city works less well than it does. Uh, jaywalking is critical, and a key ingredient in jaywalking is the, uh, is the slow moving traffic. Traffic on the cross streets in Manhattan moves at about zero miles an hour, which means you can always weave your way through. Um, many of the the sort of advanced notions in urban uh, traffic control, in urban design and traffic control, things like uh, street furniture and traffic calming, were really invented in New York City. Uh, the five Con Ed guys standing around an open manhole with their enclosure around it, smoking cigarettes and blocking traffic. Uh, in, it was an early, it's an early uh, sort of er version of street furniture and uh, moving people around. One way you can tell a uh, pedestrian friendly city from, uh, from places that are not pedestrian friendly is what the, the law is about turning right on a red light. Uh, if you cannot turn right on red light, it's a pedestrian friendly city. <laughs> uh, college students, university students, students at uh, residential colleges live very much like Manhattanites and uh, universities everywhere all over the world are trying to become, uh, uh, you know, to establish green credentials for themselves, but most college students will never again have as small a, a carbon footprint as they do uh, in college, whether their university has a, 
a dean of sustainability or not. Uh, college students live in tiny spaces in dorms. Uh, they eat in groups very efficiently and food that's prepared in bulk, there's less waste. Uh, they walk to their daily activities or ride bikes. Uh, and because they don't have any money, they uh, engage in uh, low energy, low carbon forms of, uh, of recreation, uh, pointless but uh, environmentally harmless <laughs> philosophical discussions, uh, <laughs> sleeping late, having sex, all these things have tremendous environmental value. Uh, my mother, who's in her 80s, lives uh, in an assisted living facility and lives pretty much exactly like a college student, but uh, <laughs> with earlier bedtimes and, uh, uh, and quieter parties. The, the troublesome demographic is the one in between, uh, the one that my wife and I entered uh, when we had kids. Here's, this is Manhattan, of course. This is Times Square. Uh, I, it's the, the green ground zero of the United States right there, except that it's all tourists. Uh, in 1985, my wife and I, after living in New York City for uh, seven years, uh, our, our daughter was one year old, and we decided we didn't have enough room. We needed to get out of the city. We did what people do uh, at that stage of their life, and we moved uh, to the, not just to the suburbs, we moved to the country. Uh, this is a picture of Vermont. This is not where we live. Uh, but we moved to Connecticut in a, in a little town that looks very much the same. Um, our house was built in 1790. It's a good recycled house. Uh, we live across a dirt road from a 4,000 acre, a 4,000 acre nature preserve. So we're right in the middle of everything green. There are deer and turkeys and bobcats and the occasional bear wander through our yard. Uh, we felt as though we had moved into Arcadia, uh, and yet very quickly. Uh, I realized that our move had actually been an environmental disaster. We uh, went from consuming uh, about 4,000 kilowatt hours of electricity a year in New York City uh, to uh, almost instantaneously consuming th about 30,000 uh, kilowatt hours a year uh, in Connecticut, and our house didn't even have uh, central air conditioning. We went from happily living with no cars uh, to having one car, and then realized almost immediately that if, if you have one car, you have no way to pick up that car when it's at the mechanic uh, having the oil changed. And if you go anywhere, you have to go uh, together. So we uh, got a second car. And then as a result of a mild midlife crisis on my part, we ended up with a third car, <laughs> and which, <laughs> which then uh, when our children turned 16 became, actually became a necessity. Because we live in a place where you, there is essentially no place you can go if you don't have a car. There, uh, the, by, in just the space it takes me to walk to my mailbox, the closest destination, walking destination I have at my house is my mailbox. And in that same distance in New York City, there were something like three grocery stores and a liquor store, a shoe repair shop. Uh, you know, outside of New York City, I don't think you can even find a shoe repair shop. Uh, my children, don't, I'm sure, don't even understand that shoes can be repaired. <laughs> the uh, closest large supermarket was about a 20-minute drive away. Uh, in New York City, uh, we had a pediatrician in the lobby of our building, and it, it didn't really encourage uh, 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 good parenting on our part, because whenever our child had a, even a runny nose, we could just jump in the elevator and go down to the pediatrician. Uh, where we live in Connecticut, my dentist is, a, a, is two towns away. It's a 32-mile round trip in my car. Even though these differences began, came to seem pretty obvious to me, the lessons we learned from them as uh, human beings, as, uh, even as urban planners, are hard to apply. Uh, one reason is that density makes disasters more efficient too. It doesn't just make people more efficient, it makes problems more efficient. Uh, Hurricane Sandy is an example. Uh, the great Alberta flood, uh, the great uh, Calgary flood is another example. Uh, rising sea levels are a greater threat to dense uh, coastal areas than they are to uh, sprawling suburbs in the middle of, uh, in the, middle of the continent. That I've been told by a uh, hydrological engineer that a sea level rise of five inches would completely disable the New York City uh, sewer system, which is a, the, the city made a poor decision when it built its sewer system, which is it's a combined uh, uh, 
waste and, and stormwater system, when the stormwater overflows, it all flows together and everything goes out together. And it doesn't take much to make it malfunction. Uh, in addition, uh, we like to live spread out. Uh, the, uh, it, there's a powerful desi desire on this continent especially, uh, even if all we do with all our space is sit inside and watch, and watch TV. Even when we embrace the idea of density and are uh, eager to do something about it and to make our, improve our cities, it's hard to do the right thing. And uh, this next slide, this is a, uh, this is a slide that was, uh, this picture was taken in Tampa, Florida in 2001, and it's posed, it's not a real traffic jam, uh, it's, it's posed by the uh, local transit department. They were, uh, trying, they were going to make a case, that, uh, trying to make a case that the, that the metropolitan area should build a transit system. Uh, it's, uh, and even though it's posed, it's, we all recognize this scene, we've all seen it before. Uh, the second slide in the series shows all the drivers in, uh, it shows all the people, the, the people in these cars uh, sitting in chairs in the middle of the, of the same street. <laughs> And the astonishing thing, and even though I've seen this uh, slide lots and lots of times, uh, it's sort of amazing to see how uh, small a space that all those cars uh, shrink down to. And when, I drive, when I'm driving in a, in a, uh, on a congested highway, I will often mentally do the same little trick, mental trick, and move all those people onto folding chairs in the middle of the, the uh, passing lane. But this... Uh, even though uh, Tampa used this to make a, unsuccessfully to make a case for building a transit system, but even though that's what it's used for, it really, the real message of these two, this pair of slides is that it shows how difficult it is to do the right thing, and that is that if you are one of the drivers in these cars, uh, and you look at this street, your thought isn't, ah, I should be on a bus, your thought is, that's nirvana. That's my traffic congestion problem solved. If all those people would get on the bus, I wouldn't have a traffic jam in front of me on the way to work and everything would be all right. And Tampa, as I say, did not build its transit system, but even when, oops, even when cities do build uh, the transit system, they, all, all, they seldom take the second step, which is to get a, rid of all that excess road space so that people can't just fill it up again with cars. In fact, what we do uh, in our traffic engineering tends to be the opposite. We try to think of more ways to fit more cars onto the roads that we have. Perhaps we meter cars coming in. Uh, the, it will be considered a, a huge uh, a victory if we have found a way to double the traffic capacity of our road system without having to actually lay any new fast asphalt. Um, one way to get around that problem, one way to, to deal with that, one way to take away road space is to do what uh, they did in Copenhagen, uh, which is to convert road space to bicycle space. And I was just in Copenhagen last week, and it's, it's extraordinary. You take space away from cars. Uh, they do it in a way that is different from the way it has, is often done, which is not by painting a white death strip on the, on the lane, uh, but by actually moving the curb one lane out, uh, moving the parking, parking curb one lane out. So, uh, the road looks the same, but there's a, a lane uh, uh, to a driver, but smaller, uh, and, uh, but there's a, a protected lane for bicyclists. And actually, in, in Copenhagen, you have to be careful that what you have to be careful for is uh, people running you down. There are no jaywalkers in, uh, in Copenhagen, not because the cars are in control, but because the bicycles are in control. Um, I need some of this water. <laughs> the underlying difficulty with, uh, with schemes like this, with the Tampa project and with these, this pair of slides, is that if you talk to most people who live in cities or look at cities, and you ask them to name what's the number one environmental problem, they'll of often say traffic congestion. Uh, and they have lots of reasons for saying that. But traffic congestion, uh, here's... Here's an example, and this is actually, uh, this photograph is from right here, if Google is to be believed. Uh, traffic congestion is not an environmental problem. Uh, traffic congestion is a driving problem. Driving is the environmental problem. And when we focus on traffic congestion, what we're really doing is making the environmental problem worse 
uh, by making life easier for drivers. What traffic plans, uh, green traffic plans actually need to do is make life worse for drivers. But it's amazing how many of the, uh, how many uh, of our plans and uh, solutions uh, for our automobile difficulty actually do nothing but make our, our uh, lives as drivers much better. Uh, our cars are extraordinary pieces of engineering. I could get in my car, if I had my car here, I could get in it and I could happily drive home without ever getting out of it except to go to the bathroom. I could, I could feed myself uh, sitting in my car. My, the seat of my car is probably more comfortable than any piece of furniture, single piece of furniture in my house. Uh, I could listen, uh, I'm never sad to get in my car because right now I'm listening to Game of Thrones and uh, before that I, I was listening to Bleak House. I could drive any distance. I don't even have to roll down my window to throw toll in a toll booth because I have a little radio transmitter that, that handles that. I don't even have to slow down. Uh, I won't have to change, I, I change my oil every 5,000 miles, but I could probably do what was done in a commercial I saw a few years ago, which is just weld the hood of my car shut and never, and never touch it before I was ready to sell it. The oil has risen in price it's, uh, uh, by a huge amount since I was a kid, but we've fought back by making our cars more fuel efficient so that we've taken the sting out of what would otherwise be a powerful economic uh, stimulus telling us not to drive. When we uh, have face traffic congestion, we add new lanes, we uh, make it possible for people to drive uh, in faster lanes. In all these ways, we make it easier to do the thing that is the real uh, uh, damage done by cars, which is to allow us to spread out, to sprawl. Uh, if you reduce somebody's commuting time by uh, five percent, if you, you make you enable them to move five percent farther out, and we stretch we stretch ourselves out even farther. Uh, many of the uh, there's uh, uh, professors at MIT, some engineers at MIT, who invented what they called a city car. It's a small car, it stacks together, it's electric, and the idea is that you you could use it in a city. Uh, and you could park the, many of them in a small space. And one of the ways that they, that they, they promoted it was by, the idea was by saying, you could, you could park 500 of them in a space that now uh, you could only park uh, 25 or 50. Uh, and, and so they have solved the problem of how to turn uh, walk, city walkers, pedestrians in cities into drivers. Uh, for the architects here, the, this is the, Condé Nast building, this is where the New Yorker is headquartered in New York City. It, it was uh, built in 1999. It, was, uh, it predates LEED, uh, those, uh, uh, the uh, environmental rating system for, for buildings. Uh, but it was, it was often described as the first green building in New York City. Uh, it uh, has many uh, standard uh, uh, green features. There's a... Um, uh, there are uh, photoelectric panels in the curtain walls. There's a, a, a fuel cell on the, on the, uh, 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 in the basement. There's a, a, a crane for, there's a, uh, there are recycling chutes inside the building, so you can just put recycling into chutes and it goes down, it's sorted out and goes into areas. Uh, the glass in the, in the restrooms is made from recycled glass. It has many, many of the kind of features that you win points for in LEED. And yet, the, the greenest thing about this building has nothing to do with any of those. The greenest thing about this building is that uh, it, it's a 1.6 million uh, square foot building that sits on one acre, and it has no parking lot. 6,000 pe people work in it, and there's no parking lot. The greenest thing about it is that it sits in a dense city, and even if, the, uh, window, if, even if you kept the windows open uh, all uh, winter, it would still be a green building, uh, even though it doesn't have a lead rating. Uh, and the reason is the, the way it's used. And I think this is something that uh, we uh, tend to overlook and that the rating systems encourage us to overlook. Um, those of you who are architects and probably those of you who are city planners have no choice but to uh, bow down to the lead god. But in fact, uh, the, greenest, uh, the greenest features of many buildings are the ones that, are ones that don't earn you lead points. Uh, that or that earn you too few lead points and they don't look green to somebody uh, who uh, wants the building to look green. You need those solar panels uh, on there even if, uh, as in the case of the Condé Nast building, they're not really connected to anything. I think that, the, that if they generate any electricity in that building, it, it rounds to zero 
Uh, and the fuel cells uh, it, were, uh, pr produce enormous, uh, at enormous expense, energy that the building doesn't really have any use for because they're. Uh, and I think the the lesson for cities, and I think this is true, and this fits in with the theme of this conference, is that if you're in a dense city in an inherently uh, green organization of human beings where people and their destinations are close together. The real environmental issues are not things like uh, solar panels on buildings uh, or fuel cells in basements. There are things like education, uh, their public health, uh, their noise, uh, their urine smell, their, the sound of sirens, their recreational opportunities. They're all, they're all quality of life issues. Uh, they're all the things that make people willing to live in what is a, in, in many ways, a uh, an unpleasant way of organizing people, very close to your neighbor so you can hear what they're doing, but that overcome those and make it actually a tantalizing place for people to live. And I think it's, uh, w cities have no problem with people who are very young because there's always something exciting going on. Uh, people always say about New York City that it's a great place to be if you're either poor or rich uh, because uh, there's, if you're poor, there's always something that you can do for free, which was certainly the case when my wife and I lived there. Where it's difficult is in between, and I think that's where uh, that's where the focus. If I were an urban planner, that's where my focus would be, uh, and I think especially the number one issue probably in the United States is education. It's education, public education, that tends to fall off uh, it, most severely, and is the real driver uh, of uh, people out of cities when when they have children. It doesn't seem like an environmental issue, uh, but I think it is one. There are lots of things you shouldn't do, and uh, those are you architects and, uh, and urban planners. And here's one of them. This is uh, vertical farming. This is a skyscraper that is growing crops for some reason. Uh, this has been a popular idea. I, think, I don't think it's been a popular idea outside of universities, but within them, <laughs> within them it is. Uh, there are, even if there were no uh, good reasons not to grow crops in skyscrapers, and there are lots of them, it, if it were, even if it were a good idea, there's no reason to do it in a city. If it makes more sense to grow crops in skyscrapers, it would make more sense to put those skyscrapers uh, in the farm belt where the weather's better and the infrastructure for handling and processing food already exists. Uh, it, there's no reason to do it in cities and to create what is just an obstacle to pedestrians and uh, something that would, would make your life not more pleasant but less. The reason that this is a popular issue is this concept of food miles, the idea that you should eat only food that's grown within a short distance of where you live. The, the arithmetic behind this is, is faulty. Uh, this isn't really, we could devote a whole conference to this issue, but I'll just talk about it a little bit. Uh, the, uh, but it doesn't make any sense. And, and I think, uh, <laughs> The how far you live from a grocery store is probably has far more environmental significance than how far you live from the farm that grows the food you eat. In fact, I think one of the one of the probably the key elements in walkability of a city is walkability to a place to a grocery store to a decent sized grocery store. Hartford, Connecticut, the capital of my state, uh, has been trying to revive its downtown. It had a, a downtown that was really completely dead. And one of the first things the city did was get involved in a project to put an actually very large uh, supermarket in uh, in the near the in the urban core, where making it possible for people to live uh, in the urban core and uh, without an automobile, without having to drive to the suburbs to buy their groceries, or without having to do their shopping in overpriced urban stores. Uh, it's a there are some there are several rating systems for ways to rate the walkability of cities, and that proximity to supermarket is always very high. The how far you live from, the reason how far you live from a grocery store is more important than how far you, you live from a farm is that there are many, many, many factors that go into the environmental impact of what we eat. Uh, the energy uh, that is expended on transporting that food to us is the, is the smallest uh, fraction of the energy that goes into that food. Far more important uh, is how the food is prepared in our own homes. And if you really want to uh, make, have an impact on the carbon, uh, uh, on the energy and carbon footprint of your 
feeding, of your eating, it makes more sense to look first to your stove uh, rather than to, uh, to the farm. Uh, there are uh, a number of other reasons uh, why this is true. I think it's easiest to see them if you look away from food, which is, uh, which is a very emotional subject for everyone. My wife, who writes cookbooks, says that people tend to define themselves by what they refuse to eat. And I think that is uh, often the case, and it's why it is such an emotional issue. It's easier to see if we move into a non-edible agricultural, think about a non-edible agricultural product uh, like cotton. We should all be wearing more natural uh, clothing, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that Alberta should become a major cotton grower so that people in Calgary uh, can wear jeans that are made within 25 miles from where they live. We understand that there are places where it makes sense to grow certain crops and places where it doesn't. And it, it, even though it, it's easy, to, we can make ourselves feel better about ourselves sometimes by eating things that are close at hand. Uh, it, it's probably not a positive. Uh, my New Yorker colleague, Susan Orlean, uh, wrote about uh, this, uh, raising chickens. This has been a big fad in the United States, the idea Nobody really wants to have a whole farm because that's an awful lot of work, but chickens are, seem sort of manageable. So we'll go, we'll go back to the land by having chickens. And she has some and she wrote about it. And uh, she's a good illustration of what uh, the problem is because it, although she has, uh, eats now eats delicious breakfast, uh, she drives individual uh, hens to the veterinarian in her, uh, in her car. And uh, that alone raises the carbon footprint of, her, of those eggs to almost astronomical, uh, astronomical levels. <laughs> we can take food miles a, a step farther into I, I was just the reason I was in Copenhagen recently was to give a talk to a, a group of people in the bunker uh, it's called the bunker industry bunker bunker fuel is what uh, ships run on it's the name for it uh, it covers a lot of different uh, petroleum based fuels the classic bunker fuel is the, the the last what's left in a barrel of oil after you've taken everything good out of it if it's cold, you can walk across the top of it. That's how it's more like asphalt than like a fuel, and ships burn it. They actually burn less classic bunker fuel now uh, than they do before. But it, I came here by airplane, but everything I brought with me came to me by ship. Uh, and this is uh, why uh, shipping is sometimes called an, industri uh, uh, an invisible industry. Uh, every piece of electronics you own, almost probably every piece of clothing you're wearing, uh, all the furniture in this room, they all came from far away. They came from mostly from Asia. And they came on a ship. Uh, the reason they did is that the, it costs ex astonishingly little to ship things, even around the world, uh, on a big ship like that. The, uh, I learned at my shipping conference that if you had, say, a thousand tons of, uh, of Atlantic salmon on the dock in Norway, and uh, you wanted to sell it in Norway, it costs less to ship it to China uh, to have it processed and then ship it back to Norway than it does to process it right there on the dock and, and sell it there. Uh, and this is uh, the, the cost uh, of shipping uh, large quantities of, of, of shipping items like that around the world is essentially zero. And that's why, why it does. I was explaining this to my editor at the New Yorker and he said, so, so he said, well, that means that, I guess that, that means that uh, shipping is, is, a, is, a, is a very green thing. Global shipping is. And, and the, the carbon footprint is, is it's like one percent, the carbon footprint of, uh, uh, of a pound, shipping a pound of, uh, of goods on a, on a sh by sea versus by air is it's something like one percent. It uses one percent the energy, has one percent the carbon footprint. I said yes, in that sense, that's true. Uh, but the, in the other sense, in another sense, it's not. And this is why all environmental issues are difficult. The, 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 the low cost of shipping a, taking a ship like that, which has a crew of 20, just 20 people, shipping uh, a load like that around the world makes it possible uh, for us to, in effect, export all our manufacturing to places where it can be done very inexpensively and outside of the, uh, outside of the control of, of bodies like the Environmental Protection Agency. This is uh, downtown Beijing uh, in uh, right before the Olympics, while the big CC, C, uh, CC uh, TV tower was going up, and as you can barely see, and maybe not even see at all, it, it's a very small, it's a very smoggy place. Uh, the reason is that they're, the Chinese have been very busy manufacturing things, not just for themselves, but for us, and uh, burning a lot of coal as they do it, which they've also been buying from us. And it's 
that fact has enabled us to believe that we have been making inroads into our own carbon and energy carbon output and energy consumption when in fact what we've been doing is exporting it to other places around the world. Uh, if the issue were simply our own accounting, uh, our own record in these areas, that would be a good thing for us, but because uh, climate and energy are global problems, uh, it doesn't bring us closer to a solution. In fact, in most ways, it probably pushes us farther away. Uh, it makes it possible for economists in this country to say that we have decoupled uh, prosperity from, uh, from, uh, from energy consumption and carbon output from, from when really what we've done is, is just moved it out of our own sight. At the same time, of course, uh, that sort of exportation of industry has spread the, the benefits of, of uh, consumption to other parts of the world. There are uh, people whose lives have been transformed by, uh, for the better, and not ev even if they have to breathe that air, uh, by, uh, by the fact uh, that we have spread, uh, in, in effect, our manufacturing to other places. The difficulty, and I have one slide that isn't a slide that I do with my arm. Uh, if this is a, a professor named Dan Nocera who was at MIT as a chemist. He's now at Harvard. He, he showed me a graph, and it looks like this. Uh, the uh, one axis is, uh, per, cap, uh, is, is per capita uh, uh, gross, domestic pro uh, gross domestic product, basically affluence, per capita affluence. And the other axis is energy consumption. And, uh, Either axis can be either one because it rises at a 45 degree angle. What it basically says is that as we get richer, we consume more energy, or as we consume more energy, we get richer. Uh, and that's the, that's the real difficulty that underlies uh, all these environmental uh, and climate issues is, uh, is the arm graph. And, and you should always think about it. The, 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 especially, the ter particular difficulty is that by mid-century, uh, global population is supposed to, uh, is forecast uh, to uh, increase by about a third, but global energy consumption is forecasted to almost double, uh, which means that our energy consumption is growing faster uh, than our population because of this, and the, there is no way that we're, gonna, we're going to follow that graph with renewables, which are, which are cl climbing on a much smaller scale. We're going fill that, that, to fill that doubled energy consumption with fossil fuels uh, unless we figure out something uh, incredible to do about it. I'll show you one more uh, slide. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Lake Mead in uh, Nevada. It's uh, lost about half its volume, uh, a little more than half its volume. That's a pier that people used to fish from. The area that you see to the right there used to be a, an area that was re reserved for scuba divers. Uh, you can now walk around it uh, in, in hiking boots. People usually assume that the uh, that the reason that Lake Mead has, you can see the bathtub ring incidentally there at the, the edges. People uh, assume that the reason that Lake Mead has shrunk like that is that the city of Las Vegas, which has grown, been one of the fastest growing cities in the United States and is uh, just 30 miles away. But it's actually not the case. Water from the Colorado River, which is what fills Lake Mead, is divided, is apportioned by an agreement that was signed in the 1920s by seven American states and, and Mexico. Uh, the, the state of Nevada, in which uh, Las Vegas is at that time, there was basically nobody lived there. And at Nevada's allotment of that water was tiny. It's just a, a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, amount of water. As a consequence, Nevada has, uh, Las Vegas has become probably the city in the United States that has the most stringent water conservation rules uh, of any place in the country. Every drop of water that goes down a drain in Las Vegas either is uh, re processed and used again or goes back into Lake Mead. And they don't even use their entire allotment. The downside, and this is what you have to think about as you think about all these issues, is that it's that very frugality with water uh, that has made it possible for Las Vegas to be one of the fastest growing cities in the United States, to sprawl uh, almost unbelievably across the entire valley floor with these uh, tiny single family houses entirely uh, uh, served by automobiles. Uh, and it's it, that, those, that sprawl is as much a product of the water conservation success as the water conservation success is. Um, so I can luckily say uh, I've run out of time, so you all figure out what to do about that. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, but the main, the, I think the main lesson is that sustainability is not, there's no such thing as a su sustainable product or a sustainable building or a sustainable city or even a sustainable country. Uh, sustainability, if it means anything, is a global, is a, is a global phenomenon. It requires contributions from everyone. It, it's, and it's like a, uh, uh, one person described to me as a water balloon. You squeeze it on one end and the other end pops up. Uh, so please figure out a solution to that. Uh, and meanwhile, you can click the uh, video here, just so you won't think I was lying when I started out. But I live to tell the tale. Anyway, thank you very much. I think we have a couple of moments if any of you uh, would like to ask some questions. And I think there'll be other chances during the day for further conversation as well. But. No? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, that was an incredibly charming presentation of an incredibly serious subject. <laughs> I don't think I'd be quite so calm being shot either. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. One, one question. No? No, it's, that's really tough. I was the... My town is it's a small town, and very spread out, and uh, I spent 20 years on the Zoning Commission and about six of them as the, the head of the Zoning Commission. And most of what we did was try to make the town less like uh, New York City by enforcing our, our uh, zoning regulations. And I don't know how, how land use is handled in Canada, but in the States, most, uh, most land use regulations in municipalities date back to the early days of the automobile, and they are designed to make sure pretty much they're designed to make sure that everybody has a place to park. Um, so there's, there, it's all focused on making sure that buildings aren't too close together rather than making, making uh, sure that they're closer together and making sure that there are lots and lots and lots of duplicated asphalt for, for parking. So it's very hard. So first, the first thing you have to do is get around that. Often I think that the biggest uh, objectors to, uh, to urban density sometimes are environmentalists. Uh, especially old school uh, hippie era uh, environmentalists who would like to see uh, uh, urban centers de-densified and to see community gardens planted in, in place of buildings. I made a suggestion to the, uh, to the uh, 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 land trust in the United States, I kept blanking on the name, that I said what they should really do rather than buying pristine land uh, and, and and preserving it forever was to be to, to buy parking lots in, in urban cores and put, build apartment buildings on them just because it would make it that much harder to have a car and would uh, increase the density by that amount. So it's very hard. Uh, but I think you have to, to start with, with small projects. Sometimes you have to start with the, I think we're going to hear about a project, in fact, uh, this very day in a similar way. There are ways to, I think there's much more appreciation now for the value of, of a downtown than there was when people were fleeing. But it, it raises a, a major, major issues, which is, are we just, if we succeed, and if uh, people move back into our cities, who, where, where do the people that they displace go? And do we just sort of uh, create, uh, uh, instead of suburban flight, we create ur urban flight where we're, and we push, the, push people from our inner cities uh, into the suburbs that we're abandoning. So they're all, they're all incredibly, incredibly uh, difficult questions. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, lots and lots to think about. We will continue to do that during the day. And I think the Twitter traffic has shown that people are very, have been very taken by many of your comments. So, uh, please join me in thanking David Owen. And we are going to move right into our second keynote speaker this morning, and after that, there will be a break.
So, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Louise Potvin. She is currently professor at the Department of Social and Preventative Medicine at the School of Public Health at the Université de Montréal. She holds the Canada Research Chair in Community Approaches and Health Inequalities, which aims at documenting how public health interventions in support to local social development contribute to the reduction of health inequalities in urban settings. Her main research interests are population health intervention research and the role of social environments in the local production of health. She was a member of the WHO Euro Working Group on the Evaluation of Health Promotion. And in addition to having edited and co-edited eight books, she's published more than 250 peer-reviewed papers, book chapters, editorials, and comments. She's a fellow and a director of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and the scientific editor of the Canadian Journal of Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Louise Potman. First of uh, the accent is French, uh, so don't, uh, don't turn off the, the radio. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, discuss a little bit about our work. And uh, it's, it's, well, we had a little conversation with uh, Leora, uh, the organizer I was in touch with, about the word invention. And she said, are you really discussing invention? And especially, you know, with a group of urban planners and people whose work is to plan, uh, I found it more interesting to, to discuss about how people invent their solution locally outside of a room like that and how we in those kind of rooms should or could uh, take advantage of what they are doing. Um, how does that work? Uh, work this way? So I have a few premises. Uh, one comes from uh, that book from uh, Edward Soja. Uh, and essentially uh, the, the, the message in that book is that human geographies are not merely external container, given and immutable. Their changeability is crucial, for it makes our geographies the target for social and political action. And that's, at the end of the day, what we're about to discuss today. Another premise uh, comes from the first 10 years of the chair that uh, I've been leading in the Montreal area in partnership with the uh, Montreal Public Health Directorate. And essentially what we found throughout those years that health is created daily and in the daily life using resources available locally. So what you see in the, the, the urban environment that we're providing for ourselves, we should be thinking about it in terms of resources that people can use to make their life healthier. Uh, and essentially, uh, locally, people invent solutions to mitigate resource deficiencies because resources are unequal. And individual limitation in order to maximize the exploitation of those resources. And these inventions, these inventions engage multiple actors socially situated. What we've done in our work for the past 15 years now is to follow those people in their daily life as they create and as they invent new ways of living together uh, to, uh, to mitigate those social inequalities. Another premise is this idea that when we do research about what people do, we can learn. And essentially, the, the epistemic relationship that we've been developing with our uh, research subject is, uh, and that's what we're telling them on a daily basis, we're not here to tell you what to do. We're here to tell you what you do. So we place this research apparatus as a witness and as a reflexive, as a kind of a mirror so people can navigate those inventions with better intelligence. And finally, uh, one an, another premise is this idea that evaluation and this, this idea of telling people what they do is 
actually bringing research into a political space and, uh, and getting outside of this ivory tower for academe is often uh, finding that knowledge is just one other resource that people use to create and invent a better environment for themselves. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Essentially, uh, what kind of lessons we've learned uh, observing local inventions to uh, mitigate the social inequalities that are ingrained in our daily environment. So social health inequalities in Montreal, this has been a long time priority in 1998, 10 years before the WHO. The Montreal Public Health Director created uh, a report which was entitled Social Inequalities in Health, and in which he made it clear that social inequalities in health was the number one priority of his organization. And 10 years later, he, uh, he, he tried to reflect on what has been achieved. So how can we see social inequality, health inequalities in Montreal? This is uh, the island of Montreal uh, in yellow. Uh, so, and these are uh, CSSS, which is the basic health division in Montreal. There are 29 of them. Uh, so in yellow, you have the territories in which the health expectancy is at par with the regional health expectancy, in green where it is significantly higher, and in red where it is significantly lower. And what you can see in there is uh, between the rich neighborhood of the West Island, you have a 10-year difference in life expectancy together with the downtown Montreal. I'm not going to be uh, Edit, making any editorial comment about where were the liberal votes and the PQ votes and the, <laughs> and the Quebec Solidaire votes and that, I guess you can figure that out by yourself. But essentially, there is something going on where people live that makes them live either longer or uh, shorter lives. In his, uh, in his report, Indeed, the, 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 public, the director of public health uh, created a, what I would call a three-pronged strategy to reduce health inequalities in Montreal. Fair access to prevention, and we all know that uh, our nice preventive programs do not reach those who are in the more need for them. Advocate for healthy public policy, so that other, like city, is the city of Montreal, like uh, public, public, uh, public services, will have action that are uh, creating different dynamic with regards to the social determinants of health, and supporting intersectoral local action. At the end of the day, uh, we need as well to uh, be with people and uh, help them create the conditions that will mitigate. And we all know that these are mitigation measures. If we would be really serious about it, we would, uh, we would declare war on poverty. But what all we do, essentially, is to try to mitigate this idea that for a reason or another, we're not ready to declare war on poverty. So this, this idea of the local production of health. So when we started this work, we started by counting resources, you know, with the very naive idea that if you have a low resource, you have lower health. But we realize that resources is not proportional to the health in 
those local geographies. So what it is, then we, we started really thinking hard to develop this understanding of what a place is like. And for us, a place is composed of a series of environments that provide resource, but the key there is not the number of resource, but the rules of access to these results. And the rules of access might be e are of four types do we, do we propose. The first is the physical environment in which the rule of access is proximity. And my own personal problem with all this, uh, this discourse on the built environment is that we're essentially discussing those results. They are absolutely crucial, but they are not the only one. Pr the rules of proximity is that if you live in a polluted environment, you get the pollution. It's, it's as clear as that. So by proximity, you access or not those results, th those resources. If you, if you live close to a park, you have access to green space. In those who work in the poverty area know very well that there's also an institutional environment. And that's where it becomes interesting because in a city like Montreal or in a city like New York, uh, the poorest area are where you have the most density of institutional resources for a very simple reason. Those people, the only way they can access resources is through their right as a citizens. Take for example, uh, housing. Housing is a resource essential to create a life. And sa is safe housing in a safe area that doesn't have mold, that, has the, that is not overcrowded? Okay. If you have enough money, you will access it through the market, through the private sector area. If you do not have enough money, you cannot access it through the market, you will access it through social housing provided by the city. And your entitlement to this housing is to be a citizen, which lives, again, a series of other people outside of it. Refugees, people, illegal people that are left at the end of the day to a fourth type of environment to access resources is what we call informal reciprocity, where it's your identity, uh, being a refugee or not, being a gay person or not, being a woman or not, being a, 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 a woman victim of violence or not, that will entitle you to get to those results, to those resources. The reason why you think that in very wealthy neighborhood there is no resource is that essentially because everybody access very high quality level of resource through the private market that's outside and brought by car, brought outside of the local production. So when we started thinking of places in those uh, terms, uh, we wanted to match it with a, a conception of health that would help us as well make the link. So how, what is it that makes you, uh, that enables you to transform those resources into health. And a colleague of us at uh, University of Bern in Switzerland, Thomas Abel, has taken the, those idea of capitals, taken up from French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. And indeed, for, Tom, for Thomas, uh, health comes from the capacity to tr use your capitals in an ad adequate way, that, in a way that corresponds to the type of resources that you have. Essentially, if you're an immigrant, you 
usually do not have uh, neither uh, cultural capital. You come from a place where you that works in a different way than the, than the place you're in. Uh, your capital that you have, all your education language, might not even be relevant in your new place. In your new place, by definition, you do have uh, a, a limited relationship, limited social capitals, and unless you're one of those uh, rich uh, capital immig investment immigrant, you're usually lacking some uh, some uh, economic capital. You do, however, because of our uh, screening process in Canada, usually have a good biological capital. We rarely uh, let in people who are sick and diseased. So essentially, if you're going to make it here as an immigrant, you're using your biological capital to create a, a work for yourself in which you're going to work hard, make money, create, and this is this biological capital that you're going to use to create other types of capital. So essentially, then, for us, local health is produced like that, meaning that it is configurations of environment that match or do not match the capitals, the capacity to access those resources and transform them into health that people have locally. So as a consequence for local action, the first consequence is that living environments are very, very stable. Their transformation through reforms, programs, and policy is a very long process, as anybody who's tried knows it. But we still continue to try. And transform transformative actions have to take advantage of this recursivity. So essentially, what we're saying, there's no right point of entry, either the people or the environment. Both are point of entry, but what we need to make sure of is that they talk to each other. That as people change and as people gain those capitals, we pr produce resources that will match those needs. And essentially, that we do not take away resources that are correspond to the level of capital. This is probably why, you know, program cuts in social housing are uh, disastrous for many, many, many Canadian families. Essentially because as the market prices of, uh, of uh, real estate has increased dramatically in Canada over the, first, the, the, next, the past uh, 20, 25 years, salaries have not grown. To that, to that level. So at the end of the day, uh, if you take away uh, the, the so social housing that is available through the fact that you're a citizen, what you're left with is the community organization, the, 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 the local people who will get organized together based on some kind of identities. So, given that, and, and uh, the, the Make Calgary is, is a good, uh, is a very good example of that, uh, what we call this social health space, which is the translation into the health realm of social reality, when we interpret housing as a health issue, we're doing, we're creating this social health space. We're creating a space in which health actors come from every uh, trade of, of life. If your grocery store owner is not just a, a, a shop owner on the street, but a provider of health, then you also uh, put health as a political issue. Health become then uh, the, uh, 
the ways in which, or a, 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 a prism through which you will read social reality, but also a result of that social reality. Uh, I'll drop that. And just going back to the role of research into that, okay? Because essentially, when the institutions like public health, like cities of Calgary, like cities of Montreal, try to pair up and develop partnerships with community organizations to be closer to people because at the end of the day, these are the ones that are left behind. And in your next Making Calgary, uh, you will discuss inequities and you will have essentially to discuss as well who are those giving a voice to those who are left behind, which are usually community organizations. So you have this differential of power there. So it, essentially in Montreal, what we've observed, it, when you have this funders fundy power from the institution, you create a dynamic which is complementary to action, but with a total orientation towards action. In community organization, people are reactive. Okay, they are solution oriented. They are action oriented. They have a huge capacity to innovate. Well, I'm sorry, but even though the best intention municipal administration is always remoted to action, there is accountability issue. We cannot just spend money the way we want there, and it's a good thing. So there is a stability there. So the question, and it's a reproductive force. So in our work, what we've observed and we've written about that, about that is that the role of research there thickens and depolarizes those, those two different orientation towards action. Being there as a third party, researcher as a third party, who, whose work is to report on what's going on, uh, creates a different dynamic in there. And what I would call uh, this social health space in which research is one of the pillar brings about this capacity of innovation to work with a sustainability issue that makes those local invention uh, more sustainable, which at the end of the day is uh, what we uh, want to, uh, to achieve. So essentially, what we've discovered and what we've uh, experimented in our daily life as researchers is being out there, not, pe not telling people what to do, not giving them the solutions, but studying with them the solutions that they are inventing, developing, telling them as well, uh, giving them as well the navigating clues to those inventions, uh, depolarize this space, makes it even more uh, capable of reflecting on itself and uh, creating innovative solutions that have better chance of being sustainable. So, in conclusion, uh, what we what we think and what are the, 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 the main message I would like to leave you with is this social health space is a hybrid space uh, in which health hegem hegemony can be contested. And uh, with my daily work with the public health, director of public health in Montreal, uh, it took a tremendous amount of time for him to realize that the fact that his solution were contested by the very people he wanted to help was a good sign. And it was a sign that uh, those solutions cannot come from 
the top, neither a municipal uh, organization nor a research organization, but it takes the buy-in of people. Uh, this social health space uh, is a political, uh, it's where things are discussed, and knowledge acquires a very, very strategic meaning in that. And as researchers, uh, we are tempted uh, to take a high stance in the action. And I see, I see researchers a little bit like journalists in the sense that we are witness. But as, as journalists, we tell people what's happening. But contrary to journalists, our role is really to link what's happening here to a broader uh, body of knowledge and to link, to create linkages between what's happening locally and what others have done and what are the main lessons we can dr uh, drive from all that. Essentially, uh, what I've just described is participatory and intervention research that contributes indeed to regulate this political space that is created when uh, institutions and people get together and try to work together to uh, locally invent a better life for themselves. Thank you very much. Is there a question or two? Between you and the break? No, uh, no, uh, and I, uh, I don't need to be, but, but, uh, but the work we've done is embedded in a chair, and the chair is embedded in the Lea Robach Center for Research on Health Inequalities in Montreal. So it's, it's not individuals that do that, it's, it's, a, it's organizations, and, and uh, as research organizations, uh, we, uh, we do that kind of research uh, uh, with students, uh, with community organizations, with decision makers from the city of Montreal, from, from the public health organization. So uh, I'm just, you know, the spokesperson for a much uh, profound and, and, and I would say much more rooted organization. I have tons of practical <laughs> examples. Uh, an idea about that, it, it, you know, there, and when you, you, you start telling people what they do, uh, you start understanding why things are not the way they are in textbooks. Okay, so in textbooks, we think that, you know, we have a plan, we implement a plan, we evaluation a plan. If it's good, it, if it's good then it gets uh, sustained. If it's not good, then it gets discarded. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, so what we spend about six years and two CIHR grant and one sure grant uh, following the development and accompanying the development of school kitchen program, okay? Uh, and uh, a PhD student work on that and, uh, in, in public health, a PhD student in education as well. So essentially that was, uh, and we did the, publish the genealogy of that program. So it, it was trying in, in poor neighborhood of Montreal to, uh, to develop uh, kitchen classes, but that was totally integrated within the curriculum of, uh, of uh, primary school. And, the, and that was implemented in eight schools, funded by a charity. So, and, and 
these people were having problems uh, trying first. They were not educators, so we brought educators, we stabilized the program, we uh, institutionalized what they wanted to do, and to be able for it to be taken up by the Ministry of Health. But indeed, when you take this idea that was that was supported by goodwill and by mothers and by nutritionists ingrained in the community and you try to scale that up to a province, it's not sustainable. So what are the transformation that goes into that? So even though you have a, good, a very positive evaluation, so it doesn't work that way, okay? So it's, it's when, what I was saying is that the world of action itself does not get into the world of reproduction that is the institution easily, okay? And you need some lubricant in there. And knowledge is one of the lubricant, but it's never taken up as is because there are many competing interests there. So it's, it's one of the, you know, for young people who in, are entering this world of research and intervention research, thinking that, well, we're gonna change the world. Yes, we're gonna change the world. But collectively, uh, with the accumulation of many, many, many projects and a single project has rarely changed the world. Hope I, uh, I answered. Can we do one more? Are you okay with that, all of you? One more question. I have one more question. Um, going back to your graph about the differences in, uh, in um, um, life expectancy for different parts of Montreal, yeah. have you as a researcher done any work with people in, in uh, living in the different spaces to figure out what could be done to reduce those in future? Actually, uh, People figure out <laughs> what, what, what can be done for themselves, okay? And actually, uh, the project that we have been, that we're working on, actually, we've, uh, we've, we have deployed uh, observatory apparatus in four poor neighborhoods in Montreal, following eight projects in real time. So one of the problem in, in when doing that kind of research is that we're doing it retrospectively, so people have to tell us what happened. Uh, what we're doing now, we're, uh, we're having those social observatory, observatory in, in, and we're documenting what's happening in real time. So nonetheless to say we're capturing a lot of noise and it, it's, it's very resource intensive because we're capturing a lot, a lot of noise and we, as action unfolds, we, do, we don't know where it's gonna lead us. So, uh, and, and, and there's not that many such project going on. It's, it's very risky research. Uh, we don't know what, uh, we, we know that we're gonna be able to produce a lot of methodological papers on how to do that, what are the pitfalls, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we have a few uh, students doing masters and PhDs on those projects, and uh, so this is only two years old, but just to, let, to, to, to give you an idea, it took us a year to choose the projects and select the neighborhoods, so it's, it's a research that takes a lot of time and uh, we are producing an enormous amount of data uh, that eventually uh, we'll be able to make sense of. But uh, uh, yes, we're on the, in the field, but uh, we're trying to make sense of what people do instead of doing projects with them. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that that's a really striking example of uh, why discussions like this are so important because we begin to understand more clearly 
on how we all share so many objectives that we come at through our own particular areas of expertise in different ways, but all always with that shared goal. So I think that uh, that is fantastic for us. Um, so on that, please join me in thanking Dr. Louise Potvin. <laughs> And I love the fact that you're all so engaged, but uh, we are thus a little bit late uh, for our break. But uh, why don't we come back here at about 11.05, please? And uh, there are drinks at the back of the room and snacks in the lobby. Thank you. So we're going to start the introductions now. I know that there's some people still uh, bustling in the back, and I'll um, do this introduction. And if you could find your way to the seat, I'd really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> actually, our first speaker is on the phone. <laughs> Bad speaker. <laughs> OK, Andy? All right. <laughs> I would, I would like to introduce Dr. Andy Petullo. Um, we're, we've got two speakers, um, uh, about a half an hour each. We're going to try to insert the, uh, the questions, and we do have a little bit of flex time over the lunch hour, uh, but we'll try to keep things um, as close to time as possible. So, Andy, um, huge thanks to Andy. Uh, uh, Bill told a little bit of the backstory on this. Um, not only is a generous man, uh, but also uh, an expert in his field. To be able to do this within a 24-hour period is, is quite incredible. So thank you, Andy, for that. I'll give you a little background on Andy. Uh, Dr. Andy Petullo is a Senior Medical Director of Informatics at Alberta Health Services. He's a Clinical Associate Professor at the Department of Medicine, the Division of Infectious Diseases at Rocky View General Hospital in Calgary. Uh, he's also, um, he spent some time in the Middle East, which is an interesting part of the story. Between 2000 and 2004 was in Abu Dhabi, um, and he was working as a chairman of the Department of Medicine at the Sheikh Khalifa Medical Center. And also he was a consultant and head there uh, of infectious diseases. Prior to his departure to Abu Dhabi and uh, the UAE, um, he was a consultant for infectious diseases, microbiology, infection control, and director of antibiotic management and home for programs at Kelowna General Hospital in British Columbia from 1995 until 2000. One thing I've noticed about you doctors, you have very, very long titles. You, your, your, your business cards must be immense. So um, with that, I just want to say welcome, Andy, and thank you. So it's true, I did um, get a message yesterday on my phone in the morning asking if I would do a talk today from someone who knows very well that I'm always happy to stand up and talk. Um, and uh, hopefully when you see the slides, you will um, not think that they were just composed overnight. This is an old talk. Um, this is kind of the open mic part. You've heard some, some, from some very smart people, and now you're going to have to listen to me. Uh, you were going to hear a talk from Dr. Manchanda about upstream thinking and health, and I, I hope my talk follows that theme. And it certainly is something that came to me from a similar type of experience. Um, if you don't understand uh, or don't know what the upstream thinking idea is, imagine watching people walking along a river and seeing somebody in the river who's drowning and they run in and pull the person out and resuscitate them. And then someone else comes down the river and they're, they're struggling and you pull that person in and a crowd's forming and a whole bunch of people are finally there pulling people out of the river. And one person doesn't do that. He goes upstream and goes to try and find out where they're falling in and puts a fence up. And healthcare is like that, and most of us who work in healthcare have had this experience of, of working in what we really, really enjoy, a phenomenal field where we get to help people, we get to interact with people from every background, we work with phenomenal teams. But we recognize that much of our time is spent trying to repair health issues that were completely preventable in the first place. And so one goal of this day today should be to put people like me out of business. I'm not worried, but I think that should be your goal. <laughs> Let's see if I can operate equipment. I'm not a surgeon, so if I can't, don't worry. <laughs> Apparently not. So. Okay, we'll try that. 
So as you heard, I, I spent four and a half years in Abu Dhabi, and this was um, like a bright light coming on after there was a vague glimmer of an understanding before. Uh, we opened or commissioned and ran a Canadian managed hospital in Abu Dhabi for four and a half years while I was there and served the nationals who used to be largely Bedouins who were camel and goat herders, who were fishermen, pearl divers, um, and who were thin athletic people whose main determinants of health were those of a developing country to do with poor nutrition, some trauma related to conflict and infections, my area. Um, within one and a half generations of getting oil and the money that comes with it, they built massive cities, engineered virtually all the physical activity out of their life, bought BMWs, Mercedes, and quads, and uh, became the second most obese population on the planet after a South Pacific island with high rates of diabetes so that in my department, 55% of the people at any one time in our beds were diabetics. Um, that's how fast it can happen. They didn't decide to do that. It was the environment that changed around them, and that's the thesis of what I I'm going to talk about in a much less sophisticated way than the things you've heard already. So I'll talk about what we think health is, about how health improved over the last century and some of the deficits that were left behind, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a wake-up call about healthcare, which you probably already understand, uh, about what we can deliver from the healthcare system and why it's much more important than to look at the environment that drives our behaviors, which drive our health. And that's all about how we build environments that will define a better health in the future. And one of the themes here is, I don't think being healthy should be hard. It should be the natural thing that happens by the environment around you and the things that you do in that environment. You sh shouldn't have to think about it. So I'm gonna give you my final message first in case anybody drops off or has to leave or thinks there's something better to do. And it's this, that the urban environment that we are going to design and build right now, and we're lucky to live in a city that's growing and has great opportunities to change the environment, it will determine the health of ourselves, our children, and their children for years to come. And in many cases, there's a convergence of interests here because the best solutions for many other issues, whether it be environmental protection, carbon emissions, poverty, crime, urban infrastructure costs, land preservation, the quality of life, the amount of stress we have and our social cohesion are actually the best solutions for healthy living as well. So we don't have to compromise an awful lot. So health to me is simply this. It's the physical, mental and social well-being that we enjoy ideally for the duration of a natural lifespan. In many cultures, we would consider it the main ingredient and the first priority after happiness. Being happy without health is difficult. And, uh, and for most people uh, in most organized Western democracies, we've made health a priority and we've paid for it because it is a priority. But optimally, I think good health should come from a, a natural consequence of the environment you live in and the behaviors that it drives you to adopt without thinking. So I have to apologize for this slide because the bottom of it's kind of depressing. <laughs> but I have to be honest. All of my patients die eventually. Um, this is meant to just be a life path that I've used to construct some arguments when I was doing a public health review in the Middle East about, about where we can make uh, changes. But if you're born healthy and live a healthy life at some point, it'd be nice to just drop off a cliff or die in some exciting uh, James Bond movie action uh, flick. But it's not likely. Some are not born healthy and might have chronic disability through life and suffer uh, worse health throughout their life, or they may gain um, through illness or injury chronic disability. If it's an acute illness or injury, you might return back to health, and that's part of what the health system's all about. But ultimately, we know where the end is going. It's really, the, in the most basic sense, how long you can live and how healthy you can stay that are the markers of success if we're talking about a healthy life. And I don't mean just physical, but all the other components as well. In the last century, um, enormous gains were made in the health of the population around the globe, more so in wealthier, more developed countries because they had more of the tools to make those gains. But most of those gains were not through the things that our health system does now, which is really more of a mid-century invention, but rather through improvements in nutrition, sanitation, um, social economic status, and wealth is definitely a very strong driver of health, and by the way, it's the other way around too. It's very difficult to get wealth if you're not healthy. 
Um, vaccinations obviously play a big role. There's a lot of that in the media right now. And reduction in armed conflict was, was particularly important as well. But the modern healthcare system that came around mid-century after the war, and you can think of things changing after the war and everybody came back and we started to use the industrial apparatus for war for other things and we, we got wealth, we started to move into suburbs. We started to build the modern healthcare system that consumes 12% of your wealth right now in Canada, 18% in the US. And th that has now been accompanied by a rapid rise in what we call lifestyle diseases, the diseases of living too well. And in spite of the modern healthcare system and in spite of that growing demand for care for other types of diseases, we're not really seeing the types of gains in health from the investment that we're putting in that would seem to be a good cost-benefit uh, analysis. So we pay a lot for getting small incremental changes. This is just an example. This is looking at life expectancy. Um, the bottom blue line would be if you were born around 1990, you, or 1900, sorry, you would live to about 47 years. The older you were at that time, obviously, the higher the odds of living longer. But the incline on these graphs shows how life expectancy rapidly rose in the first part of the century and somewhat slower in the second part. And that bar in the middle is roughly indicative of when the modern hospitals and healthcare systems started to develop. So you can see most of those gains were made before modern healthcare. And this is an example of one of the reasons why. And these are several common childhood infections. Many of you uh, may know that in the 20s or so in Canada, the most common cause of death in a young adult would have been diphtheria. We hardly ever see it now. And again, you can see the brown bar at the right where modern healthcare kind of began. And you can see most of those gains in the reduction in these common infections happened long before uh, modern hospitals arose. And you can also see that a lot of the big determinants of health then that were infections are largely gone. So you might wonder why someone like myself who does infectious diseases is still in business, but it's really the chronic disease epidemic that, that keeps me going. Also notice that while vaccines are very important and I strongly support them, most of those changes came even before vaccines. They came because of the changes in um, nutrition, hygiene, etc. So this is another way of looking at some of those declines, and, and this is just some of the biggest uh, impacts on health in, say, the latter part of the last century. And this is really just measured from the uh, 1970s on to 2000 and a bit. And one of the things I'd point out there, um, we heard a lot about cars and traffic earlier on, and this is one of the things you need to keep in mind. We often talk about the most common causes of death in Canada, and it's always cardiovascular disease and cancer, et cetera, and trauma comes down the list. But if you multiply deaths by how long you would have lived had you not died from that event, trauma comes out on top around the world, and a large part of that trauma is motor vehicle traffic. And you only have to watch the papers to know that, how many young people die in traffic accidents. So downward incline's great. We get to around 2000, and you can see little upticks on trauma and suicide, um, and it's sort of plateauing in terms of the cardiovascular events. So we might be hitting the wall there. And my children are living in a generation that may be the first generation in Western developed countries that actually lives a shorter life than their parents. So what's going on? Well, what happened when we moved to the suburbs, bought cars, started eating chicken, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Coke? we started to have an adverse impact on our physiology and health. And um, this is the curve showing the rise in diabetes in the US starting in 1958, the year I was born, don't tell anybody. Um, and you can see it starts to tip up further towards the end. And if you look at projections, the middle of the graph is around the year 2000, and you can see the projections, and these are not even accurate now because that, that line would probably incline even higher. Um, it's projected to go quite a bit higher and if you believe that we will actually be able to meet the demands of all of this chronic disease related to diabetes and other things with the current budget in healthcare and with the current systems, um, I would have to disillusion you. This is just another example of a chronic illness that's related to that inactivity, um, excess diet, and a number of other metabolic diseases. This is arthritis. This is knee replacements and the demand for those um, per population over 65. And again, you can see it going up. So the top health issues for, from the perspective of a physician or a health system are really cardiovascular disease, which lumps heart, heart attacks and strokes together, trauma, cancer, and lung disease. But this new morbidity that really is lifestyle related is partly that, but some of that related to the fact that now we have an epidemic of diabetes, bone and joint disease, 
chronic heart and lung conditions that are not the acute things that take you away but make it really hard to live comfortably over a long time and rising kidney disease. And keep in mind, they weren't there before, just like those Emiratis were not the most diabetic obese people in the world before oil. So it's, it's not that you can't get back there, but you have to figure out what drove that and try and engineer the environment we live in so we can get back to that. So um, just quickly memorize this if you would. Um, uh, this is a map I use just trying to explain the cause and effect. It's not perfect and there's some missing pieces on here, but it's just, just trying to show how lack of physical activity combined with nutritional ac excess, combined with certain activities like smoking, and then combined with trauma can lead to most of the epidemic of chronic illness that we're seeing and the demands on the health services that are going to be very difficult to meet if we allow the epidemic to continue in the direction it's going. So it's confession time. So I'm in the healthcare system, one of the most expensive endeavors Western nations have. Um, it does me well. Uh, it's a good income, and I love the people I work with, and I love the patients that I, I deal with. And, and I'm very proud of the healthcare system, what it can deliver. But here's the reality. Um, we talk about curing disease and saving lives. As I told you, all of my patients die. If I have an impact, it might be on delaying that, but not stopping it. In terms of curing disease, much of what we deal with is chronic disease and chronic organ dysfunction that we do not fix. We often put supports in place to help. I'm lucky to be in infectious diseases because I actually do see a lot of things that we can um, cure, but those cures are also largely dependent on the health and the immune systems of the patients, and they actually do the healing. We stand by and take credit. If you want to be healthy and you want your kids and your kids' kids to be healthy, you can't rely on me on the healthcare system to deliver that, but we will be there to try and help when we fail. So don't put a healthy population into the hands of the healthcare system. Think more broadly about public health and the environment and how we drive those behaviors. So just one example. So over about 30 years, most Western countries saw a halving of cardiovascular mortality, people dying suddenly from heart attacks. And uh, about 2% of that drop in this one study was reported in Reuters, one of the famous medical journals, um, showed 2% of that came from doing things that we do in hospitals on individuals that are very expensive, very intensive, like bypass surgery and, and percutaneous procedures to open vessels. 2% of that drop was the biggest expense per capita of doing that stuff in hospitals. About 5% was stuff that a family physician would do, managing blood pressure, lipids, um, and again, that's reasonably expensive, not as expensive as being in the hospital. Half of that drop was through smoking cessation, which arguably, arguably didn't cost money because through taxation it probably made money. And in fact, in some analysis, the taxation on tobacco may pay for most of the healthcare costs that are driven by it. And that drop in smoking wasn't so much because of people deciding to quit as much as making an environment where it was easier to be a non-smoker than to be a smoker. Ban advertising, taxation, no passive smoking, can't smoke at work. Um, all of that, if you talk to smokers, actually makes it easier for them to succeed at, at stopping. So I am a simple-minded guy. <laughs> My wife will tell you that. Sometimes she might exaggerate how simple-minded I am. But this is sort of how I see it. You're born, you play around in the green space, and eventually um, you go somewhere else to... <laughs> Uh, but there's a big hole in the ground, what we call the healthcare system, and it isn't a bad system, it's, and I think we do a great job, but public health and all the, all the things we do to keep people healthy are really that fence that stop you from falling into the healthcare system. Um, so just keep that cartoon in mind where we look at the, how the belt environment might drive some of this. So there is a difference in how healthy you will be depending on where you live. And, and um, this is looking by country. Canada is a blue bar, Japan at the top is red, and USA on the bottom is pink. Um, my apologies, but we're gonna make USA look kind of bad here. Um, you might say Japan is a different culture, maybe different genetics, but Canada, the UK, and the US are very similar demographics, and you can see very different rates of obesity. That's what this graph shows. You can see this in the North America map. Um, naturally, Canada is green, and. Or U.S. is largely that horrible orange, and, but that means that the, the U.S. has a bigger obesity problem than, the, than Canada, so where you live is associated with increased rates. Here's another association. If you look at countries, the obesity rate is in red, and you can see it declining from left to right, and the green is the percent of 
trans of, of uh, movement that is done by walking and cycling ver and public transit versus in private cars. So you can see there is an association that in places where people live without cars and commute or walk or cycle, they tend to be less obese. I don't think that's an earth shattering conclusion. But what will most of us do in response to the environment? <laughs> I don't think those people in those countries who walk and cycle and take transit do that because they made a conscious decision. I think it was the easiest thing to do in the environment. Just as outside this fitness club, the easiest way to get in is to stand on the escalator. And if you happen to be in Grand Central Station, there are some, I don't think there's anything wrong with those stairs. I don't think there's a sign that says out of order. In fact, that's a very rare thing to find on a set of stairs. But, so we're, we're human, and whatever, what we do is tends to be whatever the environment makes easiest to do. And we are the um, end result of evolution that took place over hundreds of thousands of years, not in the modern era, and we are evolved to eat when food's available. It's how we survive, to exercise when necessary, when you need to catch that woolly mammoth. We are trained and, and evolved to rest when we're able, and indulge in whatever is available. So if we create an environment that drives inactivity, overconsumption, um, and indulgence, then that's what we'll likely do. I think I could cite a lot of evidence that that's the case. So a couple of studies here. This is an observational study looking at urban and, and uh, counties in the US. And they showed quite clearly that with greater sprawl of cities, there was a lot less walking, more obesity, and higher blood pressure. This is a study of the corridor from Seattle through Tacoma. And some of this is not just to do with or urban geography. Some of this is to do with economic status. So the green areas where they have the lowest rates of obesity are also some of the highest cost areas. So they tend to have um, more wealth. But you can see there's a lot of variation in obesity from the green at less than 10% to the red at more than 25%. Another uh, study in the San Francisco Bay Area, this one baffles me, but they found that within a five mile distance, walking trips were less likely with trip length, steep terrain, rain, and nightfall. Now why steep terrain or rain would be considered a variable in uh, San Francisco, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> and of course, they, they, they found that there are certain neighborhoods because of lower income and, and the perception of threat that were less popularly traveled. But this is probably the study I like the best. This is a good study looking at the urban plan and structure in Atlanta. And Atlanta's recognized as having sprawled quite a bit. But on the left, you see an example of a typical R1 development. We have a little bit of that in Calgary. And a lot of this discussion is about having choice. And there's no question we have the choice of R1 development if we want it. But the right is a very connected community where you mix business, services, schools, and residential together. So what's the difference in the outcome and activity? So this is a graph. And on the left is very little mixed in, mixture in land use, and on the right is very high mixture. And this shows whether you're white or black, male or female, that the more mixture in the environment that you live in, the lower the rate of obesity. Um, it's also related to the amount of walking. So the more mixture, the more you walk. And conversely, if you live in a very mixed environment, you don't spend nearly as much time in cars. And in this case, it's just looking at the amount of time spent in cars and the obesity rate. And the more time you spend in cars, not surprisingly, the more obesity. So what Rand showed us that neighborhood parks help, school playgrounds help, um, mixtures, businesses, and the neighbors, neighborhoods where residents are connected to each other and help each other, um, children are less likely to be overweight. So the true community. So are we going in the right direction with mobility? Technologically, we've solved a lot of problems, right? You could live your whole life without actually putting one foot in front of the other, but is that a good thing? <laughs> so back to the final message. Um, I didn't show you cause and effect studies, but I did show you strong associations that the environment you live in is gonna drive how healthy you are because it's gonna drive how physically active you are. It's gonna set up the food distribution system that you partake of. It's gonna determine how available certain substances are that might be helpful or not helpful. And we have to think about the environment we design to live in because that's gonna determine our health, not me as a physician in a hospital. And again, the best solutions for health are actually the best solutions for many other um, elements. And I really like the talk that talks about social disparity because social disparity is a very strong correlate of ill health and fixing social disparity, we know from looking at countries that have done it well, is one of the best ways to get a generally healthy population. 
And I'm going to end there. And for those of you who are quite young in the audience and don't recognize these people, <laughs> they are, of course, some of the lesser known members of the Faculty of Environmental Design <laughs> out examining the walkability of the neighborhood near the university. Thank you very much. just thinking the endowments we can get from <laughs> these four fellows. Um, Andy, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, uh, a few questions. I'm sorry, someone's pointing. Oh, okay. Um, I think they were going to try to run with, a, here it is, with a uh, microphone because the, uh, people have been saying they haven't been able to hear the questions. If uh, we can't get a microphone to you, then I'll repeat the question for you. But I think we're going to get there. Erin, <laughs> she's great. That's, uh, thank you very much. So you, that Atlanta study is interesting, but I imagine that there is some very distinct socioeconomic factors that play into the, the, the sprawl or the, the, and the health correlation. Has there been any study in Calgary where perhaps those socioeconomic factors aren't quite as disparate? Um, I, I'm not an expert on this area, but there are a number of great posters out in the hallway, and some of them actually are, um, and I think uh, faculty of kinesiology has been involved, as well as environmental design and public health, and, and there are people exactly examining that in Calgary. Um, but I would also say that I'm not comfortable with the idea that social economic factors are not a big determinant in Calgary, and I certainly see it from the patient side of, of, uh, of things in that many of the patients I see are quite well off, not surprisingly in Calgary. And they are able to often take many, many steps in a, of, above and beyond just normal daily living to look after their health. They belong to fitness clubs, they have personal trainers and things like that. The people I see who have the hardest time managing their health, even if they know what to do, are people who are living on the margins and are not well supported. Uh, but they're, look at the posters, some, some great posters that are on walkability um, versus urban structure. Other? We have a question here. Um, I'll repeat. Again, the question is bringing it back home here to Calgary and find out what we can do to improve the situation. Is that? Okay. So I, I seem to be a target for questions I'm not probably qualified to answer. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a great question though. And, and I, I have to tell you, I love living in the city because it's one of the best places where people are connected together with imaginative thought about trying to solve those problems. I think the city is actually doing that whether you, know, you heard that we got police services, health services, social services, the university and academics all working together in the same direction. So I, I'm optimistic. Um, you know, one way would be to solve poverty, to make sure that we didn't have large inequities in income. I'm not an economist. Unfortunately, we just lost um, a, 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 someone I thought was a fairly effective economist just yesterday. But um, there are also things you can do before we get wise and solve that problem. Um, if you think about Calgary, if you came here without a lot of income, if you were a single parent, how easy would it be to manage a job, your children uh, in school, and look after a house without a car? And how expensive a, is a car? That's ten to $12,000 a year to manage a car for many people. So if we can actually build structures where it's much easier to live without a car, and I, I've also had that experience living in the West End of Vancouver. It's a phenomenal lifestyle. I loved it. We take a baby carriage downtown at two in the morning and there's people everywhere, it's very safe. But we haven't, prevent, we haven't provided that choice for those people who most need it in Calgary. You can have that downtown lifestyle here, but you need to big pockets to, to do that. So, so I think we can build more environments where you could live close to transit without a car on a modest income, that would help. We could build a better food distribution system so that healthy food and choices, things that aren't that expensive are more available. 
And some of this is, is a lot about knowledge. If you talk to a lot of people struggling to make do, and that includes university students, including my own, with minimal income, if they don't know how to prepare their own food, if they don't know how to prepare good food from cheap materials, they're going to struggle. They're going to be at the McDonald's. So I think there's lots of things we can do. Um, and ultimately, hopefully, it'll be resolving the economic disparities. So we, we've got time for one more question. We have a gentleman in the back. Uh, microphone is coming to you. Thank you. Um, I read recently that the CDC in the United States, the Center for Disease Control, has identified what they call as adverse childhood experiences as the number one public health problem in the United States. And I don't know whether we identify with that or not in any way, but the experience in the United States that uh, children that are abused and neglected end up at much higher disease rates, a shorter life expectancy, and have a lot of these fundamental issues. To me, this is where we're back at the basics. And what do we do, do we agree with this? Does this make sense? And what do we do with this? Because this is something we could do things uh, significantly. And we've recently had this problem with uh, uh, children that have died in, in uh, child welfare and so on and, and this type of thing. And it is a major issue in this province, in this city. And something I think has to be dealt with at a city level. Anyway, just So first of all, I want to, I, I, I don't think I've read that particular report. I've just heard about it on the news. But I 100% agree that one of the most adverse things that can happen to somebody in terms of their health their, and their, their social success is bad experiences as a child. And I think we have to be careful not to blame parents because the parents are usually poor parents because they've had exactly the same experiences as their children uh, live through. It's, a, it's almost hereditary. But um, my experience, I, my first uh, job was working in St. Paul's and I, I was in a research institute for HIV AIDS and a large part of my career and all my research was around HIV AIDS. The people who had it often had it because they'd been marginalized because of the adverse experiences in childhood, whether it be gay men who were not accepted or cast out of the family, women who were on the street uh, in the sex trade who were almost universally sexually abused before they ever found their way there. Um, people on reserves who had no role models, uh, no hope where they, where they grew up. So I agree that that is a big driver. The next question, how you fix it, you're not talking to the expert. There may be a lot of experts in the, w in the room. You know, and and, and I, I think we're trying to find those solutions. But it's, I, I, I want to make a, a plug for a book. Uh, it's called The Blue Zones. You might have, there's a TED talk on it too, but it talks about the healthiest populations on the planet. One of the things about those people who live a long life and don't use a lot of services is that they're very connected communities. There's no such thing as a single parent. The community is the parent. And, and that probably would help with a lot of these issues if we build back connected communities where my children are everybody's children. So just a suggestion. Okay, thank you very much. Andy, that was wonderful. You know, uh, when we talk about these things and the and what you portray, it's rather dire uh, when we're looking at this thing. And and I think this is what's very important about these kinds of gatherings is also to think about the hope. And because we can't live in a dire situation and just you know remain there, and there has to be hope. And I think it is about collaborations like this. But I think it's it's a work this, of the scientists, but it's also the work of the designers. Um, and, and it's uh, work of the philanthropists, it's a work of the social agency. So what we are going to see now um, and here um, is uh, Joyce Drawn, who is a urban designer and architect, comes from a firm, a uh, very well-known firm uh, in Vancouver, Perkins and Will. And uh, we know her particularly well, of course, in the Faculty of Environmental Design. And I'm, I'm very, very happy that we can uh, broadcast your <laughs> profile even uh, broader with this, uh, this symposium. Um, has extensive experience in the design of sustainable communities. And just a, a little bit of uh, what those communities were. You may be familiar with them uh, in um, our prairie uh, region. 
But recently, uh, Joyce led the uh, Design for a Winning Master Plan for the Blatchford Redevelopment, which is based on and is transforming Edmonton's municipal airport lands that you might be familiar with. And it's a model of sustainable city, city building that we're going to see there. Uh, in a similar initiative, she, she also, Joyce, also led the work on Saskatoon's north downtown, replacing the city's rail lands, and that's something we really want to hear about um, in this city, with a complete uh, community. Um, Joyce is also uh, has lead roles in the design of many of Vancouver's flagship sustainable uh, communities, which include, and you may be familiar with these, Southeast Falls Creek and East Fraser Lands. So I think that when you look at Joyce's work, I think it reflects her and her firm's commitment to the creation of meaningful places that embody a community's historic, cultural and social values. And all of those values are extremely important when we're talking about a healthy community. So what results, I think, in the work that is done by Joyce and, and uh, her colleagues is that they're reaching for more su the, the sustainable, the livable, and the healthy in the urban realm. I might also add, and uh, Joyce and I have met uh, on other occasions, and that is also because Joyce is a board member of the Council for Canadian Urbanism. So with that, I'd like to invite Joyce up to speak to us now. Thank you very much, Nancy. And I, I just want to take a moment to thank all the members of the Urban Alliance. It's such a fantastic idea. and and such a thoughtful group given the, the events I've heard about that you've already put on. Um, I'm from Vancouver. Vancouver's touting itself as the world's greenest city or soon to be, um, but we don't have anything like this. And I, I'm certainly keen to get back and, and bring this idea to the university and to the city. So thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I, Andy really set this up very nicely for me because he talked about the, the relationship, the, the deep relationship between urban environments and, and human health. And that's really what our firm focuses on. We've had, I've had the great experience, the great privilege in the last sort of 10 years, I suppose, working on brownfield sites. And that's a particularly um, interesting um, place to look at urban design because it allows you to bring together all of those layers that are inter interdependent in human health. It's not as easy uh, for those people like uh, Jeanette Sadiq Khan in New York City who are really doing the kind of guerrilla urban design in, a built in, in an already existing environment. Just want to point you to this quote that I found from the World Health Organization's uh, this is the preamble to a 1946, the, the constitution for the WHO um, in 1946, it was adopted. And it goes very much to the heart of our work. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, um, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And I, I think that's what we're looking for here. We're looking, as Andy said, we're looking for ways to make a healthy lifestyle, uh, an easy choice for people. Um, I'm not a physician, obviously, but um, our professions are overlapping more and more. Just to give you an example, this is where I work in uh, the South Downtown, which is uh, really the, the origins of the, the term Vancouverism, tall towers, low block, perimeter blocks, but lots and lots of amenities. This was, uh, part of a tour that a, a, a group of young physicians in Vancouver asked us to give them because they were so interested in understanding what are those ways that we can start to design the built environment to allow people to have more access to uh, city resources, to um, particularly, I guess, uh, to be able to walk uh, in, in as many different ways as possible. And this is what I'm gonna talk to you about today. Whoops going in the wrong direction. Uh, of course, we, uh, it's nice to see graphics starting to overlap as well. <laughs> I, I won't go into this because Andy covered it so beautifully. Um, same thing here except to say that cities are recognizing that relationship between design and um, the lifestyle diseases. In this case, um, 
chronic disease. New York City has been particularly good at this, and I, I, I'm imagining David and company, or, or David Down, are familiar with their active design guidelines. Just a wonderful um, compendium of how you start thinking about changing the city for active lifestyles. So there's really five considerations that we bring automatically to our work when we're thinking about um, designing a community. And number one is access to nature. Cities aren't doing enough of this. Um, and certainly with brownfield sites, it's an opportunity to be much more ambitious uh, in your goals. Connectivity is number two. And I could easily have, have put walkability here, but it's all about giving people the opportunity to walk to as many places in their community as possible. And of course, this is, this is also um, part and parcel of engaging with others in your community. So it's, it's a big subject. Diverse uses, um, Andy talked about mixed use and the, the importance of it, um, as did David, New York City, and all its resources for people. Um, you want walkability, but you also want the amenities and the, the services and the shopping and, and learning opportunities that go with it. Housing choice is huge, and I know Nahid Nenji talked just recently about the, the crisis here. Um, that's something that any new plan should be focusing on, especially when you've got a, a chance to build a critical mass of housing. And finally, renewable energies. This is something our office um, has taken a lead role in. We have eight research, sustainability research uh, people within our office, which is a little bit unusual for a design firm. Um, but we are very serious about helping cities understand how they can move that agenda forward. So I want to start, Nancy mentioned uh, the Blatchford redevelopment. I want to start with our Edmonton project, subject of an international competition, and I give all the credit to city council and staff. They set the parameters for this competition, very, very high bar. They asked for a global model for sustainable city building. Um, you can see the site, it's um, the old municipal airport, just two kilometers from city hall. So. Uh, ultimately very much a part of the, the, the metropolitan um, area uh, with huge responsibilities, I would say. Uh, just um, drawing your attention to the photograph at the top, this is the view to the downtown core from the midfield um, in the airport, something that we wanted to, um, wanted to maintain as part of the design. It's always difficult when you're dealing with a, a fairly complex um, design problem to communicate it to people in, in sort of relatively simple terms. Um, and David used his arm. We, we thought as a team, how could we characterize this, uh, this project in a really simple way? And so we have a park, we have connectivity, we have access to growth and, and sort of catalyst for growth. And finally, we have history, and I'll explain that. Um, Starting off at the, the top left, uh, th this is really the, the kind of overarching aim of the plan is connecticity, is connectivity. <laughs> and we tongue in cheek used the term connecticity um, to characterize that. But um, in a more serious vein, uh, you can see in the, the top left hand circle, Edmonton has a wonderful, um, a wonderful series of riverside parks, uh, as does Calgary. But what they didn't have at this site, which was quite a bit to the northwest, was any kind of significant open space. There were all the municipal reserve parks, but nothing really significant to bring the community together. And so we saw an opportunity because there's an existing rail corridor that runs down the west side of, uh, you'll see in that circle, that would connect this park directly to that series of parks. Um, we had an opportunity going east-west as well, and eventually created a 27-kilometer, what we call river-to-river -river loop, so really connecting this community back into the larger city. Um, at a more local level, um, on, to the top right-hand side, there was a real um, ambition to bring the community together by extending the urban pattern that already exists around the perimeter straight onto the site. Uh, so that not just roads, but also walking paths, cycling paths, et cetera. And the blue line that runs through there is 
uh, Edmonton's new LRT line. Only the south part of that's built. There's one station on site right now, but it's a similar, um, I, know, I know Calgary's got a, a very ambitious uh, LRT program in place right now as well. And both cities um, seem to be in a, in a race to uh, get the most stations in place uh, in the shortest time available. Um, connecting to growth for a plan like this, uh, any plan really is huge. To have, you, you want a plan like this to be viable. And so you look around the site and say, well, what's, what's here that can help us? Um, so number one, it's, the site's blessed. It's got Canada's uh, largest technical institute, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, 13,000 full-time students, soon to be 25. Uh, they will be a partner on the site as well, so bringing that student, um, that, that student vibe and, and, and kind of energy to the community. We have a successful shopping mall immediately south of the site. Um, you wouldn't necessarily think this is a natural, but it, it, abs it absolutely is, because one of the hardest things to establish in a mixed-use community is new retail. Developers always struggle with that and end up subsidizing retailers for many, many years. With an existing shopping here and a draw for people from all over Edmonton, there's that kind of built-in attraction to this area. And then finally, uh, we are also blessed by having Canada's largest critical care hospital um, just steps away. That's the Royal Alex. Um, and a rehab hospital right next to that. And the idea is actually to bring uh, many of the hospital services onto the site. There's a health agency that will be building on the site, but also we're keeping our fingers crossed that Alison Redford's, um, f the uh, former premier, her, uh, her idea of bringing neighborhood clinics um, uh, to the city, I think, there I think the number was 143 to the city of Edmonton would be um, something that we would see fitting very, very naturally into this site. Then finally, history. Connecting any, um, any community to its history is absolutely crucial. And we use this for history because we chose to embed the runways into the plan rather than tearing them out and making them disappear. Um, we also have the benefit of um, some World War II hangars, which are amazing places. Uh, the old terminal, terminal building, which is already a school, and the observation tower, which become artifacts on the site. So this is the, this is the plan, and you'll see that the, the park is really the centerpiece. There's three neighborhoods. The, on the westerly side, the agri-hood. The, the city had a huge ambition for urban agriculture, and this increases the city's urban agriculture by about 60%. Uh, the Technology and Research District on the uh, easterly side, and it has the benefit of the LRT running right through the center and is also um, immediately adjacent to Nate. And then finally, the town center in the lower, um, at, at, at the lower um, um, neighborhood right next to the mall. And that's where most of the, um, that's where most of the um, retail and commercial life will be, a kind of natural synergy with that. It's going to be for 30,000 people um, in terms of amenities, the live, work, play, and learn. Um, those are all things that you want on a, in a community where you can, um, you can walk to these things. They can be part of your life. You can engage people and, and recognize faces every day as you make your way to shopping, to school, to, school, to work. Um, we are uh, aiming at 100% renewable energy. That means net zero um, energy, and again, uh, looking for those, giving people those lifestyle choices. So I wanna start with the park. Um, we, no waste leaves the site. Uh, this hill is 100 feet high, and it's made of the waste um, that uh, is used from the excavation, both of stormwater lakes that you see in the, the mid-ground, and also for the, for the construction um, of all of the, de the development parcels. Um, this park allows people really to live in a park. 98% of the residents in this community are within a two minute walk of a park. That's because it's not just this park, but neighborhood parks beside it, and it's those connections to these amenities that are super important. Just wanna point out one thing in the, the rendering, and that's the, um, you'll see the long line on the far side of the lake with little red um, elements along it. 
That's what we call the Northern Lights, and it's part of an initiative to really make this park uh, for all Edmontonians. It's what we call our, our kind of promenade, and we expect um, residents to come here and, and walk on, say, a, a sunny winter day. Those uh, little pavilions will use geothermal heat to provide some, um, some moderate heat and stopping points along the way and, and allowing people to get out of the harsh uh, Edmonton wind. Um, and and as, as I mentioned, the access to the park is super important. We have the main park, but you'll see there's also community parks um, that weave into the, the neighborhoods on all sides. Uh, the blue line is, of course, that river-to-river -river loop connecting this whole community back to the larger city. Um, lots of paths through the park, and of course all the roads lead to the park as well. Um, again, you see the, the northern lights, that orange band that runs down the left-hand side. And this is, a, this is zooming into that um, Northern Lights amenity. We, it does have housing along it. We, we do want eyes on the, the uh, park and the streets, but mostly it's there for recreation, for civic uses. Um, there might be small galleries, small cafes, uh, and certainly some of the recreational uses for Nate um, are also imagined to be there. This is just moving down towards the, um, towards the epicenter of the community, which is Wapmay Plaza, Wapmay being one of the uh, original bush pilots in uh, Edmonton and celebrated here. And then finally, um, the southerly portion of the Northern Lights actually starts to soften and become more green. This is where we're trying to bring um, a kind of balance between this higher density neighborhood and access to nature. So I just want to go back to the, the connectivity, and um, really that's to do, um, that has everything to do with mobility. And what we try to do with the, the mobility networks in our plans is we try to nest them as much as possible so that they, they're inter-reliant, interdependent. Here you can see the transit net network on the left-hand side. There are two stations planned and a possible third in the future. Um, it's the purple line and it, it goes through the site and uh, crosses the Yellowhead Highway and then heads up to St. Albert. So a real regional connection where um, all of the other uh, lines that you see here, uh, there's a tram that runs down the westerly neighborhood, the diagonal one, uh, and the bus lines are all actually bringing people into the transit station. Um, to the right-hand side, this is complemented by the bike network and um, I would say that the policy in this community is really that all of the streets, except for the ones that you see highlighted, are meant to be shared streets. Um, David talked about the idea of, of um, you know, um, getting rid of streets and, and making it harder for people to, uh, to drive. That's not the policy here. It's actually a policy of distributing streets. So you've got lots and lots of streets and lots of choices for drivers. They don't have to go barreling down these great wide streets, but they do have to share streets with cyclists and, and generally drive a little bit slower. The pedestrian is first in all of our street design, and um, I'm not gonna get into the details. Um, you have a great complete streets person at City Hall, and. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're working on that with our city as well. The important thing, I think, is that we're trying to make streets as intimate as possible for people. Um, these great wide rights of way make it very, very difficult for pedestrians to feel comfortable. Um, and I can tell you that one of the, in my experience on every single master plan, it's the engineers that need to be educated. Um, they fight for, they need their space in the street for their utilities, but you know what? If you work hard enough and long enough with them, you really can get them to compact them and lead to much, much narrower rights of way, which just feel way more comfortable for people, especially in a windy environment. Um, we're working, um, th there's one street uh, in the Olympic Village that's uh, 14 kilometers, uh, for, uh, sorry, 14 meters wide, the right of way. Uh, I, that represents probably the biggest war with engineers that I've had in my career. <laughs> but there need to be more of them because it makes for a much easier walking and enjoyment of the streets. And of course, in, in Edmonton, as in Calgary, um, climate responsive uh, design of streets is, is tantamount. I mean, 
what we've done here is we've offset the blocks so there's you don't get more than three blocks in a row and they're relatively small blocks so that wind can build up and, and make it really uncomfortable for you to walk in the streets. That's, um, that's absolutely key to this. We also um, have the huge benefit of the hill which provides some opportunities for people to use the park, the northerly part of the park quite comfortably in the winter. So back to the mix uh, of uses, um, this is something we worked very hard at and you'll notice that in the town center at the, um, at the base of the drawing, that's where the critical mass of shopping and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and commerce and office is. There's about 250,000 square feet of shopping. That's kind of equivalent to a small uh, high street. It's about four blocks long and it ends in Watmay Plaza. The other end, we're, um, interestingly enough, we're currently working with the mall owners on developing a walkable community on their site. So it's, it's, um, it's kind of the dream of synergy for us. But what I wanted to point out is that the, the amenities, the retail, doesn't just reside in the town center. We've pulled it up into the neighborhoods, and those points of, of mixed use are also places, for instance, where we'd like to see the, the health clinics I talked about, their transit stops, and you'll notice that there are also locations where the green network starts to move through. So it's bringing all of those opportunities together for people to both engage on a social level, but also to get to places as easily as possible. Um, I, I, I won't talk about it at length, but um, we worked very hard with the city to um, understand what this kind of mix would realize in terms of jobs. And um, it stands at about 11,000 jobs, and that's um, about one job per every three persons in the community. Not, not, a bad, um, not a bad target for a brand new community. There's also um, three schools, uh, one elementary and two high schools in the, the light um, turquoise. And Nate, of course, is a partner on the site. They're looking at bringing a lot of their programs into the town center, including their culinary program. They hope to have a bakery on the main street. They um, also have the biggest uh, meat cutting um, um, course in Canada, and so there's likely to be a butcher on Main Street as well. But I mean, this opportunity to bring uh, an educational institution together with the community is just, um, it's, it's quite um, unbelievable. It's, it's, a, it's a real blessing. So I just want to walk you quickly through the, um, the, the, the three neighborhoods, just to give you a little bit more of a sense of the, the look and feel of this place. Starting with the, the agri-hoods, and this is really based, this is really focused on families. It's the lower density part of it. Uh, you can see the, um, what, what we call Bush Pilots Runway is the top rendering. So that's the, the primary armature um, built over the runway. Um, and it's showing the eventual tram route along that street. But you can see the attention to making it a great environment for pedestrians. It's that, that's our first focus, is making it comfortable, making it easy for people to sit outside, to use the, uh, the sidewalks, they're very wide, um, and also access to the trains themselves. Like Calgary, Edmonton has a high boy system. Um, we didn't want that to affect the, 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 the edges of the street. We wanted to keep the street down at grade, so we elected to put the stations in the middle. That's not dissimilar to um, San Francisco's LRT system. It works very well. The stations are relatively discreet, and it means the, the pedestrians in the street can move um, very, very easily. Uh, the rendering in the, the bottom is um, what we refer to as the furrows. It's a kind of, um, you can see the kind of agrarian geometry of this neighborhood. And the, this is where all of the urban agriculture um, opportunities reside. About 600 um, uh, plots, um, but also some larger community-based plots, which you see in this rendering here. Very quickly on housing, just to give you a sense of the choice here, um, the city was very explicit. They wanted housing choice. They did not want single family housing. The only single family housing has to be net zero. There's a handful, 50 demonstration houses. All the rest uh, in this neighborhood are four to six stories, very comfortable sort of walk up, um, and a lot of row houses. 
the Technology and Research District, uh, by virtue of the fact it's got the LRT running through it, uh, is clearly the place where you want to put your density. This is where you want to make it easy for people to access transit. Um, you want to, um, you want to, and, and it's also the place that serves the Nate students that commute every day in, in and out of the campus. The um, green space here that connects through to the main park uh, is more of a kind of meandering corridor, but it does have a job. It carries stormwater, and the top rendering that you see here uh, is a depiction of one of those green fingers, a little bit more urban and dense than, than you might imagine, but uh, nevertheless a, a kind of working green, green lung. And at the water's edge, uh, this is a, um, a rendering in the bottom of the, uh, what the northern lights might be like, one section of it with housing. Um, there happens to be a gallery in this one and also the rowing club for, uh, for the Nates Recreation Program. At the housing here, again, higher density, more into six and, st six and eight story forms that you would see along that, that primary spine um, and getting into, um, getting into um, housing forms that would suit Nate students. Um, Nate already has funding in place. They don't currently have students on campus, but they have funding in place for 1,200 beds, which we see as, as a major uh, bonus here. Nancy's telling me I've got five minutes, so I'm gonna go quickly through the rest of this. Um, just to say the town center is uh, a, a place for much higher density, and this is where we see, um, we have uh, helped the city with the rezoning. There is a requirement for 20% affordable housing. I know that isn't something that, that's currently part of um, this city's policy. It's been in Vancouver for a long, long time, and, and we would certainly advocate for it in any city that we're, um, where we're master planning. It's uh, one of the few ways to get affordable housing in place. We are reducing the carbon footprint um, here with our renewable energies enormously. Edmonton's currently at 24 um, tons of carbon per person per year. Um, we know they can get down to approximately four, and that's equivalent with cities like um, Hammerby Sjostad in Stockholm and other Scandinavian examples. Um, one of the reasons it's so high is because of where it gets um, its electricity. It's all coal-fired. Um, that drives it hugely high. And to bring it down, we are um, proposing a biomass plant uh, that will rely on Edmonton's waste system. Um, I don't expect you to memorize this either, but this is how we're getting there. <laughs> um, the orange represents the biomass. Um, it's going to be um, generating heat and power. Um, the, um, sorry, the orange represents a combination of that and geothermal, both of which are, are complementing each other. What's really um, remarkable about this project, though I would say from a renewable energies point of view, is that it goes well beyond carbon neutral. That's because the proposal is to take any of the excess heat, and there's lots of it in these processes, off-site to the big consumers, and that includes uh, the hospitals, the government buildings, and uh, some other educational institutions as well. So this is what the final plan looks like. Um, I have a few minutes to just take you very quickly through, I've got about six slides to show you, but Nancy mentioned Saskatoon. We're taking very similar, um, a very similar sort of attitude around to Saskatoon. In this particular case, they had a huge issue around trying to cross over active CPR rail right of way, 45 meters wide. They asked us for bridges. Um, we decided to give them a park. <laughs> it actually does carry roadways, but um, in terms of walkability, in terms of giving people opportunities to cycle, walk between the two parts of this community, we saw this as the real glue and the, the kind of healthy solution. On the right-hand side, we've just been hired by the city of Saskatoon to, to look at what they call their integrated growth plan, and that will mean um, this North Downtown Master Plan is the first step, but um, what it means is looking at their future transit um, opportunities and layering onto that all the development opportunities they can see in the city. It's an enormous project, but one that I would advocate for seeing in any city. It's, it's absolutely essential when you're trying to bring these things together. 
I won't go into the networks. Um, that's the final plan. Um, you can see very mixed use neighborhood. Um, uh, just the rendering in the very center, that's the foot of the land bridge taking you over to the other side of the city. And I want to end with um, four more slides, if you'll indulge me. Uh, in Vancouver, um, we were recently asked by the city to look at another brownfield site. Uh, if, if you know Vancouver at all, uh, the top right-hand sketch uh, shows a planned expressway to go right through the city that was done in the 1960s. Happily, there was a, a very active, um, a very strong group of act civic activists who came out against it, huge protest, stopped it, uh, except for this one little piece a mile and a quarter long <laughs> that happened to sneak in. Uh, it, we call it the viaduct. You can see it, um, so it sort of bends around one of the, the stadia. It's right at the end of False Creek. And what the city wanted to know, is the city owns uh, the land on the, um, the easterly side. Uh, there's private ownership on the westerly side. They wanted to know what, what can, how can we re-envision this? So this is what we suggested. You may know of the Agacons, um campaign for pluralism. It, it's, it's a tremendous piece of work, like all of his work, but I think what I find the most fascinating about it is he's advocating for major city parks in some of the most conflicted areas in the world. And the first one to be finished was in Cairo. Why? Because he, the way he puts it, these are the kind of beautiful but neutral places where you can bring people of disparate incomes, dis disparate perspectives, um, uh, and disparate um, cultures into a place where they can enjoy nature together and engage with each other. It's a really simple message, but um, a really important one. This allowed for um, two city blocks on the, on the right-hand side of the park that are, are city-owned. That's where affordable housing is going as well as social housing. Uh, on the left-hand side, um, this is the the last um, the last uh, development parcels belonging to Concord, the developer that developed all of South Downtown, the original Expo lands, but a really nice way of bringing those two parts of the city together. It it also brought roads together, so rather than five disparate. Um, parcels, it's now two major park spaces, and we worked very hard at getting, making it easy for pedestrians to get across that road. Uh, this is the, the aerial view of that, um, just the connections through, and then finally a depiction of, of what the park might be like. Um, last thought I'm going to leave you with is that even with these major parks, um, super amenities for the, the, um, the whole city, it's really important to think about the local communities. And you'll see that we have smaller parks that run along this, this kind of promenade down to the water. And those are, are effectively the parks that would become the new open space for a very disenfranchised community, the downtown east side, um, that suddenly will have access to um, th this part of the city and primarily False Creek, which is a great amenity in the city. So thank you very much. I, um, I really appreciated being here. And, uh, thank you, Joyce. Um, some questions for Joyce. Yes. Joyce, what did you have to do with zoning in Edmonton? Um, I'll just... Uh, so people can hear. So uh, the question from David uh, was, what did you do in Edmonton around zoning to make this happen? Uh, it, <laughs> that's a really long answer, but the short answer is um, we were, we helped the city write the zoning. It was a completely different zoning than they had seen before. The first argument was, why can't we bring all the other zoning that we already have together and, and just, you know, uh, be done with it. And we said, no, no, not going to work. <laughs> I mean, number one, I, just to give you an example, was the 20% um, affordable housing. That hadn't really been part of the zoning before. And so there's things like that. There's new um, parking requirements. A big part of this uh, wa plan was reducing the parking demand. And so we went from 
two cars per unit to one car per unit. Why? Because people are living close to transit. They've got lots of opportunities to walk. They don't have to be um, getting in their car all the time. And we have a park once strategy, which means in the town center, you can conceivably park somewhere and only, only park there once and get all the services you need. Most people these days, especially in that part of Edmonton, they drive around to you know the grocery store, the uh, department store over here, the shoemaker over here. They're all different destinations. So we we were very much a part of that, and I'm I'm very happy that we were there. It was a good outcome, and and actually the the naysayers I'd say at the city are, are now advocating for this kind of policy. Got another question here. Oh, I can repeat okay. it. Okay. <laughs> Um, Thanks, a, a common <laughs> argument you hear with renewable energy is the cost. Um, does that affect your master plan? Does the cost increase? And then the second part to that, which you kind of touched on, do you think that's going to affect the demographics of people living there? So the question was that, uh, the, the re that renewable energy costs more money, and um, how are we dealing with that? And the second question was, I'm not quite sure, is it, is it going to affect the demographic living there? Ah, okay. On the 20%. Yep, yep. Um, the the the, answer, the real answer to renewable energies, and maybe I don't know if you there was an article in the Globe this week actually on the, the Germany and the fact that they're starting to face up to the costs of renewable energies. Yes, it does cost more money. What we're attempting to do though is by selling excess heat off-site, heat and power off-site. That's where we were looking for the balance. Um, in the Olympic Village, uh, where there's a, renewal, there's a district energy system, it's actually drawing heat from sewage. Uh, people do pay slightly more for their power, but what we're finding is that there's an acceptance of that, especially among younger buyers or renters. Uh, a lot of them are looking for that kind of, of um, situation. Um, so. It's, I can't say it's cheap, it's cheaper, but I think cities need to start investing in clean energy, and it's gonna cost a little bit of money up front. Yes, here. Uh, through a lot of a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, that's it's. Uh, I can't tell you how many meetings we had with the transportation department there. Um, although, to be fair to Edmonton, there's a lot of folks um, both in the transportation department and in the planning department who are starting to work together a lot more. So it's making it easier. Um, we've got some extremely narrow streets in this plan, like down to I, I'd say 12 meters. Um, but those tend to be in the, you know, sort of right in the heart of the residential area. Um, but it, it was still a leap for Edmonton to go to even 20 meters. And, uh, you know, it's all about the utilities. You have to convince engineers that, you know, um, I, I mean, they need the space to get down and service them, but there are ways of doing it. And um, if you work with some enlightened engineers, um, there's, there's a few of them around. They know how to do that. <laughs> We have uh, one more question there. We absolutely are, and um, thank you for asking that. Um, the, the question was whether or not we're looking at native species, we're looking at uh, local habitats, that kind of thing, as we, as we design the park. And yes, um, we work with, um, we've been working with a very talented group, um, Phillips Farbag Smallenberg out of Vancouver. Um, and habitat's a, a huge part of this. Um, as our native landscapes, we're reintroducing the Aspen native landscape, but um, interestingly enough, the, um, even the stormwater lakes and the hill, some people would say, well, that's artificial, but in fact, it, it is um, 
part of Alberta's cultural landscape. It, it's referred to as the kettle and the knob, um, formed by glaciers. And um, you know, we're also looking at wetlands, um, reintroducing wetlands around the edges of the lake as well. Of course, there were many, many discussions with uh, the parks folks about, uh, you know, attracting all sorts of birds that were going to cause trouble and that kind of thing. But I mean, it, it's all the things that you want to see in a, a natural setting. It does happen to be the um, confluence of the two continental flyways uh, across North America. So um, who wouldn't want birds? <laughs> Thanks, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Joyce. So before we close, um, I just wanted to say a few words. I'll, uh, we've got a few. We've got about an hour now. Um, again, the importance of the the circles here in regards to people uh, networking and, and uh, following up also with our keynotes. Um, what reminds me though uh, about all of these talks is it's something that, that's been going through my mind through the morning. Is that uh, those of you who may or may not have seen this? Uh, there was uh, Avenue Magazine here in Calgary back in the fall talked about their big idea and their big idea was about for progressive cities it's this it's this nexus between education design and health and that progressive uh, cities are ones that are really concentrating their efforts in these uh, three spheres so I think this is exactly what we're doing uh, here today and uh, and I'm hoping that uh, some some connections will be made here today, and we know that the city is continuing, uh, is very much committed um, along this, through, as is, of course, the university. So with that, I just have a few things uh, to tell you. Um, that lunch is served, um, that Red Tree Catering is uh, doing the food here today. Um, I'd like to also say uh, that there are vegetarian and gluten-free options available for, for people. Um, in addition to that, there are posters out in the atrium, and, and really, um, we're giving you enough time to have a look at those posters, take in, so there's a whole other, whole other, other layer of uh, information uh, that's available out in the atrium on those posters. And if you look on, uh, there is a ballot, actually, uh, and I'm told on the back of your name uh, badge um, that you can fill that out. Please drop the ballot off at the registration desk by 1.30, and you're going to vote on who is the uh, winner in regards to the posters that are out there. Um, and if you don't have that, uh, then just go to the registration desk, and I'm sure they can arrange a, a ballot for you. So there's a whole uh, competition going on through the lunchtime. Um, I would then say that the panel uh, presentations will begin promptly at 1.30. And also know that you're going to hear from our uh, keynotes again in the sense that they are going to be in the, the crowd uh, and going to be posing some questions uh, to our panel. The panel is composed of, of Bev Sandalak, a faculty member, uh, at the uh, Faculty of Environmental Design does a lot of work on walkable communities and healthy communities and will be one of our panelists. David Down, of course, who you've met uh, as the senior architect and urban designer, so you're going to be wearing that hat on the, the panel. And uh, Doug Layton. Now, this is a very important addition to our panel because Doug is the vice president of planning and sustainability for Brookfield, one of the biggest uh, development companies um, in certainly in Canada, North America. I'm not too sure whether in the world, but um, <laughs> uh, big. And uh, so it's very important that we have the development industry's voice in, in all of this. And this is going to be led uh, very capably by Lance Robinson. And Lance is standing over there, and he's going to rally everyone at 1.30, and we'll be moderating that, that discussion. Following that at 2.30, we will have the debate. And uh, Rollin, we're, we're hoping. <laughs> um, he's on a plane, I believe. Uh, and uh, <laughs> talk about stress, um, is uh, going to arrive. And uh, I, I, I believe that the plane has landed. Has it landed? Um, uh, and Rollin will be here, um, as will uh, David Gray and uh, Joe Arvai. So have a lovely lunch. Have a look at the posters. And uh, we'll see you at 1.30. When you bring together a world-class academic, an innovative architect, 
and a socially conscious developer. Three's company. Or a panel discussion exploring dimensions of health and wellness in the built environment. Today we have a bit, our setup goes as follows. We'll have three presentations from our panelists, followed by some questions from this morning's keynotes, and then questions from the audience. We really would like to get input from you. So after the questions from the keynotes, throw your hands up and we'll get a mic to you and we'll get a lively and engaging conversation going. So, our first panelist is Dr. Beverly Sandilek, Associate Dean, Environmental Design Planning, Interim Director of the EVDS PhD Program and Research Leader of the EVDS Urban Lab, Faculty of Environmental Design, University of Calgary. Please welcome Bev Sandilek. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here, and I, I've uh, titled my talk Morphology is Destiny, because it seems that the morphology or the form of the urban environment that we're talking about has so many influences on the quality of life and the quality of urban form. I'm not quite sure. Middle one? There we go, okay. I'm going to base a lot of what I'm talking about uh, in these 10 or 12 minutes on three projects uh, that we've been working on. One is called Echo Euphoria, and that was looking at economic implications of improving urban form to increase physical activity. The second one was about social connectivity and urban form. And the third one is a large project that we did called the Calgary Project that's about all kinds of aspects of, of Calgary's urban form. And all of these were done in the urban lab with uh, colleagues, many of whom are in, in the audience now. We often talk about walking as uh, sort of the benchmark for urban form. You know, it's the easiest way to get around. Uh, a lot of people think it's the silver bullet to health and wellness. But um, as a, a, an article in the most recent Atlantic Cities um, journal uh, was showing, it's not that simple. There are a lot of other factors involved in making us happy and healthy. So just finding a place to play, finding a place to sit, finding a little bit of respite in the natural environment. Those are just as important as being able to walk. So the urban environment that we live in has evolved a lot over the last, especially the last 50 or 60 years. This little series of paintings uh, shows a, a, probably a fictional place about how people locate in an area because of the natural environment and the sense of place. And then over time, certain kinds of processes and factors start to make it not as attractive. And some of those factors that we can notice are the change in the grain and scale of development. So going from a, a small main street kind of commercial area where you can walk to, to something that's highly auto dependent and not all that pleasant to be in. Um, even churches, neighborhood churches going to a real big box model. This uh, city center uh, uh, church, or center street church, can't remember the name, sorry, but surrounded by parking lots is a totally different model. We've had a net increase in the amount of open space in neighborhoods, but a decrease in the kinds of open space. So if you're a young kid playing soccer, your needs are met really well. But if you're someone else, maybe not so much. Street standards have changed too. And this is pretty dramatic. This has taken uh, just facing two different directions in the town of Vulcan. This is the only non-Calgary slide I've got. But seeing what was happening pre-1960s with street trees and sidewalks, and then the street standards just change. The sidewalks don't even match up, and we get rid of things like street trees. So all of this is really the emphasis of the private realm at the expense of the public realm. And that's the kind of environment that can really support a kind of quality of life and way of life that we might be talking about. So we got interested in this and did a, a study of the evolution of Calgary neighborhoods. And we found that the different neighborhood types corresponded to various eras in city building. And Calgary is an interesting city to study. It's really simple, kind of concentric rings out from the center. So the downtown grid being the oldest and then different types working your way outward. And we'll look at those in a little more detail. And oftentimes when we talk about walkability, we're concentrating on neighborhoods, but it's also the downtown that's so vital. Uh, these are beautiful slides, right? You know, we've got Barclay Mall, Stephen Avenue, uh, the River Path system, that wonderful LA of, of trees outside of uh, City Hall that we all like to point to. And that looks really great. But with the good also comes the bad and the ugly. And too much of the downtown is inhospitable, uh, pretty banal, not the kind of environment that would support that quality of life that we're looking for. 
So my contention here is that public space that builds on landscape, those strong landscape elements, does a lot more for well-being of residents than, than big projects. So it's not all that hard. So Calgary has uh, this amazing resource of the river path system along the bow and the elbow. We've got a few high quality good streets that a lot of streetscaping attention has been put into. What would happen if more of those streets become high quality streets? And so you can walk right across the downtown and you won't run into those bleak areas. Or what happens if the whole thing, if the whole city is like that? Just dreams, I guess, right now. And I know that the, Dave's probably going to be talking about some of the city plans. But back to neighborhoods, uh, three basic types of uh, neighborhood form uh, that have different uh, street patterns, different block patterns, and different uh, qualities. So the inner city grid, that's the one uh, that has the separated sidewalks, street trees, really walkable grid. Post-war uh, warped grid is starting to have a few more crescents and cul-de-sacs. And then by the time you get to the 1980s, most neighborhoods, with very, very few exceptions, have that hierarchical street pattern uh, that, um, and maybe one sidewalk if you're lucky, and, and uh, maybe some street trees, but not likely. So we mar map the walk sheds. How far can you walk within a prescribed amount of, of uh, time or distance? And there was a real difference in these three neighborhood types. So Hillhurst, being a representative of this inner city grid, has a pretty healthy uh, walk shed. It would correspond roughly to what you would get from walk score, which is that radius, crow flies radius, that isn't terribly accurate. Um, Post-World War II, uh, slightly smaller walk sheds, and by the time you get to the 1980s, drastically reduced walk shed sizes. And then in mapping those, uh, back to this uh, city plan, you can see that the darker um, polygons are the older areas, and they have the largest walk sheds, and then they become uh, decreasing as you move out. Different way of looking at it, uh, this top uh, series of, of diagrams shows that the clusters of watershed types in grids are a lot larger, you know, somewhere up into the four and five uh, square kilometers, and curvilinear a lot less. And the bottom chart, uh, the bottom line, I guess, is that the curvilinear have about half the size of the watershed of grid, and that's pretty dramatic. We also looked at the qualities of that walk shed because it's no good to have some uh, a, a large, large area you can walk to if there's nowhere where to walk to, if it isn't pleasant. So this was the best summer job I think that these students ever had where they ri rode their bikes and walked along around every uh, neighborhood in Calgary at the time. There were 230 of them and scored every neighborhood according to a number of different metrics. So mix of uses, um, visual interest, presence of street trees, presence of sidewalks, and so on, you know, from the worst uh, to the best. And we mapped that as well. And we found the same kind of map, that the higher quality neighborhoods, the dark red, were found in the inner city grid. And then as you worked your way out, it became poorer in quality. And that seemed pretty astounding uh, to us, since I think everybody would acknowledge that we're one of the richest cities in the richest province in one of the richest countries in the world. These are not third world problems that we're dealing with. This is basic stuff and we're not able to do it well yet. So we also started to calculate the cost. What would it, what would it cost to improve those neighborhoods? So we redesigned everything, provided sidewalks, provided street trees, uh, changed the block uh, structure so that it was shorter blocks. And the grid, average cost of retrofitting this neighborhood is about 26 million bucks. Uh, for the warp grid, uh, about $67,000. And curvilinear, if you wanted to retrofit it to the gold standard of walkability, be about $115 million per neighborhood, which is a lot of money. And most of the, the uh, cost is in changing block patterns, so reducing the distance that people have to go before they turn a corner. So the bottom line, it costs a lot of money to fix, so do it right the first time. Um, the other thing that we, we looked at uh, was social connectivity. Uh, the city of Calgary was interested in knowing what the degree of social connectivity was with different neighborhood types, because we were really recognizing that the private realm was being favored in, in favor, or sorry, the private realm was being favored over the public realm. 
So uh, we looked at different neighborhoods. Uh, we had a whole uh, lot of methods that we were, we were um, looking at. Um, and we noticed that the population age breakdown with neighborhood type was pretty different as you go from the older neighborhoods to the newer ones with lots of families and young kids in the curvilinear. So there's that life cycle uh, because everybody is, uh, is aging um, and so these neighborhoods will go through turnovers. And we were interested in the different things that would support social connectivity. So schools that don't have any kind of public face onto the street, uh, swimming pools and libraries that are disappearing from middle ring neighborhoods especially. And for teenage kids, where do you hang out? Where do you, where do you gather? And as I said, 100% of the population is aging. So this affects all of us. We will all go through that transition and we need a kind of neighborhood form that's going to support our different uh, patterns as we, as we age. Well, after all of that, we found that there, there really wasn't any big punchline. Um, Calgary, wherever you are, it's fairly well socially connected. So all of those dots, uh, they're hovering around the you know, 10 or 11 mark, which is fairly socially connected, even though in this uh, sh chart I'm sh showing you here, the density was quite different between the curvilinear and grid. So what we found is that we can't really conclusively prove neighborhood form and its connection to social connectivity, with the exception if you've got a kid or if you've got a dog. Um, and a lot of the posters outside will, will prove this too, that if you've got a kid or a dog, you're getting a lot of social c connectivity and you're also meeting a lot of people and getting some exercise in the meantime. So the form of our cities um, affects our quality of life and way of life in so many profound ways. Um, I think it's exciting that conferences like this that show a convergence of public health and urban design and also this convergence of uh, the development industry, the city and uh, the academy that 15 years ago when I came back to Calgary, you never would have found the three of us on, on a, a stage and we're probably going to agree with each other more than, more than we, uh, we disagree. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it with a, a question. Why? Why, when our mayor and council, for the most part, uh, seem to agree with the direction that we want to go? Why, when city administration, for the most part, seems to agree with that, the direction we want to go? And why, with so many developers coming along who are providing some innovative uh, ways of building neighborhoods, do we not do it yet? So I'm hoping that uh, possibly the other panelists and questions will, will get to some of these answers. Thank you. Thank you, Bev. And keep your questions for the end. We definitely would like to hear from you. Next, we have David Down, Senior Architect, Urban Design Coordinator, Urban Design and Heritage, City of Calgary. David. Thanks, Lance. And uh, thanks, Bev. Always a hard act to follow. I think she sets a very high standard for us. And I have to say that uh, the work that Bev does uh, and all of EVDS does is a tremendous resource for the City of Calgary. We really, really do appreciate uh, and perhaps don't utilize that resource as often as, as much as we should. And we, we really have to do more of that. And that's what events like this are all about. So in answer to your question, all in good time. <laughs> but people don't like to hear that. They want it now. Sorry, I'm just going to adjust this. So as mentioned, uh, Senior Architect, Urban Designer, City of Calgary, and I am fortunate today to represent the municipal government side of the equation. Um, and as I think I mentioned before, and so doing, I'm representing the work of a huge number of, of professionals with a huge variety of expertise. It may seem at times that down at City Hall that we're not all pulling in the same direction, but in fact, we are all working towards and required to work towards a single objective or perhaps a set of objectives that um, is our combined uh, Calgary Municipal Development Plan and Calgary Transportation Plan. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking to you about that today. It's just, oops. oh, we've got some animation. There you go, keep you awake. I'll start with a bit of an apology because I saw Rollin, and Rollin is always telling us, keep your PowerPoint slides to the minimal number, number of words. People don't have long attention spans, but 
many of you are academics. You're all <laughs> learned people. You have long attention spans. So I, I broke that cardinal rule about minimal words and maximum images per slide, although I got lots of nice images. At least in the beginning of this presentation, there will be a lot of words, but in this case, the words are critical. They're all words from our municipal development plan that I'm going to be talking to you about today to kind of set the stage for the city. Because that municipal development plan and Calgary Transportation Plan provide the fundamental direction for all the work that we do at City Hall. It's approved by council. It was the result of extensive engagement with the public and intense discussion with industry. The result re represents the collective will of a large number of Calgarians. Maybe not all, but a large number. And it's not just council and it's not just planners, it's not just transportation planners that dreamed this stuff up. It's, and you've all heard about Imagine Calgary and the number of people that were involved in that and the subsequent planet process. There's a lot of people that were involved in coming up with this plan. So in my mind, it's a form of contract between City Hall and the public. But at the very least, it represent a, represents a shared set of aspirations. So like any contract, you have to read the words. So I'm going to ask you to read some of these words as we go through this. But let's just start with the seven MDP goals. Prosperous economy, compact city, great communities, good urban design, connecting to the city, greening the city, and perhaps most importantly of all, managing growth and change. When I started to look at this and think, well, which of these has anything to do with building healthier communities or providing healthier lifestyle choices, it became quite obvious that all of them do. And so I'm going to just skip through a number of these. And if I can make it work, there we go. Compact city, that's a pretty obvious one. Direct future growth of the city in a way that fosters a more compact, efficient use of land, creates complete communities, allows for greater mobility choices, and enhances the vitality and character in local neighborhoods. It's all about density of uses, not just density of housing, but density of uses. And we're not talking about completely densifying all of our single family neighborhoods. We know that people will still use automobiles. We know that there will still be single family neighborhoods, but we're talking about building them in a way that they're connected, that uh, you have uh, mobility choices. You can walk between things. And we've heard this many times already today, the park once idea. Um, you can walk between communities. Everything's connected. Everything's pedestrian oriented. Everything's transit supportive. Everything's cycle supportive. So the more compact the city, the more these things are possible. Sorry, this is taking a bit of work to change. Creating great communities by maintaining quality living and working environments, improving housing diversity and choice. And, and we've heard about that as well. Housing diversity is going to be a huge issue for us. We'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, respecting and enhancing neighborhood character uh, and vitality, that comes into the whole heritage argument as well. That's not just physical health, that's mental health. We all want attractive places to live. We all, all want attractive places to walk. Our heritage resources and our cultural landscapes, our heritage landscapes are all part of that. And you see the big trees that we're losing as we redevelop uh, established neighborhoods is a bit of a bugbear of mine. Good urban design, of course, I'll talk about this probably more than anything else. It's just my particular area of interest. But again, that goes not just to physical health and walkability. It goes to mental health uh, as well. Walkability is so important for us because I think if we're going to imagine a more compact city, we have to start with uh, <coughs> sorry, our established neighborhoods and connecting our established neighborhoods and making people want to get out of their cars and, and want to walk. So promote site and building design that contributes to high quality living environments and attractive, walkable, diverse neighborhoods and communities. And again, this comes back to so much of what Bev was talking about and we are working towards, not just in the design of new communities, which I'm going to let Doug talk about, but uh, um, in how we uh, reimagine some of our existing communities as well. Connecting the city, this is really important, our, our um, transportation and public realm hierarchy, our mobility triangle, which now factors in all, many of our documents and uh, uh, Joe Olson and many other transportation planners are here as well and uh, they treat this triangle also with great respect at the highest level of importance are pedestrians, then cycles, then public transit, all the way down to the single occupancy vehicles and uh, this is a goal that we're working towards um, Again, not always a popular choice in everybody's mind, but uh, 
an idea that is firmly implanted in our work and we're hoping we we're able to firmly implant it or implant it more firmly in the minds of the public as we work towards achieving it. But these things take time. I'm clicking. OK. So uh, Joe Olson is here and, and uh, his comrades. Um, Complete Streets is a fantastic document that is, is now uh, at completion, which talks about creating a palette of street types which encourage a variety of mobility types. Um, Im improve pedestrian realm, include cycle realm, at the same time dealing with uh, automobile uh, and transit issues as well, standardizing the way we apply these and uh, um, inventing new types where new types are needed to deal with uh, some of these issues. Corridor program, uh, this is in its infancy, but this is an action item directly out of the municipal development plan which talks about uh, as part of a more compact city, redeveloping, intensifying along um, transportation corridors and at transportation nodes. And this is not at all an easy task when these transportation corridors are through existing established neighborhoods. So we're embarking on a very large multi-year program to imagine the land use impacts, the transportation impacts, the incentive ideas about how to encourage these types of development and these are the places where we'll get mixed use, where we'll get uh, housing choice, and we'll get more diversity within the established neighborhoods and within the already built up parts of the city. These little pauses are just for you to think about what I'm saying, maybe. <laughs> um, complete communities, housing diversification. This slide, these, these graphics, are really just about um, uh, older adult housing, in fact, because our aging population is going to demand a different type of housing in the future. And the darker tones on these maps uh, just indicate the higher density of over 75 population, that the change between 2009 and 2039. If you look at the smaller dots on there, if you can see them, that's where the seniors related housing facilities are located. And you can see that currently they're not located particularly where those larger densities of seniors are going to be. So I thought that that was a pretty dramatic indication of how our population is going to be changing. That's if all of these seniors remained in those neighborhoods. But housing diversification is key to a lot of the policies and incentives that we're, we're working on. Cycling strategy, uh, lots of cycling in the news uh, because of the center city cycle track discussions and how that may or may not impact automobile traffic. Uh, if you're going to have a citywide cycling strategy, if you're going to encourage people to get out of their cars, those that want to choose that, if you're going to encourage them to drive to work, you've got to get them safely and comfortably into your downtown core. And that is the most difficult challenge now, is people don't want to cycle in the downtown core. Many people don't. So a cycle track network through the center city that gets people to and from the core was seen as a high priority, and council is debating that. You can see the, the difference in the 7th Avenue um, landscape with the addition of the cycle track, and that cycle track has been piloted, completed, and is very successful. So you'll see a lot of public discussion about the value of giving a very small percentage of your road space to cycles. Um, that percentage of road space is kind of equivalent to the percentage of cyclists using it. It's, it's, uh, it's not a huge bite out of the automobile space, but um, as you know, in Calgary, that's something that's uh, very controversial if you impact either automobile space or parking, driving or parking at all. So look forward to more discussion, but really it's the right thing to do. A few, a few um, policy pieces about creating a more walkable and more attractive and more accessible city. This is uh, Downtown Underpass Urban Design Guidelines. If we're going to get people living in high density in the Beltline and not driving to work, which some of them do, um, drive downtown, we have to make it comfortable for them to walk. And fear of walking through our dark and scary underpasses is what prevents a lot of people from walking those very short distances. So we have a program in place to improve the walkability, to improve the, the comfort, brightness, and attractiveness of all of the um, underpasses which go underneath the railway tracks. And um, that will be un un out unfolding, unfolding, rolling out over the next few years, beginning with the first street underpass rehabilitation, which
will be under construction soon. And that's probably the darkest, wettest, worst of them all, tightest of them all. And so we went there first, and uh, there's a very interesting um, architectural solution to that. And we're including cycling uh, facilities in these rehabilitations as well. Um, Bev talked about why can't we make all of the streets downtown more walkable? And we do have a program in place to certainly improve the public realm downtown um, over time, particularly those corridors, the north-south corridors that connect the higher density housing areas in the Beltline with the river and downtown. So 8th Street Corridor is the first of those and the design is now um, being completed for that uh, pedestrian and cycle realm upgrade and it includes uh, a railway underpass as well. And other pieces about, uh, this is the 13th Avenue Greenway, which is just about encouraging people to walk, cycle, skateboard, at a more recreational level through a dense part of the, the city or a part of the city that's seen to be dense if it builds out to the projected density. So it's the city going in and providing a little bit of green infrastructure in an area that's going to take a lot of population. Um, new parks, of course, very important. Other public spaces, an important part of, of uh, the municipal development plan. And uh, as we've already heard, an important part of densifying a city is including nature and access to nature. And on the right-hand side of that slide is, is just a few of some of those new parks and pedestrian spaces that are being built in the denser part of the city as well. A large commercial urban design guideline. So we can't do everything in the center of the city, even though that's where the bulk of the high density is going. We really have to look at our suburban areas as well. And our large commercial sites are seen as um, um, perhaps not developed to the intensity they could be developed. But that really wasn't the, the biggest problem that we had to deal with on them. Is we saw them as disconnected from community, and the uh, image on the top of the slide uh, indicates that, disconnected from their adjacent communities uh, and difficult to walk within. So again, we heard Joyce talk about Park Once, um, and Lotar's here, Lotar, Lotar has headed up this project where we developed a set of urban design guidelines that would encourage the development community to see their large commercial sites as pedestrian friendly, um, as more Main Street oriented, and as places where people didn't have to get in their car to get from the home sense to the Walmart. They could actually walk comfortably. There'd be some public spaces, some smaller, some smaller uses um, as well. This applies not just to new large commercial sites, but the redevelopment of existing commercial sites, which because there, some of them are Many of them are now surrounded by higher intensity, higher density uses. They're seen, seen as uh, huge opportunities for intensification. And so we've talked to a number of uh, developers and property owners about the redevelopment of these sites to be more pedestrian oriented, to be more connected to their communities, uh, and to be more attractive overall. Uh, a spectacular example is the Brentwood Station Plan. There's a, a shopping mall built probably originally started in the 50s but it's on a major transportation corridor it's on the train it's beside the university it's beside uh, the university research park so there's an employment source there as well a huge opportunity and through much public discussion a high intensity node has been created there and is under construction and of course the sales of the condo units were spectacularly fast because everybody saw the benefit in, being, in, in owning a unit that is so close to all of those amenities. So the municipal development plan envisions maybe not this intensity or density at every activity center or transportation node, but this as an example of what could happen uh, with many of them in the future. More about just the idea of being more comfortable in the city and illumination guideline. Uh, which the urban design team worked on as well. And this is just about the fact that we are a dark place for much of the year. We have long, dark, cold nights. And whatever we can do to keep people outdoors, uh, lighting is a big part of that. And we didn't have any kind of guidance for our development industry or for our city projects on how we might use light to enliven the night environment. And so this illumination guideline provides that. And we did talk about nature in the city as well. I didn't actually include it in here, but we created a bird-friendly guideline as well because um, avian uh, fatalities are a big problem in urban areas and it ties into building illumination. So we have a guideline on how to protect migratory birds in the city, a 
as well, because we are also on major north-south North American migratory route. And there's an example of the illumination guideline at work, also an example of, of using illumination to highlight a heritage resource in the city. And this is, these are low energy LED fixtures. It's a much more efficient source of lighting, but really highlights a huge historic resource and makes it a pleasure, more of a pleasure, to cross that and enjoy it from afar. So this is only a piece of the many, many aspects of the municipal development plan that we have to deal with. And it's only a, a small sample of the projects that are ongoing throughout the city in the various departments to help to realize the expectations of the municipal development plan. And I guess I would segue to Doug Layton because it's really his job to respond to those expectations from a private development point of view. And uh, a lot of what we do is kind of negotiating the best solution based on what our expectations are and what's appropriate to market expectations as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Next, we have Doug Layton, Vice President, Planning and Sustainability at Brookfield Residential. Doug? Thank you very much, and uh, fantastic to see such a, a, a full crowd. This is a, it's obviously a topical subject. I know Alberta Health Services organized a similar conference in February, and the Urban Land Institute had a similar conference in Los Angeles about a month ago to one of my colleagues attended. Um, I wanted to say thank you to the organizers for including me. I think, however, you've made a really terrible mistake because actually we, you should have panel members who disagree vehemently. <laughs> and all three of us share a, a real passion for urban design. And uh, I know uh, I expect some difficult questions from the audience, but uh, we are all, I think, pretty aligned in terms of seeing that as the way forward to this link between health and the built environment. Um, first of all, if I can find the uh, remote here. Um, Winston Churchill once said, First, we shape the buildings, and then the buildings shape us. And I think that's true of cities as well. Um, just some other uh, quotes, and I think it's always important in the debate to see, first of all, if you agree on the terminology. And so I think you can see from these two that there is no debate. Uh, the top one, of course, is from a very well-respected uh, medical institution in the States. The bottom one is from the Urban Land Institute, which is a long-established uh, voice for the development industry across North America. I think there are 36,000 members, and a new chapter here in Calgary, which is making its, this its priority as well this year. So uh, I don't think there's disagreement at that level. That's always nice. I'm going to continue on my positive tone here, because I think in Calgary, and as Canadians, we have a bit of an inferiority complex. We like to slag ourselves off and think that we're not as good as Vancouver or the States or other places. And uh, these, are, these are direct rankings from internationally respected uh, places, so we're, we are and I'm not saying we're not, we can't do better. We, we should and we must. But we are generally a pretty healthy country. Uh, Mercer, and you can quibble over their methodology, said we are the top eco city. We're the cleanest city. We're the number fifth most livable city from The Economist. Uh, number three, healthiest Canadian city. And number two, uh, in active lifestyle after Vancouver. And uh, number 10, the most walkable Canadian city. And I was very pleased to see on your map of walkability that alone among the 1980 subdivisions, our Mackenzie town had a red dot. So thank you for that, Bev. <laughs> um, I think it's also important to remind ourselves that uh, much as I'm, we're all passionate about urban design and we like to think it's the most important thing in the world, it is not the only determinant of public health. And there are many, many other factors. So before we put all of our effort into improving the built environment. There are other areas, the software, that are equally, if not greater, of greater importance. And we're very, very lucky in Calgary to have a wonderful health system. Um, so I'm just, I, I'm not putting that into to excuse or deflect debate from the built environment, but I just think it's worth remembering that. If we, what we do is the hardware, then the software is of equal importance. Uh, if I can return to the Urban Land Institute, and it, it, I don't think it's any coincidence that this is their priority for the next two years as well. They've issued a number of publications. I think a new one came out today on this exactly this subject. But this is their, uh, their attempt to boil it into 10 basic principles for the land development industry. And I think if you looked at some of the points that David raised, a lot of these are already in our municipal development plan. So number one is uh, put people first, whether it's through walkability or 
places people want to live or quality of life. Uh, the second is that economic value, and, and don't forget these are aimed at the development industry. Uh, walkability is profitability. Uh, we'd be crazy to create places that were not walkable. Uh, empower champions for health, and uh, you know we're, we are reaching out to our uh, health providers. We're, we're in dialogue right now with Alberta Health Services, and I would encourage, uh, encourage that dialogue. I'd love to talk to anyone afterwards on this. Uh, we have a relationship with, in fact, of Environmental Design, uh, of which I'm an alumni, I'm proud to say. Uh, we're, we're helping sponsor a, a studio led by Dr. Greg Morrow on exactly this subject. So it's something that's, uh, that we're very keen on, and I think we have some, we have some passionate, uh, energetic people in this city that we need to support. Uh, energizing shared spaces, so it's not enough to create a plaza or a park without the program or activities or the design to make them work. And again, David provided some fantastic examples of energizing uh, fairly bleak places like the First Street underpass. That's a fantastic victory. I look forward to seeing that. Uh, making healthy choices easy. I mean, how many buildings in Calgary, uh, you, go the, you take the elevator. There, you can't find the stair or the stairs locked. Uh, the people who designed our new building very cleverly put giant stairs in the front. No one takes the elevator. And uh, so we need to make those choices healthy, whether it's the scale of the building, the entire neighborhood or the city. Uh, ensuring equitable access, and I think this deals with issues of affordability, exclusion, social exclusion or inclusion and so on. Uh, in Calgary, we, again, we, maybe the flip side of our inferiority is we can sometimes be a bit smug and we don't see that n not everyone is sharing in the, uh, the wealth and the quality of life that many of us enjoy. So that is, uh, is incredibly important and we need to keep reminding ourselves of that. Uh, mixing it up, no disagreement. Uh, we have our, our company is lucky enough to have an infill division led by Jaden Tate. We have a commercial division led by Warren Polson. We don't build just houses. We very much believe in building communities which have places to shop, work, play, so on. Uh, so you won't find much disagreement within the industry on that. Uh, embracing unique character. I think we've been guilty in the past in uh, Calgary of picking names like Chaparral or Silverado or I'm, I'm picking on some. But we do need to go back to what Calgary is about and authenticity and I think that's very important. And build on, again, uh, this sort of ersatz character of copying other places. Uh, we have a unique climate, we have a unique character, history, and geography. And uh, so, I, uh, you know, I'm very pleased to say, for example, in our newest area in the north, we've called it Livingston after Sam Livingston, and we're working very hard on placemaking that tries to reflect what Calgary is about. Promoting access to healthy food, and I think uh, this is important, but I do, I do think the fact that this is an urban land institute based in the States, there are a lot of American cities which have true food deserts. There are no grocery stores at all in the inner city or downtown areas. We're lucky. Uh, we do have uh, you know, good access to food here. We live in a harsh climate, so I love to go to the farmer's market. I, I encourage more of them. Um, so yes, we do need access to healthy food. It's important, but it, I don't think it's a sphere here as it perhaps is in other cities. And lastly, make it active. Calgarians are very active, and I will compare our pathway system, linear meters of path with Vancouver any day, having lived in both cities. We are very, very lucky and we need to keep that up. The city of Calgary deserves huge credit for its recreation centers and, and not again, the, not just the buildings, but the programming. We are uh, indeed fortunate. Uh, at the risk of seeming self-serving, I think, you know, we have a lot, we tend to look elsewhere for success stories and maybe it's time for Calgary to actually try and create some success stories of its own. So uh, we were lucky when we developed Mackenzie Town and getting a lot of attention for Calgary. It was groundbreaking for a project 25 years ago. Uh, I think Garrison Woods has done the same, Quarry Park. We don't have a lot of good examples. And why don't we look at creating, not just copying someone else, but doing our own uh, flagship healthy community? So we have an example in South Seton, uh, and we have a number of partners in the surrounding area. Uh, uh, Rob Olorenshaw in Section 23, one of the most progressive developers in Calgary, is one of our partners in the surrounding area, other landowners. We have a billion, I don't know the exact figure, billion dollar plus uh, health facility, which is absolutely astounding for those who haven't seen it. Uh, and effectively, the city has designated this as the downtown, mini downtown for the south area. Could we build on that? Uh, we have this is already, this is infrastructure in the ground. Uh, a week ago, we had the Tri-Services building opened by the City of Calgary. There is a, a, 
a public high school, a major public high school, I believe it's at the working drawing stage, a major re regional recreation center by the city of Calgary, uh, a regional park. Uh, we're working right now with a separate school board to FOSS and the city to create a, uh, a new a separate high school as well. Uh, and again, I come back to the South Health Campus. So that's the kind of the obvious health and wellness stuff. But what about the walkability, the interconnected parks, and, and some of the other ideas? And I'm looking forward to seeing the results of uh, Dr. Greg Morrow's studio next week uh, in terms of what the students come up with. Uh, I think as well we're a city of formulas, and a lot they say that uh, don't repeat the process of last year if you expect a different result. And uh, we have formulas, I'm talking the industry as well as the city of Calgary. Sometimes when you overlap those formulae, you end up with perverse results. And if you've seen the movie Radiant City, you'll, you'll know what some of those results can be. So the engineering department has its manual, the transportation department, the parks department, the planning department, the water resources, and we have our formula. So, um, you know, I think that uh, we need to break that mold. We need to foster creativity, not conformity. Right now, it's far too easy to follow those formulas and you end up with a standard result. So. I, I, like, um, I like the approach that Roland Stanley, uh, the new, uh, not so new, um, planning director is brought to the city of being based on outcomes and performance rather than rules and regulation. I think that's the way forward. And being an urban, a passion about urban design, I think that is the urban design first and the planning second. So I'm gonna return uh, just to close off in terms of asking whether this ULI checklist might not be maybe we couldn't combine this with the, the principles of the municipal development plan as our checklist of what makes a healthy project or healthy community or neighborhood from one that's less healthy. So in conclusion, I guess uh, I'd like to, I started uh, emphasizing the positive. I think we're off to a very good start in Calgary. We at least agree on what the problem is. We have laid a fantastic foundation. We need to do better, absolutely. Uh, Thirdly, I think a lot of you are either in the academic world or medical world, uh, and I think we, the industry and the city, need more research. Um, very impressed by the work I saw in the hallway here. And so we need metrics to, uh, to measure what's successful, what's not, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong. Otherwise, how do we learn? Um, collaboration is the key to success. You know, we enjoy working with uh, other landowners, we enjoy working with the university, we enjoy working with Alberta Health Services and other groups and uh, with the city of Calgary and EVDS in particular. So uh, if we're gonna, let's get our act together and let's, uh, if I can postulate my response to Bev's question why, I think it's about alignment. I think there's a lack of alignment, a lack of dialogue and hopefully today is the beginning of that. So we're all in this together and uh, I look forward to a lively discussion and debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doug. Now we'd like to go to our keynotes from this morning, uh, David, Louise, and Joyce. If you guys would like to ask a question to the group or an individual panelist, we'll go from there and then we'll go into the large audience. So uh, by process of random selection, Joyce. to me that um, I had been speaking with David Down earlier and he was talking about the fact that the city is um, trying to put in place a charter for the city. An excellent idea. Um, there are not many cities in Canada that actually have charters that allow them to be more autonomous and put the kind of policy in place that, that David was showing up on the screen and would give it a lot more teeth. Um, I just really like to open up the question to all three of you to comment on the charter and what it would mean to, for instance, Bev, um, you taking forward a lot of the, um, the recommendations you were making around walkability. David, you talking about um, how you might see this helping you to, to really advance what you were showing us in terms of the municipal plan. And Doug, um, really, how could it, uh, what your advice might be to the city in, in putting a charter together and, and, and facilitating the kind of development you're talking about for developers? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a charter would be a fantastic idea in breaking down some of those um, barriers, I think, that, that both Doug and, and Dave were talking about, uh, that we've had 
individual departments having their own uh, guidelines, their own uh, policies that um, haven't really served us well. So something that's performance-based rather than regulation-based is a lot more uh, positive. I mean, we sometimes forget that these regulations aren't things that were um, handed down to Moses, you know, written on, on tablets. They can be changed. They're made by humans and our values have changed and they really need to accommodate where we're, where we're going. So if a charter can start to further that, you know, I'm, I think that would be a positive thing. Doug? Uh, I'm going to be the devil's advocate, having uh, lived in Vancouver and other cities and seeing the fragmentation in British Columbia. I don't think Calgary is big enough for a charter yet. I know uh, in my former life in the public sector that uh, Alberta municipalities were given natural people powers in 1995. It gives a huge power, uh, and those powers have not been fully exercised. Uh, so uh, some, some frustrations for our industry, for example, in British Columbia, you can build six-story wood frame. I fail to understand why that's not being allowed in Alberta and, and in Calgary. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know that a civic charter is going to help it. And as we've seen by the, uh, the rise of Rob Ford and others in Toronto, is giving more power to, uh, to uh, local government necessarily a good idea? I think that checks and balances are needed. <laughs> David. Uh, I am certainly not the expert in, in uh, the overall impacts of the Charter, and that discussion is being held in Alberta at the highest pol political levels in Edmonton. We don't know what the outcome will be. But certainly, some of the freedoms that we see in a city like Vancouver are attractive to us, and we, um, we look, a, look at Vancouver's ability to require a certain level of sustainability or require a certain level of affordable housing. And we don't have those freedoms in our Municipal Government Act to allow us to do that. So we have to find other ways, incentives, density bonusing to do that. Um, I think if a charter or some kind of hybrid agreement, cities agreement, could allow us some of those civic um, opportunities to occur, then that would be a good thing. Um, can't argue with the Rob Ford issue. <laughs> <laughs> Louise? Uh, very simple question and, and, and quite obvious uh, given my talk. How do you make sure in all these projects that the voice of the people and those who are talking for the people, except you of course, uh, are heard and taken into account in all, in all those projects? Uh, the City of Calgary has a very progressive engaged policy, which is spectrum uh, based on the International Association of Public Practitioners, goes from sort of informed to full collaboration. And I think they, it's, it's a good system. They select what, what's the appropriate uh, point in that spectrum for each project. Uh, could we do better? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think that that group is understaffed. I'd like to see more rigor, and I'd like to see that built into more projects. And I would say that um, echo what Doug has already said. I think through our um, transforming planning process, there are some new steps in our engagement uh, with community, with institutions, uh, with industry that will be um, taken with more rigor and uh, followed with more rigor in the future because we see the advantages of that. I think that there is a high expectation for particularly community expectation from our councillors and from our planning commission. So our feet are often held to the fire on the quality of our engagement. So we are trying very hard. Could it be better? Probably. Well, how often have you heard uh, someone say, well, why do you build neighborhoods that way? And, and the answer is, well, that's what the people want, right? Have you heard that? And we're just giving people what they want. I don't think that's true, and I don't think that the right questions are being asked. And with the exception of places like Seton that are definitely much more forward-looking, you know, we just see more of the same. And I'm sh no one's ever asked me what I want. Has anyone ever asked you what you want? <laughs> Have you had an opportunity to, to say that? So I think how we translate that into the true public engagement or true public opinion could be really transformative. Doug wants to ask you. Well, strangely, the other, the other issue, of course, is intensification of existing neighborhoods. And uh, we've had a number of projects blocked recently uh, in total alignment with what the city and, uh, wishes. It meets all the, the, the tick boxes of municipal development plan. But we have set up an engagement process here, which which does give, uh, give the edge up for, for groups that want to stop development, even if they meet all the city objectives. So it's a double-edged sword. I would also add that uh, 
it is a very difficult thing to achieve this complete level of engagement. And even though uh, with most of our processes we have a high level of community involvement, often the members of the community that get involved are the ones that are particularly interested and always get involved. And inevitably there are those in the community that didn't see the meeting notice or the 50 meeting notices and will come out after the fact and say, I never had any input, you never provided me with input. So we try very hard to avoid that, but it's, it's difficult to engage the public on some of these uh, planning and urban design issues. It's very uh, difficult. Maybe just a, yes. a, you might be interested. I, I, you know that in downtown Montreal, they're, they're building this gigantic hospital that is tearing down a whole neighborhood in it's right downtown, downtown. And uh, they, are, they have a whole division in that project to take into account and to build in the planning around this community development. So uh, it's when I first heard of it, when I, we met with those people, I mean, they were actively engaging and seeking with community and the voices of the community. I mean, that's the inner city and homeless and all that stuff. There. I, I would say one more thing too, mm -hmm. sorry Beth. Mm -hmm is we're seeing some new processes evolve that are community-led. Um, those of you that are familiar with the Boda Bluff process, really grassroots, and those are the ones that we find are really effective. The ones that the community themselves, they devise the process and they, they run the process. So um, I, we'd, we'd love to see more of that happening. Sorry, Just to follow up there, and, and, and the, the whole NIMBY question um, gets in, involved in, in this issue, right? So public education is probably one of the more important things because it's no sense having people engaged if all they're doing is protecting their individual interests. So to educate the public about the public good, the public realm, and how this is a city for all of us might just produce a slightly different, different result. David? Yes, I have a very narrow question for David, which has to be the light, the outdoor lighting in the, in the slide that you had looked like unshielded, non-dark sky compliant lighting. Do you have, are there standards for exterior lighting in Calgary? There are certainly, certainly uh, standards for exterior lighting. We have to be dark sky compliant. Uh, any kind of um, broad based lighting, parking lot lighting, et cetera, has to be full cutoff lighting, uh, no light spill. There has been some discussion uh, um, at council recently about how compliant we are. The um, experiential lighting, as we call it, is meant to be um, LED used in such a way that uh, it doesn't cause kind of dark sky issues. So uh, I think we would be, we will be uh, careful with that because there are a lot of people interested in both the dark sky issue and the um, avian fatality issue that I mentioned before, and how these can. Um, in fact, we're in most of these cases where these kinds of lighting are being used, the technology is so fantastic now. It's a, it's a much lower level of lighting, but it's achieving a much more um, even effect, and it's using a lot less energy. So it's, we're really taking advantage of, of new technologies to get better effect. Great. At this time, we'd like to open it up to the audience. So if anyone has a question, throw your hand up. Uh, stand up. Tell us what your question is. David, do you want to take this? Yes, I, um, I, I mentioned our transforming planning process. Um, there's a lot of attention paid to what we call the explore phase, which is really meant to discuss ideas at very initial stages, either with an applicant or with the community. And um, 
I, I would agree, you know, uh, in the Boda Bluff case, the outcome was excellent, but yes, the city might have been a little more involved in the beginning stages, although I think the city was a bit hands-off in that case because they didn't want to be the ones directing the process. So it's a difficult balance, and I think we'll learn from, from uh, cases like that and uh, work towards achieving that, that right balance. And every case is a little bit different, but certainly there is interest in um, um, exploring uh, issues at a very early stage so they don't become bigger issues later. Thank you for that input. And uh, if I could add, too, that uh, Doug mentioned the word alignment, and that is a huge corporate priority. And initiatives such as this help uh, departments and business units remain aligned or become aligned and remain aligned throughout a project's process. Doug? I think the, uh, the trend is to engage earlier uh, at the vision stage before the drawings are done and they're pinned on the wall say, what do you think? Uh, so we've been experimenting as a company with a, a number of new techniques. Uh, we're going to try a few more. Uh, for example, uh, with our co-landowners in the Rangeview Structure Plan, we sponsored a, what we call the Design Co-Opetition. We hands-off hired three firms, uh, gave them a brief as to what the land might become, and let them draw uh, their ideas. Uh, we then pin those up uh, over a weekend, unfortunately the biggest blizzard of the year, uh, and ask people, what, you know, which open space system do you think is the best of these? We didn't pick a winner, which open space is the best? And which one do you think captures the spirit of this, this area best? Uh, so that, you know, that's been carried forward to workshops with the city staff from all departments, and hopefully it will be reflected in the structure plan and, and outline plans. So it wasn't a perfect process. Uh, we'll try not to schedule it during a snowstorm next year. But I would like to, uh, we continue to try different ideas like that. Great. We have time for one more question. Um, you, stand, there's a microphone behind you too if you want to. Thank you. Um, so just a quick question for the whole panel, um, and it's actually building on the question that was just asked. So earlier, uh, Dr. Potvin, Potvin talked about um, the idea of people inventing um, local solutions and sort of drawing on locally available resources. So it's kind of taking the conversation about healthy communities a little bit broader than just built environment and urban design. But what do you guys see as being the role of community organizations and citizen groups in terms of, um, of developing those local solutions themselves and sort of empowering people to make that change locally and in collaboration with, um, you know, with researchers and, and developers in the city? I'm just curious what your perspective is on that. I'm going to start with you, Bev. <laughs> well, Calgary's an interesting city in, in that uh, I think the community associations are stronger here than any, anywhere I'm aware of, that people identify with their neighborhood first before their, their city. So that's something that's, I think, a tremendous asset. Um, things have changed, too, in the last 50 or 60 years, that it's no longer the so-called experts who are running the show, because uh, we've seen sometimes that that doesn't turn out all, all that well. So the more people can, can get a sense of uh, belonging in their neighborhood and know what makes for a happier, healthier, uh, quality of life and way of life, the more they can get involved in those processes. But again, I think it comes down to public education. So when community associations have planning boards and so on that are bringing in people to talk to them, let them know more about uh, the planning process and how to get involved and what the impacts are of different decisions, then I think public engagement and involvement by community associations can be a, a tremendously positive thing and develop a sense of, of place in a neighborhood that um, is, is you know, wonderful. 
Doug D. Oh, sorry. <laughs> After you, David. <laughs> this is a love-in. Um, I, I think the role of the community associations uh, is incredibly important, but they do struggle. We do have you know, successful community associations, but they do struggle, and they often come together around specific issues and then kind of drift apart when the issues are resolved or the issues go away. So the continuity uh, of interest in these associations is often uh, an issue, and um, the continuity of people that get involved in these associations. So um, there are some, some efforts that we're making to try to bring community associations around to more aligned positions. Uh, we have something called the Multi-Agency Task Force in Hillhurst Sunnyside, which is helping them uh, with city and landowner expertise to deal with some particularly difficult issues there. But we also have something called the Partners in Planning Program, which uh, brings planners, transportation planners, heritage planners into individual communities um, at period periodically to talk about uh, how they can have a role in the, the planning uh, and urban design decisions in their community to inform, educate, and it's those those courses are particularly directed at people that are involved in their community associations. So once or twice a year, those people will all come together and they'll talk about issues and city hall processes and how to deal with issues. So um, we are hoping that that strengthens the community association's understanding and helps them deal with some of these issues. Final word, Doug? I think one of the big challenges for Calgary as a fast-growing city is, is a sort of social connectivity and the loneliness that can happen with a lot of people moving into a new area or coming from another city. I think the community associations fulfill that role. Uh, it's still, I know it's not popular with a lot of people, but we speed that up in our areas with residence associations, which people pay into. Uh, we foster those over a long period of time, we arrange children's programs. That's often how people meet social events, dancing, clubs, and so on. Uh, in our areas as well, we, we have a program called Karma Connect where we actually put in an internet system. So if you want to find a carpool partner or a babysitter or a tennis player. Uh, so we, you may think it's artificial or social engineering, but I think that's an important part. And I, I don't know if that's the ideal solution, but I think we could be doing a lot more of that in Calgary. It's very important. And when we do our market research, it's one of the things that people tell us they, they really like. Thank you very much. Join me in thanking Dr. Bev Sandilak, David Down, and Doug Lake. Now, as our distinguished panel takes their leave, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the rumble in the urban jungle, the debate we're all waiting for, there will be blood, from your radio and now in your face, please welcome David Gray. Good. Thanks. Is this mic on? Hello. Hello. I'm going to put on a different microphone in just a moment. Um, I'm David Gray. I'm the host of the Calgary Eye Opener on CBC Radio 1. This is what I look like. <laughs> nice to meet you all. Um, how's everybody feeling? Do you want to, just while we're putting the mics on, why don't you stand up and shake for a second or do something strange just to let the blood flow for a minute, okay? Because you've been sitting very, very quietly for quite a while now. So... Stretch it out. Do what you need to do. seat open. Okay, that's enough of that. Please be seated. Giving you too much freedom already, clearly. 
people getting coffee and sweets and stuff. All right, um, I'm just going to start talking. Please uh, feel free to make your way back to your seats when, uh, as soon as you get your coffee. Uh, after a day of what I'm told has been healthy dialogue and professional team building or whatever you've been doing in here, it's my job to help throw a spanner into the whole works. Um, the next hour is designed to be a debate. Really what I expect we'll talk about is how decisions are made in this city and if Calgary really is making the most healthy decisions moving forward. And you will have an opportunity to ask questions from the floor in a little bit. Now here for your listening pleasure is Joe Arvai. Hi. Hi, Joe. Um, Joe holds the University of Calgary SFAR Chair in Applied Decision Research. Over there, that guy, that's Rollin Stanley. He's the City of Calgary General Manager of Planning, Development and Assessment. That's what it says on his business card. Now, a while ago, Joe wrote a little piece for the Globe and Mail, which is a daily newspaper in Canada. <laughs> Some of you may have heard about it. It was called, This Canadian City Could Be the Next Detroit. Guess which city he meant. That's right. It wasn't Calgary, Paris of the Prairies. It wasn't Calgary, Rome of the Rockies. It was Calgary, Detroit of the Dust Bowl. Innocent enough, really. Joe's a former Michigan resident who now lives in Calgary and teaches in the University of Calgary's geography department. At the heart of Joe's argument, in case you didn't read it, uh, was that escalating property values and urban sprawl and a one-horse industry base and a sudden decline in economic fortunes all contributed to Detroit's demise and helped it fall into a bankrupt, violent urban wasteland. Keep in mind, he wrote this about Calgary, a city with the young Canadians, <laughs> a city with an economic development slogan that reads, be part of the energy, and a daily newspaper for the long time has banned the words urban sprawl from the editorial pages, but I digress. Suffice it to say, Calgary is not a city that easily acknowledges its shadow. Now. Lost in the howls of protest following his article was Joe's claim that he was not in any way trying to be prophetic. He was just trying to stimulate conversation. Did it work? Imagine, if you will, if you're the newly hired Wonder Boy city planner arriving here, and this article happens to fall on your desk. You've worked in the States. You've worked all over. Your pedigree alone is enough to silence most naysayers. And then this comes along. What would you say? <laughs> Let's find out, shall we? <laughs> We're going to start with Joe. Joe, why did you write this article? Well, first, um, thanks, David, for, for being here. And thanks, everyone, for coming out. This is actually the lar largest crowd I've ever spoken to. I kind of want to take my camera out and take a picture of you all to <laughs> prove to my mom and dad that I was actually here. Um, for, first. Um, the, the, piece, the piece in the Globe, the original title which the Globe and Mail suggested was this Canadian city will be the next Detroit. And I asked them to change it to could be because I really did want to have a conversation. I didn't want to be killed in the city. Um, <laughs> look, what had happened was I was, I had, I had just come out of a meeting where we were talking about the coal industry in Australia. Why would you talk about the coal in industry in Australia? Um, Australia was ramping up coal production at levels that the country had never seen before. They had built a ton of infrastructure. Companies were getting rich. All of the coal was going to China. Um, then one day, the Chinese decided that that was going to be the end of coal and overnight shut down the Australian coal industry um, and devastated the country's economy and really crippled a lot of cities. Around the same time, I was reading about um, increased distance amongst the different classes of people that live in Calgary. Um, I was looking at property values going ridiculously high through the roof. Even a, a, a simple fixer-upper north of a half a million dollars, which seems obscene to me. Um, and I started to wonder what would happen if all of the rhetoric about oil and gas going to China came true and we built a bunch of infrastructure, we all got really wealthy, we all increased our standard of living, got you know, really expensive homes, and then what if one day that just stopped? Uh, what would happen? Uh, you know, I, I think rich people, the people who could move, would move. 
people who'd be left behind are, in, in David's words, the stickers, not the boomers. And while I don't think that we would be the, you know, the, what'd you call it, the wasteland of the Dust Bowl or something, I think it could be really problematic and, and really quite scary. And frankly, I came here because I wanted to be here and it scared the crap out of me. So I sat down on my laptop and wrote the piece. Rollin Stanley, what did you think when you read the article? I was glad he wrote it, because now people hate us somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> the clicker here? You want a clicker? The clicker that makes the... Rollin brought visual aids. Is this the thing that makes the PowerPoint go? Yeah. You're blocking them from me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I was actually glad he wrote it because it made other people, like the home builders, think somebody else had something wrong to say. Uh, is it on my PowerPoint? Hey, it is. Okay, that's not going. That's not going. It's the middle button. The middle. There. Oh, we don't want that one. Is there sound? We need sound. So that's where I used to work, on the left. That was the, the Jewish shopping neighborhood of St. Louis 50 years ago. Uh, by the way, those buildings there, uh, here, I'll sell that to you for 800 bucks. <laughs> In fact, I'll also give you 15 years of tax abatement, <laughs> and I'll give you federal, state, and historic tax credits to offset your restoration costs by 37%. <laughs> but you won't do it. Do we have sound? Because the video I want, okay, go back to the... Uh, PowerPoint, please. I know I didn't have that in my PowerPoint. Fun times in Cleveland again. Still Cleveland. Cold down to Cleveland town, everyone. Under construction since 1868. See our river that catches on fire. So polluted that all our fish have AIDS. See the sun almost three times a year. This guy has at least two DUIs. Flaps look like a Scooby-Doo ghost town. Don't slow down in East Cleveland or you'll die. Our economy's based on LeBron James. Buy a house for the price of a VCR. Our main export is crippling depression. We're so retarded that we think this is ours. It could be worse though, at least we're not Detroit. <laughs> we're not Detroit. So, um, did we buy that song to use? Or? I got to tell you. <laughs> when that came out about four years ago and I was still in uh, uh, St. Louis, I said, thank God they did it about Cleveland. <laughs> um, so that's where I worked for six years. And when I first saw Joe's article, I said, I love it when academics do this because I get to rip them to pieces. And uh, because this is what used to happen in St. Louis all the time. There was some guy who was like in his pajamas in a basement in Kansas City used to write about how we were the worst crime city in the world, in, like in America. And we'd, of course, every year you'd be trying to get businesses to come to town. This academic would write this argument. He's like, God damn it. You know, because the next time you're talking to a business, said, well, we read this article. And then we had dinner the other night, and I realized what he was trying to say. And I'm going to put it to you. Hold it. You took it off again. <laughs> we actually prefer to have the video up. By the way, this is the smallest crowd I've ever spoken to. <laughs> So yesterday I was speaking to 300 people at the ULI uh, spring event in Vancouver, Urban Land Institute, who control 85% of the rental housing market in uh, the United States. And I want to get them over here. But I actually think we should be more like Detroit. Who knows Zach Past or something around Zach Pashik. Okay. He makes those bikes. And those watches, Shinola watches, are made in a factory in Detroit. And I hope we can be more like Detroit. All right. Can I say something to that? I think you should, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I, 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 I think that there's a, a lot of opportunities that have emerged in Detroit. This is a, I, I brought a prop, too. It's, it's a book called Detroit City is the Place to Be. And it's not a post-mortem on why things went pear-shaped in Detroit. It's about all the stuff that's happening in Detroit since it went pear-shaped. And, and the reason that they make Shinola watches and the reason that they make Detroit bikes and the reason that they have all these kind of great hipster businesses uh, is, is because of what Roland said. You can buy a storefront for $400 and get a big tax credit. 
The people who make the watches are out of work auto workers. The people who make the wallets at Shinola are out of work people who made the, the upholstered seats in cars. So I would like to be more like Detroit too. I just don't want it to be because we're surviving or trying to survive a financial calamity. I want it to be done on our own. I want diversity and I want it now. I want smaller cities and I want a smaller city or at least a, a smaller feeling city and I want that now. I don't want it in 10 years. And, and to that point, so I sit on the Calgary Economic Development Board <laughs> And in the opening, David mentioned, be part of the energy. Be part of the energy. You have to say it that way. <laughs> oh. Hey, uh, our logo is, be part of the energy. Um, I think it needs to be something else. And I think if Calgary wants to go in the right direction, we have to start fostering these other things. And we can learn from Detroit, trust me. We can learn from Detroit if we're going to diversify and avoid some of the challenges that these cities like. By the way, where I worked in St. Louis, lost the greatest percentage of population of any city in the United States. St. Or Detroit lost more people, but not as a percentage of the population. We lost 65% of the people. 514,000 people left in 40 years. 65% uh, of the businesses. And to Joe's point, those things actually happen. Now, one of the great things that's happening here is the high-rise condos. When you get so many investors in one building, that helps. But we've got to diversify. All right. The, I think at the core of all this, of have we built a sustainable city? And are we making healthy decisions now to make a sustainable city in the future? Am I missing something? Is that where we're going with this? Funny you should ask. Well, before you get your chance, the gentleman beside me may want to talk about that. Because you know how to make, you're about making decisions, aren't you, Joe? So I hear. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think... I, there's so many things that are happening, and, and, I, and I want to sort of capitalize on all the goodwill that I've heard in the room since, since I arrived. But the, the fact of the matter is, I think that when it comes to a lot of the decisions that get made, we're, we are kind of falling short. And, that's, and it's not that we're falling short because we're not, we're not working hard. I actually, can I read something? So this was, yes. this was an email I got after the Detroit piece came out, and, and, and it's one of the nicer ones I got, so I'm going to read, read it. <laughs> Dear Professor Arvai, I read your piece in the Globe and Mail this morning. Honestly, I found it to be horrible. <laughs> Comparing Calgary to Detroit now or in the future is downright unsubstantiated in so many ways. It is barely worth refuting. And for those of us who have worked tirelessly to make this city great, it is insulting. Um, good decision making um, is not necessarily... Um, related to how hard you work. I have no doubt that people are working hard. I have no doubt that people have civic pride. I spent a lot of time in Detroit. I would love going to the DIA to see the artwork, which they're now selling to keep the city afloat. Um, it's not about hard work. It's about smart choices. It's about knowing what we want to achieve, knowing how to get there, looking at a range of alternatives, and making some tough trade-offs. Rollin just mentioned um, be part of the energy. David mentioned it too. I gotta confess, I'll jump in. I think it's kind of a silly title. But on the other hand, uh, why not start there? You know, um, people love talking about it. I was just at an event the other day where the president of the University of Calgary talked about how Calgary was the energy capital of Canada. Calgary is the oil and gas capital of Canada. Calgary can be the energy capital of Canada, but it's gonna require serious diversity and in investment. The companies in this city that know that it's adapt or die, those are the ones who are pushing investment in other kinds of energy sources. And they're gonna succeed, I really believe that. Others are putting their heads in the sand and they are going to lead us down a path that I think is quite, quite risky. All right, let's focus that for a minute. You're flipping through your charts, which always makes me nervous. I'm ready. Uh, all right, let's focus on it. Um, let's talk about industry and their role in making healthy decisions in the city, Rollin. Is industry helping make healthy decisions about the future in the city? <laughs> you got a chart for that? I do. You may not. One day when the lady oh. Sorry? <laughs> You may not remember, but I yeah, think it was. Down, I think it was. I, did. I think it was December of twelve, and I had done a speech to Civic Camp that had been paid for to be transcribed by the home builders, and they were taking snippets out of it, out of context to use against me. I did. Did anybody read that letter? Uh, letter that Holmes Bayavi took paid. I don't know twenty thousand dollars against me. 
said, you know what, the and they put it in the Herald? <laughs> I was reading the paper one day, and I, it was a Saturday paper, and I flipped it over, and I'm reading articles. I went right over it. I didn't even see it. And somebody, and then I started getting calls from some council members. Have you seen the article? I said, no. And it was an open letter to me, trashing me for comparing us to Detroit, which I didn't really do, but they, they said I did. And so when I started to write, talk about that stuff at the Civic Camp, I started to talk about diversifying. And is industry making the right decisions? Who's ever read this book, Biomimicry? Oh, I see some hands. By Janine Bennis? Not Elaine Bennis. <laughs> From Seinfeld, but uh, Janine Bennis. You know, if she was here today, she would have cost like $35,000 or $50,000 to speak. That's what I cost. That's what he cost. <laughs> and... She writes a book about how places got to think more like nature does. And when I think about be part of the energy, I think, then why aren't we the hub of alternative energy research? Why is an industry investing in that to try and create this city as an alternative? Because you know, when you're in the United States, the three media outlets that count are the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. And none of them like us. Because of the Keystone Pipeline and the oil. And the only good, well, sorry, the Wall Street Journal loves us. The other two don't. And actually, the Peace Bridge was in the Wall Street Journal once. And so the key is, can we diversify our image to make us more sustainable and sell this city as an energy capital, but not a one-dimensional energy capital? All right, I've got to move in the middle here because I don't think we're getting at it. Can um, I say something to that? Yeah, can please do. So, I mean, I think, I think there, there's a point there to be made, and, and there, there are two elements to that. One is the decision-making element, and that's kind of, the, kind of the pulling of the levers and making the hard choices, which is something that I think we're totally capable of doing. It was one of the things that attracted me here in the first place. This is a very young, intelligent, motivated city with a real frontier, some would say FU attitude, which I think is fantastic. There's another element of it that's a kind of a psychological element. In, in, in decision science parlance, you call that a halo effect. It's where elements of an alternative or some sort of stimulus, a city for instance, kind of spill over and affect other unrelated elements of that same stimulus. And that's where we're also falling short. People look at Calgary and they sort of have an opinion of us before they even get to know us. And I think that if we really want to sort of make some hay in terms of doing something that's really innovative for this city, we need to all, you know, we need to make the hard choices, obviously, but we need to start doing a better job of sort of dissuading others about what that image of us is. Oil and gas, I think, is a big deal in this city. I'm not going to say that it's not. I'm not going to say that it's a bad idea. I mean, obviously, it's working for the time being. But we need to find ways to sort of attract people to Calgary and get people attracted to Calgary because of other stuff. And that's going to be a sell. And it's something that, again, we're capable of doing. But I just, I just don't feel like we're quite there yet. What do you make of that? Um, it's absolutely true. Yes. <laughs> This is a crappy debate. So, <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely true, but let me, let me roll it back a bit to make the debate less crappy. Thank you. <laughs> um, there is no way we can become Detroit. It's impossible. It just can't happen. Uh, it can't. Could you throw a because in there? Just to <laughs> I was just letting that, that yeah. rest for a moment. Yeah. One, there is... Only four places in Canada, over a million people. When you, you know, I used to laugh. I, I was in St. Louis, and we had the University of Toronto students come down. We're driving them through the north side, and they're going, my God, how could they let this happen? And I just about started laughing, you know, if it wasn't so sad in the naivety. When you move to the United States and you want to live in a city, you got 50 to 100 choices. I think there's 40 cities or 35 cities over a million people. How many are there in Canada? Four, and one you ain't going to because you don't speak French. And so, we can't become that way. And plus, you'd have to like the Montreal Canadiens, and nobody does. We can't become that way because there's too many. There's only three cities. And so if you're coming here, you're going to come here. You're going to come here, Vancouver, or Toronto. Now, that doesn't mean we can't get hurt, but we can't become Detroit. 
How are you, what makes but wait, you so we don't have to become cool. Detroit. Sorry, we, you know what, this, this is, this is a, I think we're getting, we're, we're focusing too much on the Detroit comparison, and I know that I wrote the piece. Yeah, so whose fault is that? I apologize, yeah. I apologize for that, but we don't have to become Detroit. I mean, how many of you have been to Detroit? So a few of you, I mean, if, you, if you've been there, I mean, it's, it's truly messed up in places. They film movies in Detroit because Detroit will let you blow up municipal buildings on film. In fact, they just, they just tried to blow up another building for Batman versus Superman, and finally Detroit said, no, we're not letting you do that, so they're going to blow it up in Chicago instead. <laughs> the point is, you don't need to become Detroit to have that level of blight to really mess up a city. You know, we don't have a, you know, a couple of million people. Detroit went from 2 million people um, to just over 700,000 in a few years. That's a staggering decrease in the population. The people who moved weren't the people who moved because they were out of work and decided to sort of take a risk elsewhere. Those people still live in Detroit, and they're not taking risks elsewhere. They're trying to take them in Detroit. The people who move were the wealthy people. So to say that we can't become Detroit because we don't, we don't have a white flight problem, which I think is kind of racist, to be honest with you, because we don't have the same kind of tax structure, uh, because you know, all this other stuff that we don't have that Detroit did, we don't need that to get, I was going to say a bad word, and I'm not going to. We, we don't need that to get truly messed up. So I think this whole we're, we're never going to become Detroit thing, yes, true, let's move on. But we, we are... Um, teetering on the edge of something that may not hit us this year or next year or even 10 years from now, but if we're not careful of all the cities in Canada that it could hit, it's going to hit this one. Hmm. Now the challenge, and if you really want to know about Detroit, Detroit, Michael Moore is sitting right there with the cap on. What? <laughs> Who wrote that, the big uh, Boeing for Columbine, did the, thing in, uh, did the whole thing in Detroit and talked about how the, 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 the eight-year-old boy was in class and pulled out a gun and shot the little girl next to her and how his mother had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, just like the gentleman next to me, and take a shuttle bus to the suburbs to the job in the mall because there were no jobs for her in the city. And so she wasn't there when the little boy got up in the morning. And so these are true stories, but you want to know what the hardest thing was for us in St. Louis? It wasn't the white flight. It was the black flight. And the inner city African Americans didn't want to live anymore in the homes that they grew up in. And so our challenge was to attract back the African-American population who had the means to leave. Hmm. And that was our biggest challenge. Let's come back to Calgary. White flight here means people moving back to Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> so. Actually, it can, it can mean people moving further out in the burbs or to Airdrie. Let's talk about I want to get into how we make decisions here. Are we making decisions designed to make this... Uh, better urban city, the dream you keep talking about, and shown in some of the pictures in your chart about better places to live. Are we just making this a city that's kind of the way we've been making this city over the last 20, 25 years, is build a new neighborhood when we need one? Funny you should ask that. Both. Because both are needed. Because in reality, now this is what really got me to trouble with the, with the home builders. I stood up at their annual dinner while they were being told how to eat lobster, and I said, you're not building to the market. And boy, they didn't like that. In fact, we had a big consulting firm come in after the flood, and they came to the same conclusion. It's an artificial market. We're building what people know. Boom, 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 boom. And there is a demand for it, but not the demand that people think there is because there isn't the alternative. So that is still happening. But on the good side is, we're doing a lot of other things. We're seeing this now reversal. It's the tide is slowing down, and more people are building on the inner city. And to Joe's point, to take a slightly different tact on it, the real crisis, I think, for us is 20 years from now and whether we can afford to build what we built. And so when we think about the Detroit syndrome, it's can we afford what we've built? So my analogy is, Here's the condo with 150 units in it, okay? It sits on 200 feet of frontage. When you look at how much infrastructure serves that underneath the 200 feet, you're talking about 200 feet of water line, 200 feet of sewer line. Now drop those 150 units down on their side and give them 50 feet of frontage. Now you have two miles. And the challenge is in places like Chestermere, which have no commercial tax base, and will they want to be annexed by us in 20 years when they have to start replacing that infrastructure? Because, folks, 
Flip it. <laughs> this is how much farmland gets assessed at. That's how much retail, single family detached. That's mixed use high rise buildings. They are a cash cow for the city. And those are the buildings that are on the 200 feet of frontage. These are the ones that are on the 50 feet of frontage. And that infrastructure we built has got to be replaced eventually. And we have to have the tax base to do it. That's our real challenge. Want to kick in? I don't even know what he said. <laughs> um, you know what? I think um, Rollins, Rollins right. I mean, I think, you know, we, I, why do we keep saying that? Rollins wrong. <laughs> Rollins makes some very good points. There are, there are cash cows out there, and we can look at it from the perspective of, you know, how are we going to get our tax base up? I think the, um, the Chestermere point is a very valuable one. It's kind of the reverse Detroit scenario where you don't have the tax base in place to support you know, decaying infrastructure, to support your needs in the future, especially if there's an economic downturn. I think, though, that what we're, what we're getting into, and I've, I've sort of picked this up a little bit in some of the other conversations, not so much here but other places I've been, is that when you make decisions about development, when you make decisions about anything for that matter, it's not a single objective problem. It's not an economic problem. It's not a social problem. It's not an environmental problem. It's all of those problems all at the same time. You've got to be satisfying multiple objectives at the same time. So when I hear developers in the city, when I hear the city, when I hear other cities talk about what they want to achieve with smart growth or sustainable growth or whatever, I think that sounds really good, but from a decision-making standpoint, it's not very meaningful. Because I could ask you, I mean, who in here doesn't, who wants a sustainable city? Of course. How do you, how do you measure sustainability? How do you measure sustainability? How do you measure sustainability? If we don't agree on how we're going to measure that, if we don't agree on how we're going to measure human health or human well-being or environmental health, if we can't agree on that, we can't compare alternatives. If we can't compare alternatives, we're not compelled to think about alternatives. If we're not compelled to think about alternatives, we're left with ultimatums. Ultimatums aren't decisions. So I think that there's this real progression of how we need to start rethinking the way in which we go about our decision making. I heard engagement a lot today. Engagement usually means I have a plan. I'm going to tell you what my plan is. I'm going to let you tell me how you like my plan, and then I'm going to implement my plan whether you like it or not. <laughs> that's not decision making, and frankly, that's not even engagement. So I think that if we really want to do something, we've got to come together as a community, Roland and I, David, all of you, and really start putting the pedal, putting the pedal to the metal on really changing the way that we make choices. I can help with that. I do it for a living. So how many of you live in a new community? No, don't be shy. Come on. You went like this. <laughs> like, you don't want to go like this so everybody can identify. How many of you live in a new community? How many of you live in Chestermere? Well, That's how many in Airdrie? How many in a neighborhood that is named after a tree that no longer exists in that neighborhood? <laughs> okay, there we go. So, you, sir, how long does it take you to get here today? 35 minutes. 35 minutes. And did you see the letter to the editor in the What's that paper called here again? The Herald. I don't know why we're doing bike, bike tracks. Is anybody asking the suburbanites about what it means so they can drive downtown? Well, I don't. Should I care? Should I care how long it takes you to get downtown? You decided to live out there. How many expressways go into downtown Toronto? One. There was supposed to be three. That's why they invented the SUV. Because we wouldn't take care of our roads, and the people in Oakville knew it was going to be a rough ride. And so Joe has touched on this, but I was once in a debate like this in Washington, D.C., where the planner director for Washington, D.C. started to trash the suburbs. I said, look, honey, the suburbs are there, and they ain't going nowhere. And the people in the suburbs, you like living where you live? He's not sure. Do you like living? <laughs> I know she likes it because she works with me. People like living in the suburbs. We've got to have them. You got to build the roads so they can get there. So you're a proponent, though, of an idea. Oh, no, no, this because you mentioned it the other night. That if you live in those burbs in Tuscany, a neighborhood you didn't know where it was. <laughs> if you live in Tuscany and you want to take the LRT, and you should pay more than say if you're in Kensington and you want to take the LRT downtown. Hmm, curious. Does that make? Is that, am I quoting you right? Was that your? You're idea? absolutely quoting me right. So. And to what end? Why would that be a good idea? I'll give you the, the rationale. So I lived in Washington, D.C. I live in Calgary. And 
the Washington, D.C. Metro ran up into my county, and if you live further away, you paid more to get to work. It's only natural. You're using a greater part of the infrastructure. Hmm. You should pay more than if you're using less of the infrastructure. Do you agree this would be a controversial idea if you brought it forward in Calgary? It'd be freaking huge. It'd be huge. All right. How much are you spending on the ring road? Uh, we had this guy. I think it's like $5 billion in total. And I think it was $5.2 billion. $5 billion. But there's like two or three left to complete it, right? Something like that. Yeah. How much debate has there been about whether or not we should build a ring road so trucks can drive around the city? And I got to tell this you. This nice city you're designing yeah. in here. I've heard nothing in the time I've been here. How much debate occurred before I got here, I don't know. Yeah. But, so, but doesn't that speak to the core of what we're talking about, is how we make decisions, healthy decisions here about the future of the city? I'm not against other of these plans. I'm just asking. Absolutely, because you, one, one would say that that money could be used to complete another transit line, or it could be used to commute the route, the commute, the uh, commute, finish the ring road. So at planning urban development committee the other day, we were dealing with an industrial issue, and one of the industrial representatives happened to mention in the speech to the committee, he was anxious for the ring road to be done because it's important for the industrial land supply and our rates are the highest in North America. Now, if you actually look at the number of trips that will occur in the ring road over 10 years and divide it by the cost, then you find out the real cost. You shouldn't build it. And here's why. It's a, it's a matter of sunk cost. So you can end up spending $3.2 billion for something that you decided that you didn't need. Or you can end up spending $5.2 billion for something that you decided that you didn't need. So even though you've built two-thirds of it and you've decided that you don't need it, stop building it now. You it's realize so the backstory here? We've been fighting 50 years to get the right to build this ring road? No. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the first real window? I just thought I'd throw that in. Keep going. Well, you, there, there are organizations, and I, I hate to praise the U.S. military. My, my friend Doug Bissett is in here somewhere. He's a former, he's an Army veteran, a U.S. Army veteran. Um, I do not want to praise the U.S. military, but I will praise the Department of Defense in the U.S. for this reason. They'll start to build something. They'll come up with a plan. They'll spend billions of dollars building it. They'll decide that they don't need it, and they'll stop, and it'll be the end of it. It's a hard thing to do. It's a psychological thing that, that's really tough for us to get our heads around because you think, well, we've already invested so much time and money into this, we might as well finish it. We're kind of doing, we're doing the project a disservice by not finishing the project. And I think, again, going back to decision making, what is decision making about? It's about satisfying our objectives. It's about getting us to make choices that are in line with what we want. When we decide that we don't want something, even if it's half done, stop doing it. The money you spend on the ring road is money that you're not going to spend on other stuff, other stuff that I've heard you guys talk about since I arrived, other really cool stuff. So I would rather save that money for the cool stuff than keep investing it in something that we don't need anymore. Don't hurt me. So, <laughs> whoever lives down there will hate what he just said when they're driving up the Deerfoot on the, you know, Tuesday morning. Deerfoot wasn't designed for, where's Kylie Vanderport? And she told me the other day that the Deerfoot wasn't designed for the amount of traffic that it has on it now. So they shouldn't be on the Deerfoot anyway. Of course it wasn't. And there's a great article I put in a slide presentation at the Atlanta. Will 23 lanes be enough? <laughs> well, of course not. But what happened when I suggested slugging last year? Do you remember that? Nobody remembers that. <laughs> we don't read all your clippings. I didn't. It wasn't a clipping. <laughs> he does. They, they ripped me in the, in the newspaper. Huh. In Washington, D.C., 25,000 to 45,000 people a day will stand at the Pentagon, a shopping mall. There's a post in the Pentagon. Oh, Sluggers yeah. line up here. And it's not hitchhiking. You stand there, a car comes up, you jump in, he rides in the HOV lane because there's two people in the car. Yeah, That's we, how they get we to did work. rip you for that. You're right. See? Yeah. Yeah. That's how they get to work. And of course, now, what I was advocating for slugging, of course, everybody was going to be attacked in the cars, uh, robbed. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen in Washington. But I'm going to disagree with something that uh, Joe just said. The Department of Defense in the States doesn't always get it right. No. How do I know this? Because I worked in a city that was 62 square miles and five interstate highways crossed its borders. And this is leading to your point about the ring road. Five interstate highways crossed the borders of the city of St. Louis. The interstate highway was never supposed to go to the inter inside of the city. Why was the interstate highway built? Because General Eisenhower was the president of the United States. And in World hmm. War II, he blew up all the railways and the airports. And the Germans still got everything all around the country. Why? Because they built the Autobahn system. And that's why they built the interstate highway. And that's why one of the main reasons why St. Louis hollowed out. Because it was so easy to get out of town. 
So one of the things we're not doing with the ring road is looking at the impact the ring road has on regional growth. And will it contribute to the things that David says that the Herald can't use the two words? Urban sprawl. Um, so just in a moment, I'm going to open up to microphones and questions from the floor to get you part of this conversation. So start thinking about what you want to ask. And please phrase it in the form of a question, because I think things will go a lot better if that's what you do. Is that like Jeopardy? Uh, exactly like Jeopardy, because if you give them a microphone and you don't, there's real trouble. Trust me, I've been down this road. Uh, and if you, want, if you don't want to get up and ask, there's a Twitter handle over here that you can just send the Twitter message to, and we can read questions online if anybody's watching online. Okay? I just wanted to throw that in there. Go ahead. I, what I was going to say was, I mean, Roland just mentioned transit, and, and I, I teach a class, I teach an early morning class at the OC. Thank God it's over now, actually. Um, but it was an 8 a.m. class. I would take the train in from my place in Earlton, which I rent, and I'd get up at 5, catch the train at 6, be at school for, you know, quarter to 7. And I happened to bump into a student on my way in, and the student asked me if I took the train to work because she saw me walking in. And she referred to the train, the, the C train, as the loser cruiser. <laughs> and this goes back to what I talked about at the beginning. I think that the reason that people are driving in on the deer foot, the reason that people want to be in their cars, the, people, the reason that people think that they want the, the ring road is because there's a certain level of freedom and prestige and autonomy and just sort of comfort that goes along with driving in your car, whether you're in it alone or not. And if you go to New York and ride the metro, if you go to Paris and ride the metro, um, people wouldn't even dream of calling it the loser cruiser. It's one of the most culturally diverse things that you can do in those cities. Washington, the Washington metro is no New York subway or Paris metro, but it's far from the loser cruiser. So I think, again, if we, need, if we want to start sort of shifting our perceptions, we've got to start doing things that address that halo effect I talked about earlier. We need to start accepting the fact that there are other ways to do stuff, there are better ways to do stuff, and there are ways to do stuff that aren't only better, they'll make us feel better. And if they make us feel better, other people will feel better, and that will solve a lot of problems. I don't want to sort of dumb it down to that level, but really, whether or not we are happy with the decisions we make comes down to how we feel. It's emotion. And we don't do enough emotion. We do so much analysis and so much big data and so much numbers, we strip the feeling away. And when we strip the feeling away, I, I can tell you from experience that none of the stuff we're talking about today is going to work because we won't know how to feel about it. And the real danger is not Detroit, it's San Francisco. Because we don't want that. How many illegal suites do we have in this town? The number's as high as 45,000 or higher. We can't legalize secondary suites. You know what the problem in San Francisco is? People can't afford to live there. And what's happening in Calgary is, same thing in Toronto, at least they're building so many multi-units, is we run the risk of pricing the people we need in this city out of this city. And if that happens, they're going to have to live further out. And if they have to live further out, they're going to want the ring road, and they're going to want the urban sprawl, because it's the only place they're going to be able to afford to live. And that's what scares the hell out of me. We're going to become... San Francisco, priced out of the people we need, me trying to get employees. We brought in somebody from Fort McMurray, three months to find a place to live. I was three days from living in my Volvo down by the river. It would have been a nice spot, but <laughs> if you want to see this city's other side, walk your dog in the dark at 5.30 in the morning tomorrow and watch where the lights are. You know what? The city, you already can't afford it. I mean, we, I mean if, if that's the angle you're going to take, I'm going to say, I'm going to be even, I'm going to be controversial and say that we are San Francisco. Um, I don't want to live in Chestermere. I don't want to live in Bragg Creek. I don't want to live in Canmore. Those are great places. Don't be offended. But I want to live in the inner city. I want to live in Earlton. I want to live in Mission. I want to live in Kensington. In fact, I owned a house. My wife and I owned a house in Kensington. And that's what started this whole mess for me. That's why I'm sitting here. We bought a house. I won't eat, well... I won't even say how much it was. It was a lot. I, didn't, I couldn't believe the bank gave us the money. We woke up one morning and realized that the house had gone up in a year about 11%, 12%, a lot of money. And when we did the math on our mortgage, we would be dead before we owned it. We're already too expensive. That was the moment, coupled with all this Detroit stuff I was getting freaked out about, 
where we put the house up for sale and then we thought we we're going to rent and then the whole rental problem came up, but that's another story. So we already are. If, if you look at cities like London, Paris, Copenhagen, um, Stockholm, these are cities where people want to be on the inside. It's people where it's places where people want to walk to stuff. They want to interact with each other. They want to. I love the posters out there about the dog walking and how that makes you a social citizen. I love that. Um, we want that here. And if all I, I, I feel like I make decent money. I really do. I'm not going to complain about my salary. But I don't want to spend four hundred and fifty thousand for a six hundred and thirty square foot condo in Mission. That's insane. But can we have it both ways? Can you be the city that everybody wants to move to? and be affordable? I think that, isn't that just the market operating the way it's supposed to? <clears throat> <laughs> yes and no. Um, City planner. Right now the problem, <laughs> right now the problem in Alberta is we lack the tools to create the diversity in the housing market. And we need different tools to incentivize that diversity to occur. Uh, as for being social when I walk my dog, nobody wants to be around me when I lean over with that bag. Um, but My dog must have been cuter than yours. Yes. <laughs> Although my dog is a gunshot victim. I have a tough dog. Um, or bad aim. Uh, or bad aim. <laughs> sorry. You can't miss him. He's a big 95 pound. No, keep going. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. It's so getting late for me. I get the, the challenge in Alberta is particularly in Calgary, is people, as I said earlier, the market is distorted by the people who control the, uh, the, the, the vast amounts of land. The great thing that's happening in Calgary is new builders are coming in. You know, I've got probably four or six people coming up from that meeting I had yesterday to try and start to invest in Calgary because the Americans know how to run rental housing. And for some reason, they won't build it here, although it's starting. Until we get that diversity in the market, Calgary will be San Francisco. And we need that diversity, so we need more people here doing that kind of work. So it can happen. We may have to incentivize it, but we don't have those tools. You know, they have rent control in Vancouver. And what does that do? We have rent control in Ontario. Man, it killed us. The only way we got new apartments in Vancouver was a condo would go up, 10 nurses would come over for sick kids, buy 10 units, and rent them out. Hmm. That's, not, that's starting to happen here, but we need more product on the market. But I'm telling you, we tax the residential high-rise stuff a lot, and it hurts us and subsidizes the lower property values for your um, taxes on your houses. I'll put another spin on it, um, because I think that you know, there is the tax issue, there's the incentivization issue, there's all of that too. But, and this is, this is just an opinion, but I'm going to say it anyway. Is that okay? Um, I think the reason that the housing market in Calgary is so flaming hot right now is because the people that are buying places in the city are the people who can afford to buy them. When we went to look to buy stuff, we were competing with people who were uh, VPs, execs. They were big deals in some of the big companies downtown. So this brings me back to what freaked me out that led me to write the Detroit piece in the beginning. I think that we're seeing um, an inflation in the value of homes in the inner city as a result of the fact that the people who are buying them up are the people who can afford them. They can afford them because they're the top dogs and the high rollers in the one industry that runs the town. And again, it's not, I'm not trying to be critical of that industry. It's not, I, you know what, whatever, do your thing. Um, but if that industry takes a turn, and I predict it will, and through no fault of their own, they're not bad people, but I think the world market is going to change. All of a sudden, a house that was worth 1.2 million is going to be worth a whole lot less than 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. And that's going to happen overnight, and that's the problem. I don't see anybody chomping at the bit to ask a question. Is there somebody? Whoa, they are. OK. Let's start at the very back, if we can, and then we'll move forward. Great. Go ahead. Look, there's a mic. Great. You, you have to yeah. sing feelings now. No. Okay. I don't like the lights, because I feel like I'm being interrogated when the <laughs> lights are. Keep talking, we can hear you. Okay. Come to a question, though. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? 
How are you going to change the banking system? How are you going to change the taxation system? And how are you going to pay for aging infrastructure in the further suburbs? Yep. Design schmein. You know, if you do it right, you get good design. That's not what I'm worried about. And we shouldn't just keep talking about design all the time. It's the structure. So here's what's happening. And this may bore you, but this is what's happening. If you read my blog this week and from last week, it's boring. It's about paying for things. Value capture. It's boring. But it's reality. It's what you're talking about. We're in discussions with the province about the and Municipal Government Act. It's boring. But it's reality. And we want powers that the government needs to give us to pay for the infrastructure, the community centers. There's new community centers in the suburbs. The ones in downtown are, need some help. And we're starting to have this discussion about how does it do it. Edmonton has a system where the general revenue, they vote every year to invest some of that money in neighborhoods that need to be improved, older neighborhoods. We don't do that. We do it different ways. So we have to rethink about how we collect our tax base. We're looking at how to pay for downtown pedestrian infrastructure where that gentleman from Tuscany, Mahogany, Spruce, whatever, Birch, um, where he drives from, and he drives downtown, he creates an externality on Joe or me walking to work, but why isn't the tax base from downtown in Ward 7, 8, and 9, which pays for 51% of the property tax in the city of Alberta, or Cal Calgary, why isn't some of that money going back to improve the infrastructure? Okay, so we have to rethink about structurally how we spend, the, we raise the money, and how we distribute it. That's boring, but that's what gets you good design. Woman in the... Over there, I can't see you, sorry. There you are. Okay, got you now. Yep. Hi, um, I really enjoyed the conversation you had about infrastructure and uh, sunk costs and sort of the long-term implications of that. So I wanted to relate the discussion about driving in from the suburbs to an economy that fails to diversify from oil and gas, and this question's more directed to, uh, towards Rollin. Uh, how do you figure people who have bought housing in the periphery who assume they would always be able to afford the cost of commuting adapt in the event we experience an economic crisis, as Joe has suggested? She's really smart, by the way. That's yep. good She's question. a student yeah. of the U.S. Good luck. <laughs> oh, there's no good luck about She'll it. I just lived it. Yeah. I lived through the recession in the United States in 2008. I know who went bankrupt. It was the immigrants who could only afford houses in the suburbs who worked two or three jobs to support their family because they couldn't afford to live closer in, and gas went to $5 a gallon. You want to see your infrastructure improve? Increase the price of gas and use it to pay for your infrastructure. It will put the brakes on suburban sprawl. If you don't believe me, fly into Atlanta and look out the window about five, out of five miles before you land at the airport. Now, I'm not advocating gas to go to $5, okay? If I'm going to do that, I'll do that. I'll do that in the privacy of my own. Oh, sorry, we're already there. Higher. <laughs> do you know in Washington, D.C., when gas went up to six, seven dollars, all of a sudden there was capacity on the freeways. You know what happened? People realized there was capacity on the freeways and they said, shit, I'm going to drive. I'll pay for the gas or they'll slug. So there's infrastructure issues that are out of balance in Canada. But there's also good things like no mortgage deduction no benefit for being married, those kinds of things that drove some of that housing problem in the States. But this goes back to the point we were talking about earlier. The ring road gets completed, what's that going to do to growth on the other side? And will people then decide, well, I can now drive farther away and live farther away where the housing is cheaper? And so, did I answer your question? No, you didn't. <laughs> I thought I did. Hold it, I, I asked her, did I answer your question? disproportionately more resources to adapt to that kind of crisis than others and I guess just from an environmental justice point of view to say that in the event that there is a crisis that people will just either drive more or less and live with the consequences says little to the people that are maybe less able to cope with those consequences. There is no environmental justice in the current real estate market. They, if, 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 and we saw it in the, this is what I'm saying, we saw it in the United States. This is why there were so many foreclosures. Now, one of the things we were having a conversation with the council the other day was increasing, when I showed them this chart, I said we need more of this in the suburbs. So Imperial Oil going south, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You get a reverse commute. Walton Lands and north of the airport, building a three or four story stick built uh, condo is a good thing. Because a lot of those people, maybe the people that were doing this this morning when I flew in from Vancouver. And they can afford that kind of product. 
So from an environmental justice standpoint, we've got to convince the home builders who are building on the periphery to diversify so that they become more sustainable and people have choices and they may have shorter commutes. Right. And wouldn't it be cool if we could build some of that in the city so that lower income people could take advantage of that too, instead of living in the burbs? That's all I'm going to say. Uh, the, all right, well, okay, you run the show. Over there. So good. Kind of a complex issue, and I realize that the Calgary Board of Education is outside the control of the City of Calgary Council, but I'm wondering what it would take to stop the flow of children from aging buildings to other aging buildings to allow children from other areas to ride on buses into aging buildings. What would it take for the citizens in a local community rather than see their school be uh, put, to, put out of use or be the new school for a hub of special education students? What would it take for those citizens in that community to be able to use that space and make it a multi-use space to reinvigorate the community within which that aging school is losing its viability? Do you want to go? I can no, that's that. for you. Yeah. That's your question. Um, can I have the PowerPoint, please? Uh, so there's this group called the JUCC. Sounded like a rotary club, uh, but it's the joint use committee of the Catholic school system, the public school system, and then the city. And Hold it. Oh, there it is. I gotta go back. How do I go back? Right there. And one of the big issues about how we're building is we're building a lot of single family houses. And they're one dimensional communities so that when they first open, you get young people moving in with kids. But in 18 years, they're no longer there. The street I lived in in Silver Spring, Maryland, eight houses sold on my street in two years. No kids have been in those houses for 37 years. Everybody was like 80 years old. And all of a sudden people went in and they had kids. But the school had been sold 25 years ago. And now the school system said, oh my God, what are we going to do? And when you look at Calgary in 1986 and 2006, you want to, and you're, you know what this is? This is a population projection. So this is females, this is males in five year increments, zero to five, five to 10, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You want to look like Oprah used to look like. You want to be real wide in the middle because that's your highest tax paying years. And right now in Calgary, it's like six working age adults to every senior. But look what's happening. We're starting to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, real thick at the top. And what's going to happen in 20 years is the population is going to flip. We're going to have a lot of people like me are going to be old and not as enough people paying all the bills. So those schools that got closed and they've been sold, you can't get them back. And so right now what's happening, by the way, this is really funny. American gentrifier, 10 violent crimes you can live with. Local <laughs> delis now stay, uh, selling brie. Um, the point is, Calgary is gentrifying, it's a very young city, but we're gentrifying enormously fast. And I have a graphic here, but I won't show it. When you look at the housing needs, not just the school needs, it's dramatically shifting to the seniors market, and we're not building it. And with the school problem, what happens is, we're about to get 21 new schools in Calgary to be opened by 2016. And nine others renovated, and it costs a lot of money, but those new schools aren't in the established neighborhood, because there's no land for them, and right now there's no demand for them. They're all in the green fields. So those schools got sold, but we had, some, really quick, we just did one, and somebody will help me, that turned over to the arts group in the south part of the city, and it's more uh, community oriented. So we do it on an individual basis as the schools decide to dispose of the schools. Can I say, just can I try and answer that? Too? I, I, it's not going to address your, your school question directly, but I'm working on a project up in the Northwest Territories now with the government of uh, the NWT and Yellowknife. And they've run into a similar problem where they're trying to figure out how um, organizations, projects, initiatives got short shrift in the past can be sort of pumped up in the future. And the suggestion that we've made to them is to take your budgeting process and begin, because all the money is coming from one place, and all the different departments get around, sit around, and talk about how that money is going to be split up, to come up with some really good alternatives that address a wide range of objectives about social equity, about um, education, about healthcare, about well being, about the environment, and put them all on equal footing. Because I, as much as I hate to say it, it's a zero sum game. The money that you're going to spend on the school 
school is money that you're not going to spend on something else. So put everything on equal footing and have a serious conversation about the trade-offs of putting money into that versus into that. And then maybe we can start to at least kind of get the thin end of the wedge in in terms of creating some traction on the issue that you talked about. But if, if it's going to be everyone has to put their hand up and fight for their scrap, you know, there are going to be some weak links and they're the ones who are going to lose out. And I, I hate to say it, but I think when it comes to sort of blight and old schools, it's not, it's not going to be easy for them. And I'll right? give you one example. If you go to Kensington by the train station where they brought in the portable, or not portables, the uh, containers. Have you seen that? And they're turning it into a community use. Um, I'm researching pop-up schools. I've come up with this term pop-up schools. What if we just had like buildings that you could move them in for a while and then move them out? Like a food truck? <laughs> not quite like a food truck. <laughs> And you could also do it for community buildings. And they go in for a little while, then they move as the demand changes. We got a lot of parks here. You know, we, and to Joe's point, you got to think about how you use that space. All right. It's Friday and it's getting late. I'm going to allow one more question, then we're going to wrap up. So the question is going to be over here. Sorry, I can't see you in the light. But this. So we've seen a lot of good posters today and a lot of very smart uh, speakers. And it seems we don't have a knowledge problem. It seems like we know how to build a sustainable city. Yet, when I drive out of the city to the suburbs, each neighborhood after each neighborhood gets uglier, uglier, and uglier. And we seem to be, we keep doing the same thing. What will you do to stop that sprawl of those inefficient, ugly neighborhoods? Can I go first this time? Yeah, you always go, go first. I'm sick of it. Um, <laughs> You just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address your point in a couple of different ways. The first way I'm going to address it is, is something that I was hoping that I could say today. You said we had a lot of smart people in the room, and I'm sorry, there's a light shining in my eye, so I can kind of make you out. Um, there's this misconception about decision making that if you get a bunch of really smart people together with some really good information, they're going to make really good choices. And the reality is that none of that is true. Decision making, decision quality, our ability to make good choices, high quality choices is unrelated to our level of intelligence and our level of sort of education or information uh, that we can obtain. That's not to say that being smart and having information aren't bad things. Of course, they're good things. But we're hardwired to make choices in certain ways. We're pattern matchers. We like to do things that we've done before. We like to do things that feel right. We like to do things that are salient because we just heard about them. So what you're talking about, I, I don't want to go down the road of what's ugly and what's not ugly because I think beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But I think we're stuck in a pattern of kind of what we call heuristic or rule-based decision making where we do things the same way over and over and over again because that's the way we did them in the past. And the first lesson I teach my students on decision making is if you want to break that cycle, you have to know what the problem is. And the problem isn't intelligence. And the problem isn't information. It's kind of how our brains are hooked up. If you can understand how we make choices and where we go off the rails and where we routinely go off the rails, then you can begin to structure decision making processes in such a way that we begin to address that question and Kylie's question and your question. But until then, we're doomed to sort of repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So it's not a it's not an intelligence issue. It's not people not meaning well. It's not people not working hard. It's just people not recognizing that what they're doing isn't working because their brains aren't wired to recognize it. So, a video here? Oh, come on. Really? Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> oh, here it is. It's a great video. Um, it also gets me into a lot of trouble every time I s do it because Jason Margasaw says I'm doing it. Um, there are a lot of smart people here. There's also a lot of money here. And if you talk to some of the people in this room where they live, they actually like living where they live. They don't mind driving the SUV with the kids in it to whatever they have to do. But what we're finding now is that as that suburb ages, there's people in them like seniors that are having trouble. And some of the new council members are saying, what can we do for our seniors in the suburbs? And they're beginning to realize the challenges that have been experienced in so many other older cities. That kind of information will help lead us to change. But at the end of the day, it's about investment. 
by private investment, it's about investment by the city. And as the bills come due, as profits are made, how can we shape that differently? So I can tell you that the dialogue changed in my last job in a very place very much like Calgary because of this chart. And we started to get smarter suburbs because we were running out of land, which we are doing. We've got a not short term, in the long term as we build out the city. But things are happening that help us change this dialogue. We have a council that's starting to have these conversations. We have people like you that are getting involved. We have bloggers at the university. I'd like to see the blogging community help us change that discussion because the print media isn't doing it. And I would like to see, I got it, sorry. And Go I ahead. would like to see organizations with the capacity to affect change, like the city, like the big players in industry, begin to build capacity in-house in terms of improving the quality of their decision-making processes. And that's not to say that they don't mean well, but I think that if you look at a few key organizations around the world, people are realizing that decision-making is something that you really have to invest in, like your R&D and other dimensions, and they're creating offices that are focused on decision-making. I know that BC Hydro isn't terribly popular in BC all of the time, but they've built in-house capacity in decision-making. At least they're recognizing that they need to do that. I think we need to do that too. So uh, last, I'm just going to jump in with the last question if I can, and it's going to be for Rollin. Um, and warning, the last time I asked a question like this, the mayor got hit with a slap order and can't talk about it anymore. So let me ask you. Um, <laughs> Does this have a laser thing on it? It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> I, you know, it's, uh, I'm always impressed with your charts and with your depth of knowledge and the ideas that you bring forward, but I'm also aware of the frustrations that you've had in trying to bring about change with your ideas in the city. So, are you the right guy to work with the industry that exists in this town and the developers that exist in this town to bring about all these wonderful healthy changes that people have been talking about all day here? So, we're already bringing about these wonderful healthy changes in the established communities. Already am. Joe's point about, about how we think. We spent $1.3 million last year bringing up a firm out of Washington who did this with the World Bank in Somalia. And we're thinking differently. And we're going to spread that knowledge into the communities. However, it isn't reaching everywhere. We do have trouble in some segments. The good thing is that the folks who've owned the land for a long time in the city are beginning to diversify. There's Brookfield Urban. Uh, they had a representative here earlier, they're doing amazing stuff. But they're still getting appealed to the subdivision appeal board and we're not getting the amazing stuff we thought we were going to get because somebody complained in the inner city. So we've still got that problem. But these companies are starting to diversify homes by Avi. You know, his dad took out the ad against me. The son's trying to do inner city development. So we're starting to get these companies to diversify and really good is we're getting firms from, you know, I live in a Bucci, new Bucci development. He's from Vancouver. Uh, Minto just came in. They're hoping to start to build 500 units of infill housing on small sites starting next year. And then these folks I was talking to yesterday want to come here and bring in new ideas. It will change. But there is still a market for the stuff you asked about. Our key there is to convince some political sides and some builders to change the model. And the school board is helping us with that discussion. As is Councillor Putman's asked me the other day, how can we get not just single family communities? We've got to diversify. And it is happening. But you can't turn the Titanic around in 10 feet. Joe Harvey, Roland Stanley, thank you for being such a great audience. You're going to close this, are you? Yes. <laughs> Good for you, okay. All right, thanks. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think uh, I'm back. I think everyone, or many of you were here this morning. I am Bill Galley, the uh, Scientific Director of the Institute for Public Health. And I was given the, uh, the task of providing some closing remarks. And when I was asked to do this, I thought, I, I said a very quick yes, because closing remarks are often just a two minute, okay, thank you everyone, fill out your evaluations, uh, see, you, see you next year. 
But then when I looked at the agenda, I saw that I was actually being asked to synthesize a little bit. And it was uh, before a 30-minute agenda item on the, on the agenda. I won't talk for 30 minutes, but um, I will summarize perhaps a little. I'll, I'll say a little more than just the two minutes of thank you very much. And what I wanted to do was just highlight some pearls from the day, pulling out sound bites, messages, observations that... Uh, that have come to mind over the course of the day. And uh, to do this, I'm going to use the David Letterman top 10 format. Uh, and uh, if I do a really good job, they might actually <laughs> tear up the contract with Colbert and uh, uh, give it to me a future career. Um, so so I, I'm going to structure it this way. So I'll pearl number 10. Uh, was just to, to highlight, and I think it was Joyce who had put this on her slide, but also Andy, uh, the WHO definition of health. I'd just like to reiterate it so that you, you just keep this in mind. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just absence of disease. Uh, so so that's really quite telling, and every word in that definition matters. Uh, the notion of complete physical, mental, and social well-being not just absence of disease. We have talked a lot about walkability over the course of today, and walkability is perhaps one element in, in absence of disease, but clearly uh, dimensions of connectivity, leisure, enjoyment of life, those are part of the definition of, uh, of health from the WHO. And clearly, when you, when you think about that definition and all its elements, we see why urban design is so tightly linked to health. And that, that was really one of the key messages today. And it's a key piece in the Urban Alliance thinking around the incorporation of health and public health thinking into the Urban Alliance. So, so that's really a first, actually that's the 10th pearl. See, I'm already not doing it as well as Letterman. <laughs> um, a ninth pearl was just a sound bite from, from Andy Petullo's talk. And that was uh, the suggestion that des design decisions made today will determine our future well-being. Uh, and that's really, again, central to what we're discussing today. And that rolls right into a comment made uh, as an eighth pearl. And I have an advantage because last night I went to a, a VIP reception with the, the various speakers. And one of the, the key organizers of today's event, who's not here, Peter Sargis, um, was quoted. And he's a physician like myself. And um, uh, I think it was Nancy who had made this comment. Uh, and the comment was that the decisions that urban designers are making yesterday, today, tomorrow, are more impactful on health than any decision or lifetime of decisions that we MDs are making. Yes, we make life and death decisions as physicians, there's no question. But their reach is actually much smaller than the reach of of those of you who are in urban planning. I think that should be apparent from, from, today's, from today's presentations. The seventh pearl is actually a question. What do Frank Sinatra, Alicia Keys, and David Down, or sorry, uh, uh, David Owen have in common? They all sing about New York City, so. Uh, <laughs> Because I, I, I personally think that New York City is the greatest city in the world. How many of you think that? So several hands, maybe not all the hands. It's, a, it's quite a place. Uh, truly a great city, and I think of it along with uh, other great cities, London. I, I spent a lot of time, I, spent, I lived in Boston for a few years, and Boston has elements of, uh, of greatness. And I think, I think some of that greatness we've, we've heard today is enabled by density. And some of what was just discussed was about the density that we can create in our urban centers. And, and I, th I think it's just, it, that's an interesting message. And density in a public health paradigm has both upsides and downsides. And I'll maybe just leave you with a, a, a reading recommendation, and that is to read a book called The Ghost Map. Uh, how many of you have read The Ghost Map or heard of it? So a few hands. So it's the story of Jon Snow uh, a, a physician slash epidemiologist slash geographer. And epidemiologists and geographers debate as to whether he was a geographer and epidemiologist. Truth is, he was both. 
and he investigated the cholera outbreak uh, in London in 1852 or 1853. And, um, and what was going on there was the, the upsides and the downsides of urban density were, were clashing and there were, there were public health downsides, but at the end of the day, a lot of upsides. And so there's a lot of food for thought in that, in that message around density. Um, uh, another comment that was made around New York, and this is Pearl number six, and this was a soundbite that I really paid attention to, uh, where you made the comment that it's, it's, a, it's a great place for both the richest in society and the poorest. And then for those in between, there are some challenges. And that was, that was interesting, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of discussion to have on that point. But I, I think that the message that that brought out is that we need to be aware when we think about urban planning uh, of the differential impacts of planning decisions and design decisions on the different strata uh, of society. And we need to be aware of social vulnerability. So I thought, I thought that that was a really interesting comment uh, that leads into the fifth pearl and the fifth pearl I actually picked up from the Twitter feed, and I, I might embarrass somebody in the audience, but Rita Henderson, are you still here? S somebody tweeted, anyways, she, <laughs> she maybe left, but it was a tweet that I read off of the screen uh, asking, and this was in the context of, um, the, it was in the first panel after the lunch break, um, and she posed the question, are we paying attention to the potential effect of urban design and urban planning decisions on our most vulnerable populations? And specifically, does gentrification of neighborhoods lead to displacement and some challenges for the socially vulnerable? Um, and I, I think that this, this in the context of a Statistics Canada report last week that many of you would have, would have seen in the news, that the top 86 families in Canada make more money than the bottom 11 million. So, so we have to be aware of all strata and, and uh, well, the socially vulnerable as we, as we plan our cities and need to think about inequities uh, because inattention to inequity uh, in urban planning is going to have detrimental effects on health. And Louise, uh, this is pearl number four, observation number four. Um, you showed us stunning data, a 10-year difference in life expectancy by neighborhood in Montreal that obviously relates to socioeconomic status, social vulnerability factors that, that we in public health really think about. And I mentioned this morning the Population Health and Inequities Research Centre that Melanie Rock and uh, Lindsay McLaren co-lead. Uh, there's a focus, yes, urban design and walkability of cities, but, but social vulnerability and inequity, poverty, uh, ultimately those are huge challenges through a public health, health lens. Uh, pearl number three, um, this again was, it's actually a hybrid of David's opening talk, Louise's following talk, which is really a quote that you can Google and find uh, over and over again. We need to think globally, but also act locally. Um, and it was really interesting some of the some of the the information that David had presented on the global ecosystem that we live in. We buy consumer products here in the developed world or in North America, and many of those have been manufactured in Asia and shipped here. And the environmental circumstances of Beijing, China, are actually related to our daily decisions and our daily lives here. In North America, so that so we live in a global global ecosystem, and anything that's happening in one part of the world relates to another. Everything's interconnected, and that's that's it's good to be aware of that. It it also makes it kind of hard to act because everything seems so huge. How do we fix the world when the world is so complicated? Uh, and that's where the the message about acting locally and and a focus on local improvements where we have things that are within our circle of influence, things that we can act on, we can potentially impact things locally. So, so never become so disempowered at how big and complicated everything is. Think locally and act locally. And I thought that that was a soundbite that where there's a lot of, um, a lot of hope in that kind of thinking, I think. Uh, pearl number two was just an observation 
around the importance of leadership. Uh, the act locally notion suggests that there can be grassroots initiatives and activity to, to improve health, public health. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, we need to have leadership strategic vision. And I, I feel very encouraged uh, after today and you know, also before today because we do, we do live in a context where we're, we're lucky here in Calgary uh, because I, I think uh, in, in, in our, our municipal politics, we're pretty exciting to have a dynamic mayor like Mayor Nenshi who really I think espouses a lot of the concepts that have been discussed. Uh, leaders in the city like, uh, like David Down in, in urban design at the university, people like Ed McCauley, and then in public health, people like Louise who lead us nationally. Uh, I, I think we can draw on that leadership to think strategically about improving health, public health, and the link to urban design. And then ju that just brings me to the, the last pearl, which is the observation and really a reiteration of what I said at the out outset, and that is it's really all about partnership. Um, have we produced solutions in today's discussion? I'm, I'm not sure that we necessarily have. We've just talked about a lot of things. But more important than, than the talking itself is, is the meeting and the connecting and the foundation that we have now with the Urban Alliance, which I think is a really exciting connection of people. Um, and really it's all about trying to produce evidence and knowledge with Joe's uh, valid point about evidence isn't always used in decision making. Nevertheless, no one would argue that there's merit to producing knowledge and evidence that can contribute to public policy and decision making. And, and I think the partnerships that come from days like today are, are particularly exciting. Um, that was the last pearl. Now I'll just end with four silly tidbits. Um, I would have predicted that somebody would have made a comment about uh, Toronto's uh, infamous mayor early in the day. Uh, at what time was it when the first mention of Rob Ford was made? 2.27 p.m. So. <laughs> the second little silly tidbit is uh, there were a few mentions on it, about three occasions on Calgary's bike lanes and nobody said anything about David Gray's April Fool's joke. Was anybody, uh, so on April Fool's Day, if any of you were listening to the eye opener, there was a story about the plus 15s being converted into, into a bike, <laughs> biking maze and they got a whole bunch of hate mail. So David stepped out. <laughs> so CBC had a, it's too bad he's not here to stand up for, for himself. But anyways, that was, uh, I'm looking forward to asking him about that because I thought it was hilarious. Um, David also took a jab at the young Canadians and anybody who's, who likes the young Canadians should say, don't pick on the young Canadians, come on. Um, and then maybe the last observation was it, it is appropriate that Detroit was identified as a metaphor because we spent much of today talking about how cars are bad and then we've beat up on the city where many cars are made. So, <laughs> so the Detroit theme uh, permeated the day. So with that, I'll, I'll just end by saying, I think you'll, you'll agree that we've had a very rich day. I, I, I want to thank on behalf of the audience, all of the speakers who have really uh, both informed us and entertained us. Uh, we, really, uh, we really have been enriched by today. There will be an opportunity to, to mingle as we wrap up just now uh, and to, uh, to, to build on, on the partnerships that, have been, that, that are really forming here. Uh, I have a couple of housekeeping things to, to do. One is that uh, I am to announce the winner of the poster competition, uh, the winners. Uh, and uh, the, the winning poster was entitled, Stand Up For Your Health and Walk For Your Life. And if any of you went to that poster, you can go back there maybe and pick up a free cigarette because that was part of the prop. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Trevor Day and Nishan Sharma, I have your gifts here. Uh, so you can come up and uh, get those at the end. But congratulations to the two of you for a very provocative poster. And in wrapping up, I want to again thank our sponsors uh, that have included uh, the University of Calgary, Alberta Health Services, 
Alberta Innovates Health Solutions and the City of Calgary for a pretty uh, substantial educational event that, uh, that we've had, networking event. And then importantly, I just want to mention that, that uh, there are four individuals who have been really working hard, many, many hours. Uh, there's also a planning committee, and the planning committee was mentioned at the outset, and in the program, a long list of names of people on the planning committee. Uh, I did want to say a special thank you to uh, Leora Rabatash from the Institute for Public Health, Lindsay Bradshaw, Mariko Rowe, and Erin uh, Giltanan from uh, Environmental Design. These four individuals have been uh, getting up very early today, worked late last night, uh, preparing all the steps of, uh, of this event, and, and we're indebted to their efforts. Um, thank you. Um, and with that, and just checking with our MCs from the morning, double checking, I think we've touched on all the issues and uh, housekeeping matters. So with that, thank you everyone for, for hanging in till the very end and uh, congratulations everyone for a great day. Thank you.